Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. The media may have given the impression in recent weeks that the only jurisdictional responsibility of the subcommittee is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. In point of fact, we have a broad range of issues that we deal with and the first order of business today is to act on a draft report which all of my colleagues received entitled Fire Explosion in Kansas City, Lack of Information About Hazardous Materials Jeopardizes Firefighters. As many of you know, six brave men, Kansas City firefighters, lost their lives because they were not advised that hazardous materials were on the side of a fire. The committee held an extensive hearing on this subject. We hope to propose remedial legislation. And the report I'm asking my colleagues to approve is based on our March 1, 1989 hearing on the tragedy in Kansas City. On pages 16, 17, and 18 of the report, you will find three very minor amendments that other subcommittees recommended. The chair is ready to entertain a motion to accept the report on fire and explosion in Kansas City, lack of information about hazardous materials jeopardizes firefighters. Mr. Chairman, I'll still move with the uh, uh, indicated amendments. Second. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The report is approved. Chairman, we'd like to make a comment that uh, having read the report, I'm really impressed with the work that the committee staff did do. I think the hearings helped to point out the, uh, the problem and also some potential technical solutions, which I think are very commendable. I, I appreciate my colleagues' uh, very kind remarks. This morning, as the subcommittee resumes its hearings on the scandals at HUD, we will once again focus our attention on influence peddling, abuse, and favoritism in HUD's administration of the Section 8 rent subsidy program to rehabilitate housing for low-income families. Last month, the developer who hired James Watt as a consultant told the subcommittee that her housing project in Essex, Maryland, had the strong support of local, county, and state officials, including the governor of Maryland. Yet. Even with this strong support, it was necessary for the developer to pay Mr. Watt $300,000 to pull political strings to obtain the scarce rent subsidy funds from HUD, which were in very great demand. Now, it is obvious that the applications for moderate rehabilitation funds far exceed available funds. Yet today we will see how a, how a housing project in Seabrook, New Jersey, which did not enjoy strong local support, nevertheless came to be funded with the assistance of a politically well-connected consulting firm. In November 1986, the Department of Community Affairs in New Jersey, a public housing authority, PHA, filed an application for 326 units of Section 8 moderate rehabilitation program funding. It is remarkable that the PHA asked for 326 units, not 300 units or 350 units. While the application was filed with the HUD regional office in New York City, a blind copy of the application was sent to HUD headquarters in Washington to the attention of Ms. Deborah Dean. There was nothing to distinguish this particular application from the hundreds of others seeking Section 8 funding. It appears that the politically well-connected Washington consulting firm of Black, Manafort, Stone, and Kelly received $326,000 in fees for pushing this project. This comes to exactly $1,000 per unit, which James Watt in previous testimony before the subcommittee described as the going rate. In February 1987, about the same time the funding application was approved internally at HUD, a company owned in part by Mr. Paul Manafort signed an option 
to purchase Seabrook Apartments, a 326-unit project in Upper Deerfield, New Jersey. On April 24, 1987, the HUD Regional Office notified the Public Housing Authority that it had been awarded 326 units. On May 18, the Public Housing Authority published a single advertisement of fund availability in the Melville Daily Newspaper, giving developers two weeks to apply. On June 1, to no one's surprise, the Public Housing Authority awarded these 326 units to Mr. Manafort's development project. This selection process had all the competitiveness and suspense of professional wrestling. The moderate rehabilitation program funds became the trough from which former HUD officials and the politically well-connected fed. As the hearings this week will show, those with the right connections could obtain these rent subsidy funds with a letter or a phone call to the right person at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. For some individuals, obtaining these scarce rent subsidy funds was as easy as phoning in an order to Domino's for a pizza. It is a shameful spectacle to see former HUD officials and the politically well-connected cashing in on a program set up to benefit low-income families. Now, before I turn to my colleagues for whatever opening remarks they would like to make, the chair would like to make a few observations. First, to set the record straight with respect to the involvement of certain individuals in this problem, and secondly, to, to indicate where we are going from here. As I've stated on I believe all previous occasions, the chairman is deeply impressed by the vigor and determination with which Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Jack Kemp, is moving to clean up the swamp he found at HUD. I have nothing but praise for Secretary Kemp for his dedicated effort to set right so many things that have been wrong with HUD uh, for years. Secondly, I want to apologize to the vast number of uh, people from all over the country who have inundated us with an avalanche of mail. Uh, we are deeply grateful for their comments and for their encouragement. We will respond to every letter, but it will take some time. Thirdly, I want to commend the Attorney General for ordering every U.S. attorney throughout the country to begin an investigation of every single HUD field office. This investigation is overdue. I am delighted the Attorney General has decided to undertake it. Now we have, have many, we have had many kinds of actions that we have focused on thus far. And I think it's very important to differentiate among the various types of activities we have seen unfold in these hearings. Some of the actions were merely hypocritical, others unethical, others repellent, yet others criminal. And I think it's extremely important not to assume that all of the actions that uh, uh, we have uncovered and others have uncovered are criminal actions. Some unquestionably are. But I think it's important, in fairness to all of the individuals of appearing before this subcommittee, for the chairman to underscore that while some of the actions may be highly hypocritical, highly unethical, highly repellent, they are nevertheless not criminal in nature. It will be up to the U.S. Department of Justice to make a determination which of the actions that we are dealing with are in fact criminal in nature. We have seen influence peddling, embezzlement, fraud, waste, overcharging, theft, conspiracy, incompetence, nonfeasance, malfeasance. We have seen a geographic scope running from Puerto Rico to uh, dozens of states uh, in, uh, in um, uh, the United States. Uh, I think it's important as we continue these hearings uh, 
to hold up on making judgments with respect to the culpability of individuals. Uh, the American pattern of fair play demands this of all of us. Now I'd like to call on the ranking Republican uh, on the subcommittee, uh, Congressman Lukens of Ohio, to make whatever opening statement he wishes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It'll be brief and uh, to the point. First, I'd like to commend the chairman, because I think without the chairman's um, intrepid and consistent um, pushing in this matter, we probably would not have had these hearings. And I'm very grateful to see so much information come to the surface, uh, I think of which many of us were simply not aware. There seem to be three basic categories of, if you will, highly suspicious activity. One is in the area of rent subsidies, an effort for us to try a, to develop a program to provide subsidized housing for um, many people, low cost and moderate. It developed into nothing more than a treasure trove, which millions of dollars have been squeezed. Secondly, the theft of funds, as uh, the hearings last week uh, definitely shown that, that in many areas, I hope not too many others, but certainly in some regional offices, it was possible from the sale of um, foreclosed homes to take millions of dollars and simply steal them. Thirdly, the thing that we're dealing with primarily today's hearing, and if we open up on subsidized housing, um, we would hope that Section 8 moderate rehab program would really have done some good. It's one thing to terminate a program that's not effective. It's totally another to milk the program, as apparently some people have attempted to do. We hope that the hearing will be fair, and I myself will try to uh, ask questions on both sides, some uh, hopefully pretty uh, brutal, but all this also to give their point of view. So I'm happy to see the hearings come this far and want to congratulate the chairman on the way he's conducted the hearings. Thank you very much, Congressman Frank. Mr. Chairman, I just want to congratulate again yourself, the staff, and the members on all sides. It is not pleasant for any of us to have to deal with this sort of information. And I think that uh, with your leadership, uh, you are doing a very good job. The staff is doing an excellent job in helping us prepare for this. And I want to uh, say I think that the members are behaving in a cooperative and, and uh, bipartisan fashion. And I just look forward to uh, today's information. As I said, it's not pleasant, but I think we do a very important job in getting it out. And I would share your sentiments that Secretary Kemp, uh, from every evidence we have, is behaving entirely appropriately with, uh, with, with response to this information. And, uh, I hope we can cooperate with Secretary Kemp in getting the programs back on track uh, in, in an efficient way. Thank you very much. Congressman Kyle. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to commend you for the really diligent and outstanding manner in which you've uh, scheduled these hearings, the, the investigations that have been conducted, and the conduct of them. Uh, I really ought to have only a couple of words to add. When the Reagan administration came in, after some months, it became quite clear that their ideological uh, antipathy toward government and government involvement in the affairs of the, of the nation uh, would let them to take a number of paths to try to undo the efforts of the past 40 years in, in building various programs. Uh, they tried the, the path of having Congress repeal some of the legislation. Uh, they tried to uh, cut appropriations for the programs. Uh, they, when that, that didn't work sufficiently, they put into place uh, Trojan horse administrators, people who in essence opposed the programs and were, were put in to undo them. HUD demonstrated all of those. But they, they added something, some additional steps in HUD. Uh, when, in addition to all those three basic steps, when, when that was not enough, they apparently put in people to milk the programs. And then when that wasn't enough, they put in people to steal from the programs. And it really is, I think, a terrible indictment of the Reagan administration's approach to government. And I think that you're, you're performing a great public service in exposing it. I feel I have to interject this point uh, that I, I'm sure Mr. Weiss didn't mean to imply that the Reagan administration purposely and conscientiously put people in to steal. I think the net result was that people who came in and some of the people apparently have stolen, although we haven't, uh, we haven't really proven that in a court of law. Uh, there were definitely was a philosophic change of pace and uh, an intentional purpose to try and change programs. But I think that the uh, implication that they, they purposely tried to steal is just inaccurate. Well, certainly as far as the milking, there is no question. As far as the stealing is concerned, 
there is no question but that, in fact, stealing has taken place in vast, to a vast extent. The extent to which there is culpability on the part of direct Reagan appointees, the minor ones, I think we've demonstrated. Uh, as far as the major ones, that's still to be determined. That's a great deal different from purposeful intent, and I appreciate the gentleman clearing that up. Congressman Chase. Mr. Chairman, one of the successes of this committee is that it hasn't been conducted on a, a partisan basis. And uh, my greatest admiration for you is that you get at the truth without making a political charade out of this. Uh, I, I, I take some exception to any comments by anyone that suggests that um, the administration sought, uh, the previous administration sought to put in people who would milk the program or, or to steal from it. Uh, there's just no evidence at all from any source that that's the case. Uh, it's just, I think, essential that um, we proceed on a bipartisan basis. Um, and I just uh, can't emphasize enough that um, if we start to see this committee start to get in partisan wrangling, uh, all the good that has been done to date will be wasted. Uh, and I think a lot of good has been done to date. And I, I think the ultimate outcome of these hearings will be a total uh, cleansing of this department from top to bottom. And I believe that there will also be a, a number of new programs initiated by Congress on a bipartisan basis that will do a much better job in the, meeting the needs of, of, of those in need of housing. I'd also just like to say that I, obviously, as we all have participated in this hearing, we've had people contact us, uh, not giving us their names from, from HUD, wanting to talk to us outside of HUD. And some of that information has been very helpful, but we've also had the press that wants various documents that we may be in possession of. And I am uh, just uh, letting you know that I am referring all requests by the press for any documentation uh, to the committee, uh, to you and to your staff, uh, uh, to decide uh, what really is yet a public information. But I want to thank my friend from Connecticut for his observation. I could not agree with him more. Uh, we have attempted, and I believe we have succeeded in conducting these hearings in a meticulously fair and nonpartisan or bipartisan fashion. It's the intention of the chair to continue to do so as long as these hearings go on. It has been the chair's long-standing view that neither virtue nor vice is a monopoly of either political party, and not uh, not all the angels are on one side. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you? I'd be happy to. Right, and I appreciate the nonpartisan tone, but I. Deborah Dean is not a career civil servant, and she didn't parachute into HUD on a space shuttle. She was put there by the Reagan administration. Now, uh, I agree with you. There is unfortunately corruption on all sides, but neither should we give rise to the view that somehow this sort of grew up somewhere as a natural weed. Deborah Dean was put there, as a matter of fact, the president tried to give her a presidential appointment, and the Senate wisely declined to confirm her, and Secretary Pierce uh, was a Reagan appointee, although the president appeared from time to time to forget that, understandably. Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, I don't want to be redundant in commending you, but I think you should be commended, especially for the national attention you've brought to this problem by holding these hearings, because I think that the problems that exist here should be um, brought to the fullest light of the public, and that the public should have some response to it and uh, get some some action back from that response to it. I think the response would be indignation. It certainly is mine. You know, there's times when cooler heads must prevail, and I get angry about the situation, very angry, especially when I see so many projects that have gone without funding because money was being siphoned off this way. The problem being that even in this situation, as bad as it was, some good projects, worthwhile projects, got in trouble and are in trouble, and we're going to hear testimony about that. But uh, the I don't think there's any more of an abridgment of faith of the people, uh, in the faith of the people when you, uh, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say purposefully uh, created the situation that would, would uh, as, as we know it now, uh, but I don't know what's worse. If you do it purposefully, at least there's some intelligence of thought there. But when you do it just because you don't care enough to, to uh, diligently watch the actions of your appointee or the actions of an agency of the government, uh, because that's one of the responsibilities that you take on in that particular instance. And uh, I think it's more indicative of what occurred 
through a particular uh, administration, not necessarily for that individual, uh, because that individual was there, but because uh, it wasn't watched. And it can happen in, you know, none, no administration that I've seen in the past is completely clean of uh, having problems within its administration. Uh, but we don't need to talk about it. I think Mr. Shea is right. In, in preceding hearings, Mr. Shea has shown as much disgust and frustration and, and anger over this situation developing as anyone has. So uh, I agree that Mr. Sh with Mr. Shea that this should be a bipartisan effort to to get this thing under control and to correct those situations that have gone so so awry in uh, in the past, uh, I'm like you, very hopeful that uh, our, <coughs> our former colleague, Mr. Kemp, is is going to do a good job. His earnest earn desire to do a good job is evident, I think. Uh, but I think that we need to get on with these hearings, and then we have to start considering legislation that might. Uh, uh, cease uh, any attempt at any kind of action like this in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Wise. Ms. Rockman? She's not a member oh, of the subcommittee. Um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for these hearings because two years ago I started to work with HUD in my area to try and get more mod rehab housing, to try and get more units, more vouchers, and I never could figure out why it was we weren't able to. We played it by all the rules. By the formula, we had the best lease up rate in the country, certainly within our region. And yet, something always prevented us. Vouchers always went someplace else. We didn't have mod rehab units uh, for a couple of years. And now I understand why. And so I want to thank you because what you taught us, what we are learning from these hearings, is that playing by the rules was the last thing you should have been doing. And so I hope that what we can do is get this very important agency back to the rules. And certainly your chairmanship, leadership of this committee and these hearings, I think are causing that to happen. With Secretary Kemp, I have a lot more assurance that you can play by the rules. And, and so it is a new day for HUD, but at least you've cleared up a lot in my mind as to why my area in West Virginia and many other areas which qualified, worked hard, prepared the applications, did what they were supposed to do, met all the, the necessary guidelines, still couldn't qualify. Uh, we think, I think I'm beginning to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One uh, particular bit of help the subcommittee has had uh, during these hearings has been the willingness of some of our colleagues from other committees to come and join us. I'm delighted to call on my good friend and neighbor, Congresswoman Rukema, the ranking Republican member of the Housing Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly appreciate your courtesy and the courtesy of the committee for permitting me to uh, sit on, on these hearings. I do want to uh, commend you for the work that you've done. Uh, as the ranking member of the Housing Subcommittee, I should like to state that uh, we have, have and will continue to run a parallel series of hearings. We've heard from uh, the Inspector General, Mr. Adams, as well as Mr. Demery and have an open invitation to Mr. Kemp and the secretary at the appropriate time will be appearing before our committee and I certainly stand with you commending him for his aggressive, prompt and intelligent uh, action um, with respect not only to the mod rehab programs but the, the other questionable practices in the, uh, among the agents in the regional offices. I would like to uh, state clearly and, and uh, put myself uh, in the same position as the chairman in stating that we will um, leave the judgment of cul criminal culpability up to the Justice Department. I think, however, it is apparent to all of us um, that at the very least we have here malfeasance in office, or nonfeasance. <laughs> at the very worst, we have um, conspiracy de to defraud or other possible criminal indictments. In any case, we have clearly a question of law here that it is the jurisdiction of the Housing Subcommittee to address. Because it would certainly ha has become apparent to me that if uh, laws have not been broken, then we better change the laws to see to it that we have correct the problem so that these kinds of loopholes, whether of criminal or civil liability do not continue. And certainly that is my intention being here today uh, to examine completely and fully what kinds of action will be necessary for our committee as the Committee of Jurisdiction to take in the future. 
Um, I also wanted to be here to thank you for inviting uh, the mayor of my home state and county of Cumberland, Mayor Peterson. We've not met, but it is uh, a pleasure to have you here, and he's one of our fine, distinguished public servants from the state of New Jersey. Thank look, you, Mr. Chair. We look forward to hearing from him. The chair is delighted to welcome good friend and colleague from Minnesota, Congressman Bruce Vento. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be leaving momentarily to chair uh, hearings myself on, uh, on another matter. But uh, I similarly serve on the uh, Housing Subcommittee with Banking, and we commend uh, uh, you and uh, your committee for the, uh, the uh, thorough investigative uh, work that they are doing with regards to these programs. I think that the predicate uh, of uh, uh, the billions of dollars of uh, authority and uh, budget uh, obligation that goes forward is that there is a, a, an objective and professional manner in terms of uh, evaluating the grants. And in fact, in most instances, there is law and or regulation in place that deals with it. In most of these instances, uh, and the, uh, the work of your committee, it's clear that it has not been followed. And uh, therefore, uh, flowing from that, the enforcement uh, process has to, to begin. Uh, specifically, on the, on the front page of a, a leading uh, a paper, uh, there is an indication of an evaluation of Roseville project, which happened, Roseville, Minnesota project, which happens to be in my district. So uh, while I've been admiring you from afar uh, today, <laughs> <laughs> I participate as this touches uh, our area. But I think that uh, each of us, as we write letters, as we advocate for projects in our, our districts, as, uh, as Representative Weiss has indicated, uh, we assume that there is an objective and professional evaluation and pointing system. We found that lacking in some UDAG programs in our own subcommittee, and specifically with regards to my district. I got it reversed, the Justice Department rendered decision. You might like to look at that program as well, Mr. Chairman. But We have every intention of doing uh, so. But in any case, uh, I, uh, I commend you. I think that this is the type of accountability that's necessary, unfortunately. Uh, and I, I regret that the, the results, but nevertheless, I think that if we're going to have sound uh, housing and urban development programs, they have to be based on you know, the predicate uh, of a professionalism that apparently has been sadly lacking uh, in the instances in which you've reviewed, uh, Mr. Chairman. We, uh, we on the subcommittee and others, I'm certain, are uh, uh, look forward to working with you in concert uh, to correct and to uh, fully explore and evaluate the, uh, uh, this, uh, this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair, again, would like to express its appreciation to the outstanding staff work done by uh, both the majority and minority staff members of the subcommittee. I also want to express my appreciation to Chairman Gonzalez uh, of the Banking and Housing Committee and Chairman Regal on the Senate side for their uh, outstanding cooperation with us. The first uh, panel of uh, witnesses this morning are Mr. Bruce Peterson, Mayor of Upper Deerfield Township, New Jersey. If you'll come forward, Mr. Peterson, and uh, I believe you'll be accompanied by Mr. Edward Fleetwood, Housing Officer, Upper Deerfield Township, New Jersey. <clears throat> if you'll raise your right hand, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. Mayor Peterson, we are very pleased to have you. Your, your entire written statement will be included in the record in its entirety. You may proceed in your own way. I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for Please having... Please pull the mic quite close to you, much closer. I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for having us here today. Uh, I'm going to summarize slightly on our prepared statement that we submitted. Is that having trouble? Closer. Closer? How's that? Better. Okay. Upper Deerfield Township is approximately 32 square mile municipality located northwest corner of Cumberland County, New Jersey. The township 50 miles is 50 miles west of Atlantic City. It's still largely a rural area where agriculture is a primary industry. Crops include vegetables, grains, and nursery stock. Large portions of the community are now residential suburbs. The municipality is governed by a five-member township committee, which I am the chairman, thus the honorary title of mayor. At present, the population is estimated at 7,000 people. The largest employers in the area are two food processing firms located in and around the locality of Seabrook. Seabrook is named for Charles F. Seabrook, 
founder of Seabrook Foods Frozen, Seabrook Farms Frozen Foods, and a contemporary of Cla Clarence Birdseye in the establishment of, frozen, of the frozen food business in the 30s and 40s. Seabrook, due to its central location within the township, is the site of its schools, municipal hall, and the former Seabrook Village, the reason for my appearance here today. Because Seabrook Farms, as a food processor, was considered to be essential to the war effort and housing was necessary to provide shelter for its workers, the Federal Public Housing Authority in 1944 leased 48 acres of land from Seabrook and on it constructed 35 buildings containing a total of 200 apartments and 11 dormitory buildings in which there were 85 apartments and 124 sleeping rooms. Later, the center portion of each dormitory was demolished and the sleeping rooms were converted into additional apartments. In the spring of 1946, since World War II had ended the previous year, the Federal Public Housing Authority wished to withdraw from the operation of the project and arrange to turn its holdings over to Seabrook Farms on a lease basis. It is important to note that this housing was designed and built to be temporary housing. All buildings were constructed of cinder block on concrete block with sheetrock sheet roofs. The residents of the apartments were the most part of Japanese ancestry and had been recruited to work at Seabrook from the relocation centers of the West where they had been interned as enemy aliens at the beginning of the war with Japan. In 1949, the Seabrook area saw the arrival of Baltic displaced persons whose entry in the United States had been sponsored by Mr. Seabrook. Most of them came under the auspices of the Church World Service and were, want, were unable to return to their native country since they were for the most part members of the intelligentsia who had most actively resisted the Russians during the communist occupation of their country and had fled into Germany with their treating German forces. In 19... In 1971, C.F. Seabrook and its affiliate companies of Seabrook Housing Corporation, Seabrook Village, Inc., were purchased by C.J. Ashe and Mark H. Watson. C.J. Ashe retained ownership of Seabrook Housing Corporation, which comprised most of the residential units owned by the former Seabrook estate. No longer company housing and not designed for today's lifestyles, the units began to deteriorate. By the mid-1980s, the units were considered by many to be substandard. Estimates placed 20% of the units to have been unoccupied or abandoned. In the summer of 1987, the Township Committee learned that what was known as the East Village, now comprised of 326 apartment units, was to be sold and to be part of a housing rehabilitation project. In the late summer of 1987, the Township Administration was approached by residents, representatives of CDC Financial Corporation of West Hartford, Connecticut, which firm was purchased, purchasing the project. The township understood that this was to be a private sale, and once per purchased, the project would be part of a HUD moderate rehab program. The guaranteed subsidies on the rents would enable the new owners to undertake the real but be a, <coughs> excuse me, rehabilitation and pay back the loans. Township officials, myself included, were under the indefinite impression that this project was a fait accompli and the municipality had little or any say in the matter. Still local officials were very concerned since we were well aware of the condition of the majority of the units in the project. Questions were asked as to whether such a project was a good candidate for rehabilitation. The density of the to comply, and the municipality had little or any say in the matter. Still local officials were very concerned since we were well aware of the condition of the majority of the units in the project. Questions were asked as to whether such a project was a good candidate for rehabilitation. The density of the units was considerable under current standards for housing developments. As noted above, construction was substandard and there was a lack of facilities for residents. As company housing amenities commonly and necessarily provided to tenants had been provided. Over the years and as a result of the change in ownership status, 
the, uh, and occupancy, occupancy of the units, many such amenities no longer were provided. In an effort to try and address what the community felt were de deficiencies with the units themselves and the project in general, a meeting was held in September of 1987 where the community placed before the new owners a list of recommended items which should be part of any rehabilitation. Again, the community met with little, if any, success. The project had been defined in scope, its work set, and the funding of, of available basically determined. This was most upsetting when considering the project's sale price of $4.4 million and the budget set aside for the work to be undertaken. At the time, the project was assessed at slightly over $2,893,000, and the township average ratio was 93.63. Fortunately, the township had been working on the adoption of a housing code. On September 3, 1987, the govern governing body did adopt the BOCA existing structures code. There was considerable concern on the part of the new owners over the effect of this code on their project. There was a request made to have the township code officials sign off in a letter that the units in the project met all code standards with attached sample letter to be signed and returned. Similar letters were sent to the other code officials, plumbing, electrical, and fire safety. The code officials did not issue such letters. About this time, the township committee did learn through state officials that the community could enforce its housing and construction codes on such a project. The township did immediately begin to enforce its higher standards. Since that time, the community has been concerned with and had to address such matters as room sizes, the number of occupants per unit, assuring a higher quality of workmanship, the replacement of rotten or decayed materials as opposed to covering over them, certification that roofs were safe, and provision of washer and dryer connections in each unit or the provision of laundry facilities in a building on site. There has been a continuing dialogue between the project owners, their contractors, and township officials concerning the quality of the rehabilitation work. Meetings are held on a regular basis for this purpose and copies of the minutes of these meetings are attached. The owners claim that the project has had an $800,000 overrun due to the increased work required by the township. There still exist, however, serious questions on the part of local officials about the wisdom of this project and its effect on many long-term residents of our community community, many of whom are elderly. The rents, rents to be charged for the project are quite high in comparison to local housing, the local housing market. There are further questions as to the need for such a large number of subsidized units in a municipality of our size. It is our understanding that the rents will continue to rise annually over the life of the moderate rehab program. The township has a particularly, particular concern for long-time residents of this housing many of which have lived there for over 40 years. They are elderly and many instances have a language barrier consider considering their background discussed earlier. Moving them out of their homes for the rehabilitation has been a traumatic experience. New regulations have ended their gardens, the keeping of pets and proposed laundry facilities were not to be located near their units. The project owners have agreed to establish a section of the development for seniors and some of their concerns will be addressed within this area. But there is fear that under the Section 8 guidelines, many will not qualify for economic reasons to live in the project. Without subsidies, the rents will be too high and many are ineligible to receive assistance. The township was never consulted by HUD about this project. No one from HUD has ever come to the township to talk to the governing body about the project or the community's concerns. To this date, I am not clear, nor have I ever had the program fully and adequately explained to me. I have attached to this statement a letter dated June 15, 1989, from f former Township Committee man Greg J. Facemeyer, who in 1987 was mayor. He too reiterates my sentiments and frustration at being kept in the dark about this project. The Township has never known what its powers and control over such a project encompassed. This is very upsetting when considering the amount of monies involved 
and the impact of such a project on, on the community and its residents. The local public officials honestly understood this was a federal project operating through private interests and was beyond their involvement or control. Only through code enforcement has the municipality been able to put, make input and assure that the rehabilitation work that was decided to be undertaken met its standards. At present, approximately 60% of the units are complete and are substantially improved. Excuse me. The units do not, uh, excuse me, the units do meet all code requirements. At this point in time, I am most concerned that the senior section of the project continue and finish the work already begun. Of greatest concern in the senior section, which will be of great importance to a number of residents. The township has never been pleased with the way this project has come about, but has done much to make it represent a rehabilitation, pro pro rehabilitation which should be meaningful. The township has recently submitted an application for small cities grant to improve streets, storm drains, install curbs and sidewalks within the project. It is hopeful that the project owners will participate in another application aimed at addressing non-public issues such as adequate parking, lighting, play areas, and landscaping so that the project would complete, when complete, will represent a neighborhood, its residents, and the, the community can be proud. To this end, we are committed to continue our efforts and ongoing dialogue with the project owners to bring about a successful project. I trust that my appearance to the, here today will shed some light on how our community has become involved in this HUD program and has been placed in the spotlight of public scrutiny in the nation's media. Much remains to be done and we would not want to see this partially completed project ended or cut off from further funding because of concerns about its origins. At the local level, we can only hope that our representatives in Washington will somehow try to ensure that federal involvement does not preclude or overlook look local concerns and plans. Cooperation is the key to addressing many of our urban issues, and my presence here is in that spirit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mayor Peterson. <clears throat> you made reference to a letter to you by your predecessor, Mayor Gregory uh, Facemeyer. That's right. And without objection, the chair will place the letter uh, in the record. I want to read a paragraph from uh, former Mayor Facemeyer's letter to you. The letter is addressed to dear Bruce and it says among others, to the best of my knowledge, at no time during the project did the township committee as a governing body or individually sponsor, endorse or sanction the approval of the project sources of funding. Um, Mayor Face, my former Mayor Facemeyer is a certified public accountant, isn't that true? That's true. And his uh, statements to you and his letter to you indicate that he also had no knowledge of this whole project until after it was a done deal. Exactly. Uh, I find your testimony remarkable, so let me just deal with one paragraph of it and, and sort of walk you through because it boggles the mind. In your written statement uh, under oath you state the following, Mayor Peterson, the township was never consulted by HUD about this project. No one from HUD has ever come to the township to talk to the governing body about the project or the community's concerns. To this date, that means to this date, today. I am not clear, nor have I ever had the program fully and adequately explained to me. Uh, and then you talk about uh, your predecessor's, uh, predecessor's letter, and you go on saying, he too reiterates my sentiments and frustration at being kept in the dark about this project. Yes. The uh, town, sorry. I'd just like to add to that. Under our form of government, I was sitting on the committee when Mr. Facemar was mayor. So there, there's a continuity there, and I was there during that time. It's and, not a case and, of one mayor. And ni neither of you had a clue that this project was in the works? Not until uh, 
late in the summer of 1987, just, pri just prior to the actual purchase. By which time, according to your written statement, it was a fait accompli, it was a done deal. That was our understanding. That yes. was your understanding. So by the time you found out about it, everything was settled. Seems to be, yes. You state in your testimony the township has never known what its powers or, or control over such a project encompassed. This is very upsetting when considering the amount of monies involved and the impact of such a project on the community and its residents. Local public officials honestly understood this was a federal project operating through private interests and was beyond their involvement and control. This is your testimony. So what you are saying is that you as mayor and your predecessor as mayor and your fellow city councilmen uh, found out about a project involving your own community, a project which would have a major impact on your community only after everything had been settled. And to this date, you are really not sure how the project works, had never explained it to you. Hod never asked you initially, do you want it? No. Did anybody from Hod come out to uh, Upper Deerfield prior to your finding out about the project being a done deal? To our knowledge, no one has, has been to the project from Hod. Definitely no one has approached any of our township officials with discussions of this project or had previously at any time. Do you know, uh, Mayor Peterson, or, or maybe I'll, I'll summarize it for you and then ask you to comment. You know, this, this kind of a project is to operate basically in the following fashion. You as mayor or your predecessor as mayor, after considerable discussion within the community, looking at all facets of what future impact this will have on all aspects of community life, you would have had to apply to HUD and ask for so many units. And then HUD competitively should have awarded this to you on the basis of the merits of the project. And then you would have had to advertise and anybody could have applied. I mean, this is the way it was supposed to have worked. But you were completely cut out of this process. Yes. You were completely cut out of this process. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, has Mr. Manafort ever visited the Seabrook Apartments? Not to our knowledge, uh, and, until I started getting uh, calls from several major newspapers, I was unaware of Mr. Manafort, I'd never heard of him before. Uh, he has never attended any meetings that we have. We have minutes on our meetings with the owners, and we were unaware of a gentleman by that name. Un until the media until broke recently. the story. Right. Now, you stated that by the time you were first told about this project, it was a done deal. Had you at any time prior to uh, uh, becoming aware of it been advised or consulted by either Seabrook Associates, the HUD regional office, or the HUD headquarters office to determine the needs of uh, Upper Deerfield in terms of having such a project? Never anything from HUD at all. And how uh, about the Seabrook Associates? Seabrook Associates pr approached us at the end of August of 1987, I believe it was August 27th, at a meeting, and they were concerned that we were adopting this BOCA code. And the only issue that was discussed was whether this code that we were adopting was targeted directly at them. And is that the meeting David Beers was at? September 3rd, 1987. Okay. It's September 3rd, 1987. Uh, David Beers attended a meeting when we were adopting the Who committee. is David Pierce? David Beers was a representative of CDC. And he said he'd have no problem meeting the requirements of our code. They were the only discussions we had had with the owner up until purchase. But by that time, the project had been basically approved. That was our understanding. And you and felt that you had no input in whether this project will, will be undertaken or not? No. In fact, we, submitted, we had a meeting uh, just after that and submitted a wish list 
and most of those issues still have not ever been addressed with the owners. Now, the media uh, has quoted some officials in your town basically saying that uh, they weren't very happy with the project. They, they would have preferred to have um, these units torn down. They were in such bad shape. And perhaps at the same cost that it cost to rehabilitate these, they could have built new ones. What's your view of this? In our market area, I would say that that is true. That is true? Yes. Uh, it, well, uh, to the first part, yes. Uh, I think we would have preferred to see the majority of the units torn down. They were in such terrible shape. The only section that, that came anywhere near meeting decent housing was the section that the seniors, in, in the most part, were already living in. And that was d mainly due to their own efforts to maintain their units over the 40 years they had been in them. But again, the units were built as temporary housing. Um, it just recently come to my attention that there was originally a commitment to the uh, federal government at the end of World War II that they would have been torn down within 10 years since the federal government had built them. But the a lot of the materials that went into them were not good construction materials and were built strictly as temporary housing. Do you have any idea why the developers failed to contact you in any way before they received HUD approval for the project? I have no idea. You have no idea. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to go back over a couple of things, Mayor, so that I understand uh, the, the stream or the process of this. I am astounded by the fact that apparently the project developer or owner never really spoke to the local unit, uh, local um, authorities either. Is that correct? Basically never consulted with you? In August of 1987, we had our first meetings. Now, when the actual transfer of ownership of the property went, I don't know. And I don't know exactly when HUD funds were approved. I so, I, I'm sorry. so I may not be answering your question. But essentially anymore. not until after the HUD money had already been approved, which basically guaranteed the loan, which basically guaranteed the project. That's our understanding. Right. Now, in all fairness to HUD, uh, although I find it uh, interesting, if not a, a little distressing, that they didn't seem to take much interest in the project at any time, did you or your staff or the housing officer ever contact any representative of HUD to come and explain the program to your council? Uh, no, what we were told was a few months in, into the project, uh, might have been, the, I believe it was in the spring of 88, the uh, Department of Community Affairs was administering the funds. That's New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. And uh, to this date, I still haven't gotten a clear picture from them exactly how these funds are to be administered either. But they have been uh, apparently the handler of the funds for the state for HUD on this project. All right. Part of your frustration, uh, from, from what I gather from your testimony, is the lack of coordination or advanced information or consulting with the local authorities, period. Is that correct? Yes. Are residents, are you pleased with the, uh, with the current, uh, let me ask some pleasant questions now, something for the okay. positive, I hope. Uh, is the project being well run now as far as you're concerned? The rehabilitation inside of the units, they are substantially improved. They, they are a, a very livable unit. Um, our problem is that there's many, because it was not designed as an apartment complex to begin with, uh, the, the, the site it, it does not lend itself well at all to the units. Uh, there's no parking facilities and there's a uh, roofs and things that they, the owners at this point say they don't have money to address that issue are having to get certified by an engineer that they're not in imminent danger of collapse. So there are many issues that still need to be addressed with the site. The political considerations aside, would the project have been worthy of consideration for rehab uh, by the town council if you had money come in through a, some independent uh, Nothing, project? Uh, not, not of that scale. Uh, you have to understand this is amounts to 16 percent of our housing stock and there's a somewhat limited need within our own community. I don't think I asked the question correctly. Okay. Uh, if an outsider come in and say, I've got money, I want to rehab, and this looks like good, would this have been a project that your council likely would have uh, approved? If it was a choice between it staying exactly as is 
and no choice of having some of it demolished. I think our choice would be to have some work done on it with very, very low standards. If this were closed uh, down, uh, is there any place that tenants could go or would go uh, within your immediate community? The entire project were closed down. There would be problems if the entire project was, yes. Are there any other major projects in your area, immediate community or, or surrounding area, that would ful fulfill this need? Is there anything in that area at all? Uh, yes. The uh, city closest to us, Bridge, New Jersey, has, um, from my understanding, probably the highest per capita number of uh, federally subsidized units in the state of New Jersey. Other questions pose themselves immediately based on that uh, revelation. Uh, could the tenants meet the rent of these apartments without the subsidy? They obviously could not, could they? No. Uh, the, a lot of the working people that were living there have been moving out. Uh, as they're getting into the se senior section now, some of the seniors that have a pension or some savings cannot meet these rent requirements. And we'll we have to force them to move out of units they've been living in since the end of World War II. And so some kind of subsidy program is necessary in your area, a well-run program you would welcome? To a certain degree, yes. N nothing on this scale. You would prefer not to have such a grandiose uh, project? Now, even with this project, if it were to be partially rehabilitated, uh, the best thing would have done to eliminate a large number of those units. It is just too dense. Now that the project is in, in process, yes. are you satisfactory, satisfied with the process of this project? On some issues, we are satisfied. Right. Uh, as, you as far as expanding on that, please? Again, improvement of inter interior units, the interior of the units um, is very satisfactory. But I would have to give the credit to my code officials for that, because it would not have been addressed properly if we did not have strict code enforcement on this project. May I ask a question of either of the gentlemen in this case? Once this project had been slowed down by the imposition and the justified regulation of local authority housing codes, has the coordination and the cooperation been satisfactory with local authorities since that time? Not, not completely, no. All right. Could you, could you expand on that, please? Ed, do you want to address some of that? Uh, to expand on that, uh, Mr. Lukens, uh, it seems like every few weeks there have been uh, problems with the reconstruction, the rehabilitation of these apartments. Uh, we're going into buildings that are uh, 40 years old or, or better, and uh, naturally we're coming across in some of these buildings problems regarding the roofs. The roofs on these buildings uh, have truss roof construction on 24 and 30 inch centers with uh, two layers of half inch gypsum board and then uh, multiple layers of roofing shingles or 90 pound felt roofing material. Uh, many of these roofs are, uh, have many sags and bellies in them and we're addressing these problems uh, throughout the project and, and during would, the duration of the project. Would you say, Mr. Fleetwood, that these are um, normal problems of any housing development from the uh, basis of your experience with housing? I wouldn't say it's normal because I don't think the original construction was normal. <laughs> well, are they normal given the original construction? Uh, uh, but I, I think, uh, I think uh, strides are coming along in that area of this rehabilitation project. And, and what's, what's coming about now is, uh, to the best of our ability, the owners and the code officials are trying to meet uh, some code standards here regarding the roofs in this I project. I guess what I'm driving at to wrap this up is that once, aside from the political uh, acquisition sure. of the funding for the project, is the project being well run now? I guess that's what I'm getting at. Would you say it is now? I, I, really think, I think gradually we've come to that point where there is good communication between the owners and the township, and, and we are making strides, uh, better strides now in the, in the workmanship and as well as the uh, rehabilitation type of work being done now, yes. So on the community end, there really is an effort to cooperate with and make a contribution, permanent contribution to the community as far as you're concerned without yeah. trying to color anything over. I think there is now, yes. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Con you. Congressman Frank. Thank you. Mr. Peterson, first let me commend you. You actually did what people always say they're going to do and don't. You summarize your statement. You had a very comprehensive written statement and then you then read it giving us the salient points. 
that may seem easy to you. You would be surprised how many people who come here cannot resist adding to the statement as they read it. So maybe you should give lessons in people on how not to waste our time. It was a very useful statement. As I understand it, um, the applicant here from the funds, technically being this, the, the public housing authority, in this case was the state of New Jersey. Is that correct? Yes. Now, you never heard from the state of New Jersey? This is, you know, it's, the, 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 it's the State Department of Community Affairs. That's a gubernatorial appointee? I, it's, a, it's a government. Uh, is that appointed major by the governor? Of our government operations. Uh, that would be, the head of it would be appointed by the governor? Would that be? I don't know, Ms. Fleetwood, would you know? I, I don't know. I Ms. believe Rockham so. Probably know Excuse this. me. Uh, are you speaking now of the uh, State director Department of Community, Community Affairs? Community yes. Affairs? It's a gu gubernatorial appointee. So what happened here is a, because you don't have a local housing authority, the public housing authority in this case was the uh, state of New Jersey appointed by the governor. So apparently, as far as you know, now let me say, you say you first heard about this in when in 1987? In the uh, summer of 1987. You know which uh, month? Late or? summer. Late summer, uh, August? July, August, we okay. first started hearing rumors about it. And you heard it from the uh, developer? A uh, developer first approached us at the end of August of 1987. Who, when did you first hear about the project? Before the developer? Who first told you that this was, I mean, who first called you up and said, Just rumors surprise. going around the township. I really couldn't nail it down to a person. Was it a state we, official? N not that I'm, I'm not sure. Were you, I mean, I, I don't see in your documentation, you seem to be quite careful and you have preserved the documentation. Did you get any notice from the state of New Jersey before? this application went in that they were, well, let me, let's go no. back, did they ask your advice on whether or not no. this is a good project? No. I mean, by you, I mean the whole township. Um, did they notify you when the application was approved? No. Did you ever get formal notification from the state of New Jersey? No, we did not. So your contacts were basically with the developer? Uh, initially, yes. Now, you had some problems with the developer. I noticed there's minutes of some meetings that you've submitted. Um, there's a reference here to the fact that the township quote, was not charging for second and third inspections. I assume that meant you were bearing this out of your tax burden. Uh, there were problems with relocation. Did the state of New Jersey intervene to help you get the uh, developer to, to perform better? Um, yes, they did. So they were at those meetings? Yes, but and they have been involved in that part of it. In trying to get it done. Have help. Yes. But the, the fundamental issue, though, was that the state applied, nobody asked you, and you heard about it from the uh, from the developer. Now, there's some reference here to uh, relocation what, uh, uh, and problems with relocation. Would you describe what, what, what degree of relocation has been involved here? Every unit that has a tenant, due to the, the scope of work that's being done, the tenant has to be moved into another unit while their unit's being redone. So, th and they were able to do that, though, because of the empty units? Did anybody have to be moved out of the complex? No. They were all moved around within the complex? Um, how much money totally are we talking about here? Do we have a per unit cost? For rehabilitation? Yeah. Let, let me just start. How many, how many inhabited units were there before they started? Uh, we, we aren't sure. We were just getting a handle on being able to inspect units. We'd never had any code. Uh, this all kind of happened synonymously. Uh, we assume that our estimates are about, it was about 20% abandoned at that time. Indians were boarded up. And so we don't know about a per unit cost. Let me ask you, with the... Um, uh, well, I, I, can, I think we can partially answer that. Uh, the estimates uh, for the building uh, permits are $15,000 per unit for rehabilitation. That's the total amount that's being spent? That's at, it's, it's up to this point. Now, there will be other things that will have to be done later. And I, you, you noted in your statement that the rents here are fairly high for the area. Yes, they are for Which means area. that, and I, I guess this is part of the problem with, with the residents, the residents who were there before it was unsubsidized. They were not wealthy people on the whole, I assume. And no. so your concern is that some of these people are going to fall between two stools. With the new rents, as I understand your statement, the current residents, many of them will neither be able to afford that out of their own income, nor will they be so low in their income that they can get Section 8 assistance. Is that Exactly. Right? They'll fall through the cracks. So that as a result of this project being given as a gift to your township, some of the people who've lived there for a long time are going to have to move out? Exactly. Do you have any idea how many? No, we don't. And have you raised this with the developers? We have had discussions about it, but um, our understanding is that all of them fall under this, and these will be the rent levels, and these are the rent levels 
they claim they're going to need to so, uh, maintain yeah, the project. And they're considerably higher, you say, than nearby comparable residents, according to the appraisal you submitted. So you will have a certain number of the residents in this building, in this complex, as a result of this, they're going to have to be moved out and uh, won't be able to say where they've been staying. What's the, has there been a lot of turnover in these buildings before? Or did they tend to be fairly? Prior to this? Yeah. Uh, with the seniors, there was almost no turnover. And will uh, some of them be dislocated? Some of them will be dislocated. Some have been there, uh, well, I know one gentleman has been there 40 years and will have to move out. So people who have been there for a long time as a result of this, I, this is an outrageous example of what happens when you don't ask local people. I have to say, serving on the housing subcommittee, uh, the notion that developers would go to a state and with no discussion whatsoever with the local people, with the residents, with the local officials, do a project of this magnitude is, is appalling. I also have, you, you were told that it was the, uh, you, as I said, you were first contacted by the developers. Do you, as I read the documents we have here, um, the state was also first contacted with the developers. I guess we'll get into that later on. I would be interested if you would submit to us an estimate, and I know they have the housing office here, how many people are going to have to be relocated, because I must say, uh, I don't know of any federal program that would be available to help those victims. So we have an outrageous situation where the federal government is going to have gone in there, spent a large amount of taxpayers' money, the consequence of which will be that some older people who've lived in a place a long time are going to be kicked out of their homes, and nobody in the federal government is going to lift a finger to help them. That is. Uh, a direct consequence. Now, those are the kind of programs we're trying to address in the in the housing subcommittee. Will but my I think, colleague yield yes, for a second? I not only fully agree with your analysis, but all of this will be at a cost, at an additional cost of thirty-one million one hundred and sixty-three thousand four hundred dollars in rent subsidies to the project. So the federal government not only provides funding to rehabilitate these units that presumably should have been torn down, but it will pay over the next number of years over $31 million in rent subsidies while the old low-income people who are living there will be forced out. Well, I appreciate that because when we, that's right. When I asked about the, the, the rehab costs, the rehab costs are only a part of this. And in particular, I'm going to ask the staff if we can find this out. We'll have to ask HUD this. The administration of HUD, which forced this project on this community against its will, are, is also the administration that tells us that vouchers are the solution to our housing program. Uh, I would like to know what the disparity is between what you would be able to get in federal subsidy if you had a voucher and what you would get in federal subsidy under this project. And I will tell you that it is in, in the millions of dollars. So it just exposes a glaring hypocrisy. Uh, for people to say, if you happen to be in need of housing in general, we'll give you a voucher. But if you happen to be politically well connected, we will put a lot more money than the voucher in there, and we'll even dislocate some people uh, in the bargain. In other words, let me just my final question: This, I don't know, millions of dollars for rehabilitation and millions of dollars for the subsidy. If you had been offered a choice between the amounts of rent subsidy that are going into this and the amount of rehab, which appears to be close to 40 million dollars over a reasonable period for this project, or one half of that to be used to improve your housing stock according to your own choices, which would you have taken? I would have taken the half. So in other words, the federal government, if they had given you half as much money, you could have produced a much better result for the people of your community if it hadn't been for what seems to be political connections bypassing totally the local government in this concern. Thank you. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think a lot of these questions point up to some real deficiencies in the program itself. Uh, in addition to the way the program was administered, and I would hope that one of the results of our hearings would be recommendations uh, to the Secretary, which I suspect he would be happy to get on uh, improvements that could be made in the program. For example, and I'm going to get to a question that directly relates to this, it, it, it does seem to make common sense that before the federal government would uh, apply a large sum of money to a community, uh, there would be some kind of evaluation of whether the community needed the money Absolutely. and how it could be best spent. And it seems that that process should have been done here, and at least from the testimony we have so far, that it did not occur. Um, it also suggests that there may be better ways to solve these local problems than through a housing uh, uh, rehabilitation program. For example, I find it hard to understand how 
if this housing was in fact substandard, and I, I guess I should just interrupt and ask you, would you characterize the housing before it was rehabilitated as substandard? Substantially substandard, yes. If, if that is true, then <coughs> uh, it's a little bit difficult, as uh, Mr. Frank said, uh, uh, Barney, could, uh, when we talk about uh, kicking older people out of their homes, and they're substandard to begin with, this is an unavoidable consequence of trying to improve their condition. And I'm not sure how we do that without uh, asking them to put up with the fuss of the contractors coming in and doing it while they're living in the place, which I don't think is a good alternative either. So Again, the fact of the matter is there, there, there has to be some process to help these people out, doesn't there? Yeah. But also uh, the, unit, the senior units, although some of them need some serious work, were not near and as bad a condition as the rest of the project. So those units, uh, again, didn't need quite as much work. I think one thing that would have helped us greatly uh, and especially with some of these people, if the entire project had not been put under the rent subsidy, if there had been a certain percentage been set aside for, for regular rents, we might not have had this problem with people being displaced. Gentlemen, uh, you just one quick uh, question. Sure. My understanding is I wasn't talking about the people being temporarily displaced. My understanding was some people will be permanently forced to move out of here because they will neither be, have enough money to pay the market rents or so little money is to get well, Section 8, so that some people are going to be permanently displaced, as I understand it, not just temporarily. Uh, and if well, that is, uh, let me just make a comment, I'd be happy to yield. And if that is uh, That's what, yeah. the, the, the fact, then it points up another deficiency in the, in the program as a whole. Well, Gentlemen, yield. yield. I'm not by any means justifying the dislocation of these people under these circumstances. I completely agree with uh, Congressman Frank's general analysis, but as a matter of record, we should know that under the law there is a relocation procedure that under the law specifically applies in cases such as this, it's the Uniform Relocation Assistance and Real Property Acquisition Policies, that in this kind of a circumstance where a PHA or a state agency has taken over a project and there's dislocation, HUD has the obligation to relocate. How well that works is another With question. With any subsidy? Because I didn't think they get any money from it. Well, I don't I'm, buy it in the real estate section of the paper. I'm not justifying the, the situation. I'm simply saying that they're, they're, uh, whether or not in this particular area it's quite rural, I believe there's a severe housing shortage in terms of low income housing. How that would work in this situation, I'm not certain at all. But there is theoretically in the law yeah, uh, would the general lady yield and to the, me? And the uh, regulations that right. require HUD to, to the impose itself from in the relocation. Arizona I'd be glad the to time. yield. Gentlemen, yeah, I mean, I just would take issue with one thing the gentleman from Arizona said. It is not a fault of the program. As the gentle lady from New Jersey has pointed out, there is a relocation program. The problem is when you plop down 326 units in the middle of a rural area without consulting any, or a semi-rural area, without consulting any of the... Uh, local officials, there's no way in God's name you're going to be able to relocate these kinds of people because there's so little housing in the area. If you did the same thing in Newark or in New York City, you wouldn't have such a problem, or you'd have less of a problem. Let me reclaim my time here. Uh, since we've gotten into a little bit of a discussion rather than a question, we've established that the housing was substandard. And I assumed by, by that that uh, uh, everyone was interested in having the situation ameliorated, and I don't know how you do that unless you either A, tear the units down, in which case the people are going to have to go someplace and fend for themselves, or B, try to moderate uh, the, the situation in some way. We've had the suggestion from the mayor that perhaps a better way to do it would not have been to rehabilitate the entire project, but rather to have some kind of a partial rehabilitation, and I want to get into that line of questioning next, if, yeah. if I might. No, I would did, just did say, you want to the gentlemen, a yeah, the point is that if you were building 30 units or 20 units in this area, you'd have a much different situation than 326, and you might be able to deal with it. And I would argue, it seems from the evidence we've heard so far, the reason they chose 326 units in the middle of nowhere was not because of a decision made on the merits, but a decision made on the politics. Well, let me, uh, I, I presume... Don't blame the program. That's my point. Don't well, blame I, the program. Well, I, I, do, I, I do blame the program in part, and I do blame the administration of the program in part. I, I assume the mayor would not agree with the characterization that this was out in the middle of nowhere. You did indicate that there was a need for housing in the area. Is that correct? To a certain degree. Um, but I... Uh, when we're talking about need and we're talking about the community, I, I think it's also important to understand that as this rehabilitation has gone along, 
the developers have actually had a problem getting enough tenants to fill the units and have begun to advertise in newspapers outside the county. Uh, Atlantic City Press is one of the papers are going to be, have been or are soon to be advertising, which is about 50 miles from us. So I don't know that there's really a need for the number of units that are being rehabilitated in our township. And, and I gather from that you would estimate that the need, uh, w it, that in your community there is not a need for this many units. Is that correct? Not at all within our own community. Um, so, so what I said was correct? Yes. Um, there was a need prior to this project for something to be done. Now I'm a little unclear what you think should have been done. Would you tell me what you think should have been done? Well, I think the filling of the communities, we would like to have seen the majority of the units eliminated and what was left to be rehabilitated. Uh, I think we were going to address a lot of that through the housing code and enforcement on whoever the owner happened to be. Had, had the uh, town council or any other responsible officials taken uh, uh, any efforts to address this problem of, of housing need in the community? prior to the time you were informed of this project? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. I had only been on the committee a couple of years at that, uh, one year at that point. So there had been done, nothing done to bring units up, up to grade, and that was the intent of this, to make sure we had some good units. When, when you were advised by the developer, did anybody that you know of representing the town contact HUD or later the New Jersey officials in charge of dispensing the money to indicate that you had a different view of what would be appropriate? Uh, that, that was showing some of the meetings we had with both the developer and Department of Community Affairs uh, on the ongoing meetings that we've been having with them. Did you tell the Department of Community Affairs that actually this was a misguided proposition, that yes. some of the units should be torn down and others should be rehabilitated? Yes. And their response was what? Your There's testimony no was yes. We couldn't hear you. Oh you yes. Tell the community. Yes, I, I stated uh, often to them that, that that there was a lot of these units did not uh, warrant being rehabilitated. And and what was their response? None. I'm sorry. There really was no response. Well, did did they say sorry? It's out of our hands, uh, or the project has already been uh, signed, sealed, and delivered, and we can't undo it, or what? Basically, it was. That's, that's oh, Basically, the response that I kept hearing from uh, officials from the Department of Community Affairs, the contract was already signed for the 326 units, and nothing could be done about that. Did uh, Just a final question here. Did you happen to contact uh, your, your congressman or some other federal official to look into it or uh, see if they could do anything about it? It is rather ironic. Uh, we did have, we had uh, requested someone from Mr. Hughes's office, in fact, uh, John N. Murs attended one of the meetings uh, in July 13th of 1988, and uh, he, he was rather curious that this project was funded. He made a comment, much that this committee has, that these funds virtually were not available, and they were surprised it had been funded. So we did ask him to sit in for some guidance. At excuse that me, but excuse again, me, I didn't hear what the, the uh, mayor said. He, what was the statement from the representative of Mr. Hughes' office? Uh, Mr. Murs, he was surprised that this project was funded because, uh, to their knowledge, the funds were virtually unavailable. Thank you. Um, but I gather that neither he nor you uh, tried to undo the project after you were told that it was a done deal. We had no way to know that we could undo the deal. Did you ever check to see? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Martinez. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we could uh, beat a dead horse here because the questions now are really getting redundant. Do you think, in your opinion, that these should have been rehabbed? No is the answer over and over again. Uh, the, the concern that you had, you expressed uh, to, the, to the individuals uh, participating in this, and they didn't give you any response didn't indicate uh, and didn't care to indicate I think because if they had of they would have had to agree with you that these units weren't worth rehabbing especially when and my my question is do you know if in the costing out of this thing the land cost is included uh, uh, towards the overall price of each unit because it should be uh, I don't know how that's broken down because if you take that into consideration it far exceeds the allowable 
amount, and I don't know why we don't require HUD to require that land costs be considered, because I don't know of any real estate project that doesn't take into consideration the land cost. Land cost is an important part because when you have to take into consideration total cost of project to what you set the rents at, and that's probably why these rents are so high, because if you take the $4.4 million of the land cost and then the something like $5,150,000 of rehab and add that all together, you come up with pretty close to $10 million, and if you divide that by the 326 units, you're, lot, you're double the price, over double the price of the, re, of the allowable uh, amount for rehabbing each unit, which then puts the cost of rents at the rent scale that you've indicated in your testimony, which is really a tremendous subsidy from the government for people to be able to afford it, or uh, the same people that these houses were rehabbed for, for low-cost housing, aren't going to be able to uh, participate in them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know what else to say except that, you know, there's something that's really wrong here, and as Ms. Rockham has uh, suggested earlier that, uh, or Mrs. Rockham, excuse me, has suggested earlier that, you know, we ought to take a real hard look at this and start putting some things in place in law that then do make these things are not a violation of the law, not a violation of the law because they're poor business practices, and they sure are not taking into consideration the finite resources that we can appropriate for these things to cover the mass of need that's out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Mr. Peterson, it's very nice to have you here, and I, uh, I feel that your testimony is very helpful to us uh, in terms of um, our next witness, and, and I appreciate your helping me to understand uh, a number of issues. Uh, for, for, the, uh, for my benefit, I just want to go through uh, these three points and make sure that we are in agreement. One, your, your point is that you never had a say in this project, that you questioned whether you even wanted the project in the first place, and that once the project was underway, you had a hard time getting it uh, up to standard. Yes. In addition, it's very clear that it became a very expensive project uh, to HUD. And I think it's um, important as I, as I view this that we uh, clearly know that, that this became the Mod Rehab program, basically became a program uh, that became extraordinarily expensive. In other words, we, we ended up spending more and getting less for, for what, what we wanted. Uh, in this case, it cost $31 million for the 15-year rent subsidy, but also there was lost tax revenues because this qualified as a, it was syndicated and it qualified as a low-income housing tax credit. So I'm pretty convinced that when we've said consultants haven't cost us much money because it was paid out of the profits, you've helped convince me or helped make yeah. me focus on the this fact that the consultants cost us a lot of money because this program should never, it appears, have been accepted because of its cost. You never wanted it. It happened. And it happened because it was developer-driven and it wasn't town-driven. And, and that you clearly concur with that point, don't you? Uh, yeah, could I make a uh, comment with that, too? Um, we have, in this process, tried to get other work done to the units, uh, insulating them, uh, decent doors, windows. And one of the greatest reasons those issues have not been able to be addressed, according to the developer, is that he does not have the funds to do that with. And uh, it, it brings a question to my mind when I've found out now that a developer uh, consultant received $326,000, that money to be put back into the project we could have some substantial uh, improvements on some issues that were brought up in the very beginning of the project. But even going beyond that, the $326,000, the fact was that HUD had to put so much money into this project and had to provide such a significant subsidy because the problem was just far more expensive than a lot of other more worthy projects. And I think of Mr. Weiss's comment that, you know, here he is fighting hard to get certain projects funded, which he thought had merit, and um, the only problem was he wasn't a developer. And um, so I just, um, I, I appreciate your testimony, and uh, um, I'm grateful you were here. Thank you. Thank you.
Congressman uh, uh, Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And before I ask, and I have just a very few questions, uh, let me also agree with, with your characterization of the conduct of the, all of the members of, the, of this uh, particular subcommittee. I think that one of the gratifying things about the subcommittee is that indeed uh, partisanship has not entered into it as far as trying to uncover what went on here. And my comments were not intended, obviously, uh, to imply that there were problems within the subcommittee. My comments were addressed toward the Reagan administration itself. Uh, Mr. Peterson, let me ask you, in the course of your testimony, uh, you indicated at one point that you felt that there was insufficient amount of monies that were budgeted for uh, rehabilitation work. Uh, and you said that this was most upsetting uh, when considering the project sale price of $4.4 million. Uh, and you say at the time the project was assessed at slightly over two uh, million eight hundred ninety three thousand dollars and the township average ratio was ninety three point six three percent now if I understand that correctly you tell me if I'm wrong what you're saying there is that as far as the township was concerned the total property was worth maybe somewhere around three point one three point two million dollars but in fact the new purchasers paid four point four million dollars is that correct exactly uh, and what, how much money was set aside at that time, or budgeted, for rehabilitation? We have never seen the books, and we ha do not know the numbers. We, we are aware that they are spending, uh, taking permits out to spend $15,000 per unit, but what originally was set aside or budgeted, we really do not know. Well, again, I'm, I'm referring to, to your testimony uh, and I don't have a page number on it, and I, maybe you can explain what you meant by it. Okay. Uh, in the paragraph, on page five, I'm sorry, the second paragraph, which says, in an effort to try and address what the community felt were deficiencies with the units themselves and the project in general, a meeting was held where the community placed before the new owners a list of recommended items which would be part of any rehabilitation. Again, the community w met with little of any success. The project had been defined its scope of work set and the funding available basically determined. And then you go on to saying how upsetting that was given the, the overprice of the uh, overpricing of the, of the property. Uh, what, what led you to believe that, that the budgeting was insufficient? Strictly by the, uh, the developer's comments that that was, they, they had so much money to work with, this is what they were going to do. And basically that was on the subject. Uh, some things we were able to enforce with our code, but anything that we did not have actual powers within the both existing structures code to enforce, uh, we were basically not able to do anything about. Did you ever find out why, uh, or were you ever given any explanation as to why the property was sold for so much above what the real worth was as far as the township was concerned? Uh, only from information similar to what I heard today at this hearing that uh, the uh, agreement to purchase and the funding was lined up well prior to purchase. I mean, Mr. Lantos mentioned early on that in 1986 this project was uh, funded by, agreed to be funded by HUD and purchase didn't happen until a year later. So I would assume that had great impact on the actual purchase price. I mean, if you were going by that stock, even based at a $2,900,000 or $3 million assessment, I really don't know of any, any property owners in the condition that was in that would have wanted to pay that, looking at the work that would have been done to bring it up to, up to standards. And what, what, if any, was the relationship between buyer and seller of those properties? Do you know that? Was there any relationship? We don't know. I don't know. Um, in any event, you'd indicated that the state never told you about this until it was a done deal and that approximately, according to the public reports, uh, a year had elapsed from the time that the state people were first approached on this project and received an authorization uh, to the time that you found out about it. Is that correct? It appears to be the case, yes. 
and uh, subsequently, have you had written communication between yourselves and the, that is the township and the state uh, on this project? We have ongoing meetings with the state, the developer, and ourselves, of which myself and Mr. Fleetwood are, are in regular attendance to those meetings. Right, but how about how about communication, documentation of any of any kind between about the the uh, yeah. your objection or your questioning as to how this happened? No, only as it appears in, in the minutes of the meetings. Okay, and finally, you indicate that the developer uh, sent letters. Uh, of the type that they wanted back, indicating that uh, there was no uh, no problem as far as code, ordinance, statute, or regulation, that there are no violations outstanding. And in your testimony, you say that none of the code officers of the township uh, ever signed any of those forms and has ever signed off on those. Is that right? That's my understanding, yes. And is that does that apply to any and all officials of the township, code or otherwise? Uh, yes, to the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor Peterson, in reading the last page of your statement, I wanted to ask if you'd explain some things. We've talked about how much this program is going to cost HUD, mm -hmm. but it sounds like it's also costing your community uh, some additional funds too, isn't it? I noticed, for instance, that you have applied, f well, let me ask you this, what additional expenses do you see for the community coming out of this project? Uh, the streets are, are in very bad condition. That, that's something the township should, needs to address. Uh, we, we have to put all new curbings in. Uh, the, number, the amount of sidewalks originally on the site were inadequate. That has to be addressed. Uh, street lighting, uh, sewer lines are old, uh, weren't constructed necessarily very good materials. We have to rebuild those, manhole covers. Uh, would you have done this work uh, had this project not gone through? We would have had to repay the streets anyway. Uh, some of the other work, if the project, well, it depends on if the project were torn down now, because those streets service only that development or this uh, village. The, uh, I noticed in your statement that you're applying for a small cities block grant, which as I recall is a HUD, uh, uh, f HUD funding funded system. Um, have you got any indications whether you're going to get the small city block grant? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, the reason we're applying for that is because really this project had reached the end of its life expectancy. And uh, probably, and what's happened now is that the life expectancy of this project's been drastically expanded. And if we're going to have this as an existing for a long period of time, we need the site improvements to make it a livable project and make it something worthwhile. You said something to a previous question which kind of s startled me, which was along the lines of you were you requested the developer, you were concerned about things like the quality of doors and the insulation. Is that correct? Yes, our understanding is they did, under the moderate rehab, they did not have to address uh, insulation standards. So you're getting a, pro so HUD is funding a project where you may not end up with adequate doors or insulation. Is that correct? Yes. Which rather surprised me with, with our concerns about energy today that that would not be required that they be made energy efficient. A third area you know you mentioned in your statement is that um, you are negotiating with the developer for certain improvements, include what you call non-public issues such as adequate parking, lighting, play areas, and landscaping. Uh, what progress have you had so far? Uh, we, we've had a commitment to a seven-year program to bring the site up. We've been trying to get that done more quickly. Uh, we don't know what funds are actually being set aside to address those issues down the road and what enforcement we will have to do that on the developer once the project's completed. So it's been a very big concern of ours. So the quality of life in the project is still an issue, it sounds to me, to your, uh, to your community. Yeah, there's virtually no parking areas, and no defined parking areas. People just kind of squeeze in wherever they, they can. You're looking at road dormitory buildings that are right alongside of each other, uh, parallel to each other. Or how large your state is you, how large is your township? 
Uh, about 32 square miles. And what's the population? About 7,000, and we have about 2,000 living units. So this constitutes about 16% of our housing stock in the township. Well, I want to congratulate you in one way, because I was doing some checking while you were, while you were talking, and I had one of our staff people call our HUD field office in West Virginia. And you have a community of 7,000 people, 32 square miles, and you received 326 units of mod rehab housing that you didn't know anything about and, in fact, questioned whether you want. In West Virginia in 1988, uh, which is a state of slightly less than 2 million people, uh, they rec West Virginia received a total of 75 mod rehab units. In 1987, West Virginia received no mod rehab units. In 1986, West Virginia received no mod rehab units, despite filing applications for them. And so I don't know what you're doing. Uh, they come dropping out of the sky in some areas, and apparently those areas that are much la larger in population and demonstrated need uh, do not get them. And so I think this further bears out the need for this committee's inquiry. And I appreciate very much you're having the courage, because it does take courage for you to come forward and tell this story today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank my colleague from West Virginia for those very illuminating comparisons. Congresswoman Rukema. I'm going to resist the temptation to use a little black humor here and say, well, you need a consultant. But uh, no, I, I will say, I will say. Apparently the, the a consultant number... more than a congressman, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh. um, no, I, I do say that sometimes these statistics can be misleading. And, and I think uh, the, the members of the committee can, and certainly the mayor will understand what I mean by this. It's not condoning uh, improper practices. But you must remember that New Jersey is, is, if not the most densely populated state, one of the most densely populated state. And although uh, Cumberland County may not be at the heart of that density of population, <laughs> there's been tremendous uh, population shifts from the more densely populated areas to the more rural areas. And uh, there is a housing shortage in the state of New Jersey. So sometimes the comparative numbers can be misleading. Uh, there is a genuine <laughs> housing need but for not in, this in New Jersey. But not in this instance. <laughs> not, not necessarily in this is instance. And I want to get to, um, I'll try to be brief, Mr. Chairman. A lot of this has been gone over and it's been very effective. Uh, uh, questioning and testimony, I believe. Uh, but I, I do want to ask for clarification a couple of things, uh, Mayor Peterson. Um, in the first place, I am absolutely confounded by the fact that, um, that you felt helpless and unable to communicate with the Department of Community Affairs, which, if you will remember, Mr. Chairman, is the lead agency and acts as the PHA, Public Housing, authority in this instance, and that, according to your testimony, you were unable to get any information from them concerning this project. Uh, isn't that your testimony? To, to a certain extent. I, I wouldn't say that's completely accurate, though. The uh, Department of Community Affairs has worked very well with us in trying to enforce some of these codes. One thing that helped us at, as we got in this project a little bit, they told us that we could hold the owner to our standards. And uh, they have backed us with that. And that has helped considerably in, in addressing these issues. And we have had ongoing meetings with the Department you mean, of Community Affairs. To your Affairs standards there. in terms of building and zoning requirements as established under our home rule tradition in New Jersey. Right. Uh, but, but my question really is, um, <laughs> Have you ever asked the state officials why they did not consult with the township prior to awarding the mod rehab assistance under this program? We had no reason to know that we were to be consulted. We, that only came to our attention in, in recent months through newspaper articles and uh, approaches by press. We assumed there, uh, we, we would have no reason to, to stop a rehab uh, pro a program or a HUD so program to create low-income housing or, or subsidized housing. So they never contacted you and you had no knowledge on your own, uh, either the elected town officials or the, the uh, uh, hired personnel in your township, that there was any connection between the Department of Community Affairs and the approval of the mod rehab program. You had only been, you'd been dealing solely with the owners of the property? At, in the very beginning. Then Department of Community Affairs became involved not long after that. All right. 
Are you or any of the members of the council um, aware of, or did you have any reason to believe before the issue erupted in the press that there was any impropriety in any way in the project and the way it was approved for funding? Are you, or were you aware at any time that there might have been political influence used in the acquisition of these uh, approvals? No, we were, we were surprised that this was funded and it was curious, but we had no reason to believe there would, or, or any knowledge you know, that there was any kind of uh, political influence used or uh, how units were picked or what in, input any community would have into whether units were done within uh, their area. Now, for my own information and for our uh, application to future such uh, future legislation concerning the mod rehab program, because I don't think it's a, pro a program that should be abandoned. There are certain benefits to it if properly administered and uh, so forth. But um, uh, would you, uh, under New Jersey law, have been able, had you known, to block the project? in terms of uh, maintaining uh, a certain standard in terms of building codes or local zoning codes? Had I'm you known sure about it? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Had you known about the project prior to its implementation and mm -hmm. its approval by the Department of Community Affairs, in fact, you alluded to it in your testimony that you, you had taken certain actions with respect to the building code yes. and the, you had alarmed the builders uh, and someone came to you and asked, are you trying to block the program? Uh, if, could you have done so, now with hindsight, as you look at the project, could you have done so either under state law or, well, under state law? Have stopped the project due to our, our codes? Uh, based on, yes, based on your own uh, local zoning and building codes. Because you've just indicated that uh, this building is substandard based on your your own uh, community's building code yeah, standards. That's possible. Like I said, again, one of the problems was we were just adopting that code synonymously with the purchase. So uh, one of the problems we ran into is we were just establishing the housing office. We were just implementing rules to run that office, uh, staffing the office uh, and materials. You know. So we were kind of trying to catch up with something. And to have something of this magnitude when you're just establishing an office puts you under, you know, a lot of uh, pressure to, to try to get up, up to grade and find out just where your powers are. I understand that, and I didn't... It was a learning process to us. I mean, didn't mean the question to be derogatory to, to the actions of the local community. I think you've, you've done the best that you could under the circumstances. I ask it only because this is a continuous problem that we have in working out vote. housing programs. Uh, the, the relationship between federal regulations, state, and local community... Uh, desire for home rule and to maintain their own standards and I'm simply trying to think ahead to ways in it which is, we can right. uh, make other legislation yes. more conforming to the local needs of communities and I think you've you've uh, answered the question and then finally I think uh, Mr. Chairman I should state uh, we have had continuing problems with the question of fair market rentals which is the way we try to establish uh, what is a fair rental for subsidy purposes. And as the mayor has indicated, and I believe his, um, in, the information he submitted to the committee is accurate and correct, uh, these rentals would seem to be far out of line with the, the cost of housing. In our rest, market area. Yes, in your market area. Yes. It's a continuing problem, and unfortunately, as Mr. Mr. Frank has already pointed out, and as the mayor has already addressed himself, to the issue, many of the people who most need this housing at these rates are going to be priced out of it even with the subsidy. Now that is an egregious problem. I'd like to mention the comparison that was done there with other apartment complexes in the area where all apartment complexes that were designed to be apartment complexes with all the amenities to go with it, parking and, and all the other facilities, uh, where this one isn't. So when you compare uh, market rate and the, the height, the, how high these rents are, it's not even really fair to compare it to those projects because it still is well below the standards the other apartment complexes have. Uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, the mayor's testimony has clearly indicated that this is a project that has run amok. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I only have a couple of questions. Uh, 
I have a letter here dated December 17, 1988 to Mr. Robert Joy, New, New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency uh, from Mr. Edward Demko, Chief Financial Officer of uh, CDC Financial, which is, which is the developer, asking for uh, additional funding and giving an asbestos problem as the reason. Let me read this to you. The need for additional credit allocation is mainly the result of two conditions. First, as we previously reported, asbestos-containing material in the form of pipe insulation was discovered on the project site. While obtaining licensed removal was not a big problem, the side effects were significant, specifically because asbestos removal cannot be done while tenants occupy units, entire buildings had to be vacated before construction could commence. The result is a slower completion schedule, etc., etc. Would the existence of asbestos on site not have been an additional reason to abandon this whole project and start fresh without the asbestos problem? I, I didn't Mr. quite Mr. Fleetwood, maybe? Uh, I don't believe that alone would be an, uh, a reason to abandon because I, I don't believe there was that much uh, uh, asbestos in each apartment to warrant abandoning the project. What uh, was just, the just on this uh, just on this one issue? But uh, the asbestos was, uh, I believe, uh, contained only in the uh, the water pipe system uh, throughout the apartments. But it added to the other problems, and yes, it cumulatively did. Yes, it, did. it contributed to, That's the, correct. to the undesirability. Due to the scope of the work, I don't see any, any way that the contractors could have gone through and rehabilitated each apartment without moving the family or fa you know the families involved there uh, uh, due to the amount of work being done there. The families just could not stay in each apartment anyway. Uh, Mr. Lantis, would you give me the date of that letter again? Yes, we'll give you a copy. December no, just 17, the date. 1988. December 17, 1988? Yes. They were well aware of the insulation problem well before that, and the, the delay in workmanship, one, was not having on-site supervision, not having adequate staff to do the work, and the fact that the work they were initially doing was of such a poor quality that we had to uh, enforce them to do it, uh, do a lot more than they were originally doing, and it, it slowed them down. So I don't think insulation was ever a major issue with the project. Uh, I'd like to add also that please. the first construction permits were taken out in November of 87. I think it was November 24th, 1987, the first construction permits were taken out on the project. So they were addressing insulation at that time. Well, I only have one question to ask both of you gentlemen. Before I do so, Ms. Peterson as mayor and uh, Mr. Fleetwood as housing officer, I want to express my appreciation to both of you in your very matter of fact and, uh, and straightforward and uh, low-key fashion, you have given us some remarkable testimony. Let me ask you now to put on your hat or hats, not as the mayor of the township and the housing officer of the township, but just as a taxpayer, as, a, as, a, as an average American taxpayer. Now let me sketch the situation for you as it appears to the chairman. Rehabilitation funds nationally are enormously scarce. And countless communities are clamoring for rehabilitation funds. And while vast numbers of communities across this country with demonstrated need, powerful local support, community support, are clamoring for units you find yourselves having units foisted upon you that you never asked for, never knew they were coming, and they suddenly appear. The total cost to the taxpayer of this enterprise is about $5,150,000 in rehabilitation costs. $31,163,000 in rent subsidy costs and over $11 million in tax credits. So you are talking about a $47 million project in a small rural township in New Jersey that the responsible officers 
of the community never knew about, never asked for, and have serious reservations about. You have serious reservations for a whole lot of reasons. One is this question of relocation of elderly residents who may have lived in these units for 40 years. The word relocation is an antiseptic word. What you are dealing with is families or single elderly individuals who may have lived in these units for 30, 35, 40 years and suddenly find that they will have to find housing elsewhere. Uh, it, uh, it is one of the, the most distressing bits of testimony uh, this committee has ever taken. So let me ask my question. As taxpayers, stepping out of your role as officials of that community, how do you react to this enterprise? Mr. Mayor. I think it's a horrible waste of taxpayers' money. I'm sorry? I think it's a horrible waste of taxpayers' money. A horrible I, a waste? Horrible. The people in our area are outraged that this, this kind of money is being wasted on this project. People who know the project firsthand cannot believe that this kind of money is to be spent on this project. And I didn't even know the full ramifications to bring it up to close to $50 million. The American, taxpayer, the American taxpayer is going to spend about $47 million on a project that uh, Upper Deerfield Township, New Jersey, never asked for and didn't want. Mr. Fleetwood, what is your reaction as a taxpayer? As a taxpayer, I'm completely appalled that uh, this type of action can take place. It's, uh, it, uh, to me, it's unwarranted that these type of funds can be spent on, on this type of project. It's, it's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. But again, we're going to need another million dollars in site improvements to make it a livable project. If we don't get those small cities grants, it still won't be a very viable project. Well, I want to thank both of you again for uh, most valuable testimony. We thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our uh, next uh, witness uh, will be Mr. Paul Manafort. Before we uh, swear Mr. Manafort in, the committee will be in recess for five minutes. Well done. Well done. The committee will resume its uh, hearing before swearing in our witness, the chair wishes to advise that HUD indicates that the total cost of the project uh, to the taxpayer is closer to $43 million rather than $47 million. <clears throat> Our next witness is Mr. Paul Manafort. And Ms. Manafort, if you'll please stand. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. Thank you. Mr. Manafort, if you'll kindly identify yourself, uh, if you have any prepared statement, uh, that will be placed in the record in its entirety, and you may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you, Congressman. I the Chair would also like to note at the outset that we appreciate your appearance on a voluntary basis. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to answer your questions and to try and correct the record a bit. Could you pull the mic much closer, much closer? and to try and uh, give you a perspective on this particular project and the roles that the various parties played. I don't have a prepared statement, but I, as yesterday as I was finalizing my preparation for today, I realized that maybe a few items in, in advance where I can ex explain to you the ventures that were involved, the roles that people played, uh, might be useful in helping you to phrase your questions. And then after listening to the mayor's testimony, I thought I might be able to elaborate a bit on some of his comments uh, uh, so that you'll be focused on some of the questions you might Mr. want to ask. Mr. Because Mr. Manafort, you are under no time constraints. <coughs> Take all the time you wish. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your courtesy. First of all, let me explain a minute what the joint venture developer uh, is composed of. There are two entities, CFM Cor Development Corporation and CDC Financial. CFM was established uh, about four years ago. It is a development company doing a number of projects. Uh, this is the only Section 8 mod rehab program, but there are several other projects that it is currently involved in. The partners in that entity are Victor Cruz, who previous to the company being started was the Deputy Commissioner of Housing for the Department of Housing in the state of Connecticut, uh, and had, in that job, uh, 
gained considerable experience in the whole public housing area. And in fact, from his standpoint, there was a personal uh, knowledge as well, having lived 14 years in a low-income public housing project. Uh, James Fox is, was a developer, prior to the, this company being started, was a developer and was very involved in the manufacturing process and brought that type of expertise. And I, although I am a, a, a lobbyist and public relations person here in town, had been involved for a number of years in a series of private development uh, as an investor and as a participant in packaging uh, projects. And that was the experience that I brought, although uh, I did not attest at that time and do not today claim to be an expert in the, in the project of uh, in the, subs uh, the subsidized housing program. Ms. Manafort, could you pull the mic considerably closer because it's very sensitive. The other part of the joint venture is CDC Financial Company, which was established in 1983. It specializes in equity financing and structuring of projects, and up to the point of this project have participated in over 20 syndications of real estate development partnerships, and it participated as a partner in over 15 projects. The principal involved here was Arthur Greenblatt, who prior to his company being formed, was the general counsel of the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. So the experience level of CDC Corporation and Mr. Cruz in particular on the moderate rehab program was considerable and was the base upon which we were able to analyze this project. The principal roles of these two joint venture partners was not a pure role. There was an overlap of responsibilities, even though each party brought certain expertise to, the, uh, to the, this particular project. CFM was responsible for the administrative work, was the project coordinator, uh, dealt with the New Jersey Bureau of Housing, and dealt with the, uh, the Department of HUD. Uh, Mr. Cruz was the action officer in that regard, and he was the one who, uh, I'll get into a minute, was actively involved on a day-to-day -day basis in this project, given his experience in the area. CDC did the project structuring, the financing, some of the technical work, and they managed the overall construction project, because that was their area of expertise. Again, there was some overlap of responsibilities, but those were the principal roles. I want to spend a minute now and talk about Black Manafort Stone and Kelly, and the role that it played in this particular project. Black Manafort Stone and Kelly is a lobbying and public relations firm. It was founded in 1980. It is a bipartisan firm with partners who are active Democrats and active Republicans. We represent corporations, associations, and international clients in Washington and outside of Washington. Our role in this project was to coordinate the administrative process, to do the public relations, to deal with HUD, and in some instances to deal with the Bureau of Housing uh, in, in New Jersey. Let me explain a minute how Black Manafort Stone and Kelly works generally and then specifically on this project, Mr. Chairman. We're a group of professionals, attorneys, public relations personnel, and specialists. For our clients, we use our knowledge and experience of this town or of the issues that the clients may come to us on. When we don't know something, we have the capacity, as an attorney would, uh, to get smart on the issues and be prepared so that from a technical standpoint, we can provide strategy and, and advice. We are knowledgeable of Washington, D.C. We are knowledgeable of the United States government, the process in which the departments and agencies work. We stay current on the issues because it's our responsibility. We try and keep aware of who is for or against issues, what the merits of the issues are, what the politics of the issues are, and what the substance of the issues are. This is true for our client interests, but it's also true, frankly, for things that don't relate to our clients, but which is important to have and being active here in Washington. We also stay current on the institutions, what the priorities of this Congress are, what the priorities of the administration are, the motivations, the objectives, the policy stand from a policy standpoint, as well as from a political standpoint. And finally, we stay current on the key people in the U.S. government. Uh, we, uh, both in the administration and in the, in the exec Congress as they relate to the policy interests of our clients, uh, generally speaking. We use this knowledge, and let me show you how we apply it, and experience to advance our clients' objectives. So that if a client were to come to us, we would put together a client plan, which would have an objective, a method of operations, the tactics, the procedures, and then we'd assign personnel, not necessarily a partnership level, to be actively involved. They then oversee and participate in the implementation of the plan and all the various components that are involved. If I might digress for one minute, sir, and say that I and my partners are, are professionals, but we also are active politically in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. We also have a, 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 what I would call a substantive profile as well. We can't divorce either the substantive or the political profile from our representations, and frankly, we don't try to. We can't let our profiles be a barrier to work in this town or the way we relate in this town, and we don't believe there is any reason to. The key is the standards by which we perform. We believe our standards are high, we believe we work openly and within the system. Uh, Ms. Manafort, since we don't have a copy of your statement and the recorder is having a tremendously difficult time following at your speed. I'm sorry. 
Could you please slow down or distribute copies if you have any copies? It's in an outline form, sir. Fine. Then and, uh, if I could just ask you to read a bit more slowly. I we don't, we don't like talking fast in this committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just try to keep up to your speed, Congressman. <laughs> uh, and we try and give a comprehensive and total effort. We perform in such a way as to never compromise our credibility in this town or our relationships. We deal with our friends, both Democrats and Republicans, in the Congress and the administration, and we deal with professionals and civil servants, as the case might uh, d demand. Uh, the technical term for what we do and what law firms, associations, and professional groups do is lobbying. For purposes of today, I will admit that in a narrow sense, some people might term it influence peddling. Uh, let me explain a minute how the joint venture and Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly worked on this project and how it came into being. Mr. Cruz, as I indicated, has broad experience in a network in the housing area throughout the country had this project brought to him. He analyzed the project. He determined, contrary to some of the comments the mayor has made, that a market rate program was not feasible, meaning that a new construction program without subsidy was not feasible for this program. He also determined that the project already had 100 Section 8 certificates, meaning that HUD had already sanctioned this as a project that was merit-worthy. He also determined that there was new, no new construction program at HUD, uh, so that the only program that made sense in, for this project was the moderate rehab program. And based on some of the HUD regulations on areas that would receive priority treatment, he felt that this would merit uh, consideration one, because HUD, as a priority, urges deconcentration of public housing outside of the urban area. And two, because the area was short on moderate rehab units. And three, because in this particular area at that time, there was a waiting list for this kind of housing of over 200 uh, uh, tenants, a, a, a list that has grown in September of 1988 to 516 for this particular area. Then Mr. Cruz met with the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs Bureau of Housing Standards. And one of the points that was made a few minutes ago and during the mayor's testimony is why wasn't HUD involved? Frankly, sir, as I understand it, the Bureau of Housing is the, is the HUD representative in programs like this. It is the Bureau, instead of HUD, that deals with the local communities. And it was involved from the very beginning because that was the first place that Mr. Cruz went to determine whether this project would receive consideration because if the PHA and the DCA were not to consider this project meritworthy, it would have never gone anywhere. Uh, if I may just stop you there for yes, a sir. moment. You are not contradicting the mayor in his statement that there was no contact to the mayor or to his predecessor or to any of the local officials at the township, is that correct? No, no what, what I'm saying, sir, is the mayor indicated in his written statement, and I believe in his comments, that nobody from HUD during the beginning phases of the project notified the local township. And, and what I am saying, sir, is that it is the responsibility of the Bureau of Housing for DCA, not HUD, to communicate with the local township leadership. They have the responsibility as the coordinator of the program and they were the first group that we would logically go to to determine if they would deem the project to be merit worthy. Well, Ms. Ms. Manafort, if I may uh, rephrase it. The mayor testified that no one from HUD or from the New Jersey Housing uh, Agency communicated with him or with his predecessor or with any other township official until after, as he put it, the project was a fait accompli, a done deal. You are not contradicting that, are you? Well, I, I may be ultimately, uh, Congressman. Well, I'm asking uh, you now. Yeah, I, I, it's my understanding that there were a number of, of contacts prior to when the mayor in his written statement said uh, there, were, there were the initial contacts. It's my understanding that in the spring uh, and early summer, officials of the Bureau of Housing were dealing with local uh, township officials on the feasibility of the plan itself, which was the basis upon which it could go forward. I don't have those exact what dates. What year are you talking about? I'm, I'm talking about uh, 1980. Well, let me look a second. This is an extremely important yes, fact. No, I understand and since that, you have made a major point of indicating that there was prior consultation, I think it's very important for the subcommittee to pin down what appears to be a discrepancy between your testimony and the mayor's, and since both of you are under oath, I am very anxious for the two testimonies to coincide. Uh, and so am I, sir. 
Uh, and I would, it's my understanding that sometime in the, the mayor is talking about August and September, sometime in the spring of that same year, whether it was April, May, June, I'm not exactly certain because I was not principally involved. So you are unaware of, of any first, you have no first-hand knowledge to contradict the mayor's testimony, is that correct? Uh, I have not first-hand knowledge, but it has been related to me, sir. By whom? By Victor Cruz, who was the project officer on this and was the one up there dealing with the local township. Uh, and I think if you would check with the Bureau of Housing, they're pr the appropriate party. But I, I'm led to believe that, uh, that in the springtime, there was communication because the feasibility of the plan had to be determined. What springtime? What year? Spring of that, I think that we're talking about 1986, 87, 87, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, the project by the spring of 1987, Mr. Manafort, had already, had already been approved. But the, co the comments that I'm relating to, sir, are one, that HUD didn't deal with the local township. And what I'm saying is first, that it was the Department of DCA who had that responsibility, not HUD. And they did communicate with the local officials uh, earlier than the mayor could recall. And I'm well, before the project was approved or after the project was approved? In the spring of 1987. Before I the project, but that's the critical question. The, the project wasn't approved until, I believe, June, around June 1st, sir. I'm sorry? I believe it was June 1st that no, the project... No, it's April 24. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe the project had, had uh, been approved. The program may have been approved prior to then, but I don't believe that the developer had... Uh, had been communicated to by before June 1st. I may Let be me read you idea. the facts, because that may refresh your memory, because we are dealing with a very critical issue now. Part of the mayor's testimony related to the fact that the local community did not ask for, was not aware of the project until after it became a done deal. According to the official records that I believe I have, uh, the field office was notified, uh, the field office notified the Public Housing Authority on April 24, 1987. Public Housing Authority advertised May 18, 1987. Only you responded. And uh, the award came on June 1, 1987. So the field, of, the field office notified PHA uh, of the allocation in April 24. Is it your testimony that uh, the mayor and the local people had been advised of this project earlier? It, it is my understanding, sir, that prior to the project being awarded on June 1st, that there was communication between the, the Public Housing Authority and the local township. Uh, I'm not sure who, and that's why I could only refer you at this point to uh, the Department of uh, Community Affairs but they were involved, and, and more importantly, I guess the point, because I'm not trying to, con uh, to contradict the mayor, I'm just trying to explain that the mayor was under the impression, as I interpreted his conversation and reading his statement, that HUD should be communicating with him, and what I'm saying that it is my understanding that the Department of Community Affairs should be communicating with the local townships, and they in fact were. Well, uh, my reading of the mayor's testimony isn't that at all, Mr. Okay, Manifold. well then, my, if, then if, if, if you'll allow me. My reading of the mayor's testimony is that he and his predecessors and other local officials had no idea that this project was in the works. And by the time they were advised by your organization, which is a private organization, I think the mayor repeatedly testified that his first knowledge came not from a public authority, either HUD or New Jersey, but from the developer, uh, you were in the room, I take it, while the mayor testified? Uh, I watched his testimony, yes. Yes. So this is your recollection also, is it not? As to what he said. That is what he said. Uh, that is my understanding. So if you are stating that his first communication came from a public housing authority, whether it's New Jersey's or HUD, then you are contradicting his testimony. And I'm merely trying to pin this down. You're perfectly free to contradict it. No, I, I but I want to be sure whether you are or you are not. No, I understand, sir, and I'm not trying to be argumentative. 
Uh, Nor am I. Uh, oh, I, I know that, and I appreciate the courtesy with which you provided me this time. Uh, I guess what I am referring to in his statement is uh, on page eight. Well, M Mr. Manafort, let me help you, because I'm very, very anxious for all witnesses to, to, to receive all conceivable assistance from the chair, both in terms of rephrasing questions and in terms of obtaining documents, as we have promised to do for Ms. Deborah Dean. I'm very anxious, I'm very anxious for all witnesses to be given all assistance so they can accurately testify. Allow me to give you some facts and tell me where I'm wrong. The application for the 326 units was filed on November 20, 1986. Please check your records to ascertain whether I'm correct or not. I, I don't have that here in front of me. Sorry. I have a copy of the application, and I'm going to send it down to you so you can verify that. Frank, sir, I, I trust your judgment. All right. Well, my question then is, the application was filed on November 20, 1986. November 20, 1986. Is it your testimony now that a duly authorized public housing entity, whether HUD or the New Jersey unit, communicated with local officials prior to November 20, 1986, when the application was filed involving their community? Uh, that I, I am not saying that, sir. I can't say that. I don't know. But I do know for a fact, and what I am saying is that Mr. Cruz met prior to that period of time with Public Housing Authority to talk about the program, and he determined, based on those conversations, that one, there were no units available for that area, right, for, for New Jersey or that area, at least on the books. But there was an acknowledged need that the project was merit-worthy for the following reasons, sir. One, it was in a rural area, and HUD urged deconcentration of, of, of uh, moderate rehab pro, uh, uh, housing units. Two, the existing units, and this is a very relevant point, were in terrible shape. And, and the project was below the standards, most likely, uh, although no determination has been made, and I believe the mayor said that, was probably below the then current housing standards, which were subsequently upgraded. Three, that the, the housing authority felt that the need was considerable for the area because there was already a waiting list of over 200 for there and the project was the, in the inhabitable units was already filled. Um, and in fact, it's my understanding uh, that the local leadership was concerned with the present owner of the project that he had not made any upgrades uh, on the, uh, since he had owned it, I guess, looking into the early 80s. And also, finally, that because there were certificates in that project already, that if a, a, units were to be available in that area, this would be, if not a, the, a leading candidate for consideration because it had already been sanctioned by HUD as meritorious as far as the tenants were concerned. Mr. Manafort, Based may, on I, that, may I stop you for a moment? Certainly. I'd like to read to you a paragraph from the Wall Street Journal dated May 25, 1989. It refers to this project. Whatever the genesis of the project, it followed an unusual course. In November 1986, a representative of Black Manafort arranged a meeting with an official. Could we please have some uh, decorum? Whatever the genesis of the project, it followed an unusual course. In November 1986, a representative of Black Manafort arranged a meeting with an official of the Division of Housing and Development in the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. At the meeting, a representative of the project said, and I'm now quoting Mr. William Connolly, who is Director of Housing for New Jersey. Your representative said, this is a quote, that they had made arrangements in HUD, Washington, for mod rehab units. Continuing the quote, the funds would be coming out of the secretary's discretionary fund. If we would apply for the units, they would be approved. Let me go through this one more time, because this is absolutely critical to what we are dealing with. 
The Wall Street Journal on May 25, in an article by Edward Pound and Kenneth Bacon, says the following. Your representative, in November of 86, went to the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. And your representative told the director of housing for New Jersey that your, your organization has already made arrangements with HUD in Washington for mud rehab units. And the funds would be coming out of the secretary's discretionary fund if New Jersey would just apply for the units, they would be approved. Now it seems to the chair that this is precisely the reverse of the process that Congress approved and which is on the books. The process that Congress approved makes for the local housing authority, and you could argue, you could argue whether that should be Deerfield the township, which has a perfectly competent housing officer, or whether it should be the New Jersey Housing Authority, one would think that they would consult. One would also presume that the initial request would come from the local community. This local community seems to be well represented by mayor, housing officer. These people would say, we have a real need here. They would then consult with New Jersey. New Jersey would put it in the priority list of all other requests from all other local communities in New Jersey. And on the basis of a priority list, they would make an application to HUD. In point of fact, and I'm asking you whether the Wall Street Journal statement is accurate, we had an exact reverse of the process. Your representative went to the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs they said, we already have the 326 units. Why don't you people apply for it? And it's a done deal. You're going to get it. Is the Wall Street Journal story accurate on this point? That's exactly the next point that I want to get into, sir. And I want well, to give I'm you asking process. you if it's accurate. It is partially accurate. I cannot respond to the quotes that I think it was Mr. Connolly made, because I was not in that meeting. But I will you know, stipulate Well, let me something. rephrase it. In what particulars is my paraphrase inaccurate? Well, that, that's what I want to get into. The, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm going to explain to you, I think, the, the chronology that you, you wish to have the information on. That's, that's the very next point I have here. But the, the meeting that I was talking about with the local DCA happened first, when we, and we determined that the project was feasible. At that point in time, Mr. Cruz sat with me in Washington, or, or talked with me, communicated with me, and we determined that we would get information on what the process was. And I signed an associate in my staff uh, to check that out as to what the procedure was in Washington. We confirmed uh, that there was headquarter authority to assign uh, units to various housing programs. You confirmed? In the sense that we, we, we found out that the, we blood would believe at that point in time, you know, the, the FHA commissioner had the authority to dispense with well, the Well, of course units. he had the well, authority. Oh, that, that's I did not know that when I was well, personally. Let, let, me, let me take you back a but, bit. But I think the next point is what you want to hear, Congressman, if I can just. If you just I'll be happy to hear your next point. Uh, and we determined that Ms. Dean, as the Chief of Staff, was involved in the process. Uh, and we then approached her. Uh, and we, we did not, made no determination that she had. Who uh, approached her? Uh, Lawrence Gay of my staff. I'm yes. sorry? I'm gonna, Lawrence Gay of my staff, sir, approached her. He was meeting with her on another matter dealing with the city of Camden that we represent here in Washington on a general representation. And he was dealing with her on a HUD matter. And he asked her about the moderate rehab program and indicated that we had a potential project uh, that, and hopefully a program could be funded. She asked if the PHA would support the program. We were able to indicate that, yes, based on a meeting that we had already had, the PHA would be willing to support the program because it felt the need was there and it felt it fit within HUD's priorities. She then asked Mr. Gay if the PHA had submitted a request for units. Mr. Gay didn't know that, and he said he would have to get back to her. Uh, he ultimately responded to her that they had not, but they would be submitting it because they did approve of the project, uh, project itself. We had no understanding, however, I should say at this well, point. Well, they didn't know that there was such a thing as a project until your people brought the idea. No, but we were already talking with the PHA. That's, that's the point I was trying to make earlier, sir. We went first to the PHA to determine the project feasibility. 
And once Mr. Cruz determined that it was feasible for all the reasons I mentioned a minute ago, then we went to HUD. And we determined that HUD had the Washington-based discretionary authority. And we determined, be, uh, as a part of another meeting, uh, that, uh, that if, if the PHA would support the project, that it would, the program would, funding would get consideration. So, so we had already talked with the PHA prior to dealing with Ms. Dean. That's the point I'm trying to stress. Well, let me, let me tell you what point I'm trying to inquire about. Who brought the, the existence of the township of Upper Deerfield, New Jersey, to the attention of your company? How did that thing happen? You mean the project itself, sir? Well, the existence of, uh, of uh, the, the township, uh, you, maybe you knew about the township. No. But I didn't know about the township until the news stories broke. So who brought the, the, the fact to your attention that there is such a town and there is a dilapidated unit uh, that has 326 uh, the, apartments in it? The program was brought to Mr. Cruz's attention, sir, when the project was brought to him sometime in uh, 1986 by somebody who had been, a developer who had been looking at the project and chose not to go forward with it, and in a conversation he had with Mr. Cruz, he brought it to his attention. Then Mr. Cruz did what I indicated to you earlier, sir. He went to the, he analyzed the, the site, he looked at the project, he met with the present owner, uh, he did some research, he met with the DCA, public housing authority officials. Then we determined that the project was feasible under a mod rehab program approach, because there was a need, there was over 200 people waiting list, they were terribly substandard, uh, and, and there was no other housing in the area. If based on that, we then, he then came to me, and we went to HUD to see if this program, based out of Washington, could be funded through the, through the local PHA. And we were told, not unless the public housing uh, uh, agency would approve the merit worthiness of the project. We had already made that determination in dealing with them, as I'm led to believe. And so when we went back to the PHA, and told them, and this is, I think, the meeting that is referred to in the Wall Street Journal, when we went back to them after the meeting with Ms. Dean uh, and, and asked if they'd be willing to submit an application, we were, led, we were told, yes, they would. And, and that's the conversation, I think, that's quoted in that journal article. The application was then submitted for the program. Mr. And Manafort, what is your current understanding of how such a project should flow from step to step? I'm not asking you what your understanding was maybe two years ago. What is your current understanding, having followed these hearings? Yes, I'm I sure have. you have. Yes, I have. So tell me now what your understanding is, how a mod rehab project should move. It is where, where does it originate? Where does it go next? Where is it approved? How it is? As I understand it, sir, the key point is the Public Housing Authority making a determination that a program should be funded. And, and there are a variety of instances where sometimes developers have gone to the Public Housing Authority first. No, I'm asking you how it is supposed to work, not how it has worked it, under Mr. Pierce. No, 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 not just under, uh, it's my understanding that it is common practice, and it's my understanding only, I don't have it from personal experience, although you could refer to this project as personal experience. It is my understanding that developers are constantly dealing with public housing authorities uh, in advance of programs being funded. That's how systems get in, programs get into the pipeline. It's not unusual for a developer to go to a public housing authority and say, we can do this, are you willing, do you support the concept and can we work together? And in fact, that practice is what frequently happens. Then the PHA makes a re request to the HUD, in this case, the HUD central office, and a program gets funded or not, there is no re responsibility on the part of HUD central to respond. That, I understand, is the point of contention that your hearings are, are, are meant to uh, delve into, and I appreciate that point, but the practice of dealing with PHAs before a, pro a, a project program is funded is not unusual as I understand it, sir. Well, Mr. Manafort, may I ask you what your private opinion is as a citizen of the responsible officials, the mayor, city council, having not a clue that some developer is planning to see to it that a state public housing authority should apply for units for a project within the confines of that community. Well, let me just say, sir, in a comment that you made a minute ago as well, the local township didn't have a housing authority. 
So otherwise, we'd have it gone. It had a to housing head. officer. It, it, it had a mayor. It, it, it didn't have a housing authority, though, sir. So we couldn't go and sit and to, to, with a. We went to the appropriate housing authority as we understood it. I am asking you a different question, Mr. Manafort. But, but I'm getting to that. No, I'm asking you a very simple question. I'm asking you to address the question I'm asking you. I'm enormously patient and courteous. But I expect the courtesy of a response to the questions I ask. If, in fact, we hadn't dealt with the local township, I would think that that would be something that might upset the local township. Uh, I'm what, sorry? If we hadn't dealt with the local township officials, I could understand why they would be upset. If? We had not. If? We had not. Did you deal with them as, prior as a, to oh, moving on this? It is my understanding, and again, I was not, the, I, Victor Cruz of my partnership, sir, and I was not the action, at this phase, I was not involved in it. Uh, it, it Is it your understanding from Mr. Cruz, whom we will invite to testify, is it your understanding that Mr. Cruz discussed this project with the mayor and the city council and the housing officer of this community I before know, moving on it? I, I don't know if it was with Mayor Peterson, because I don't remember when he took He had office. a predecessor, too. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding. Mayor Facemeyer has written a letter to us saying he was totally unaware uh, of and, it. And I want to get you, sir, and I will, the specific dates. I mean, I, uh, this has come up today, so I was not prepared to testify on the specific dates. I will, I will provide for the committee, if you wish. Uh, the dates of when we appreciate I, I believe those meetings occurred uh, and you'll be able to uh, even draw your own conclusions but it's my understanding that uh, that there were meetings prior to I think believe it was late August that the mayor talked about uh, okay. either between the DCA officials and the local leadership uh, or possibly with Mr. Cruz as well just uh, a technical question Mr. Manafort because I'm very anxious that all witnesses have all information available to them Upon receipt of the mayor's testimony, we faxed that to your office. Did you receive it? Uh, I got that about uh, 7.30 last night, and I did appreciate did it. Did you read it? Uh, I read it last night, but I have not been, I've not been able to assemble dates uh, in the last uh, 36 hours, or 24 hours. But I Please. will get you those dates uh, just so that we you have the information. That. Please proceed. And, and I did appreciate the courtesy of sure. making a statement last night. Um, From that point forward, so we've gotten to the point where we made, we took, went back to the PHA and suggested that if they, they submitted a request, that the program uh, could be funded. The so letter, the Wall Street Journal story is accurate? Yeah, to the degree I've testified, yes, sir. Uh, well, is it inaccurate in any particular? I, I don't remember the whole article, so I can't. No, I'm uh, merely asking about one paragraph. I will now read that one paragraph to you again. We are dealing with serious matters, and I'm trying to give you all the opportunity of following what I'm saying. Whatever the genesis of the project, it followed an unusual course. In November 1986, a representative of Black Manafort arranged a meeting with an official of the Division of Housing and Development in the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. At the meeting, a representative of the project, and now I'm quoting Mr. William Connolly, said, that they had made arrangements, they meaning you, right. had made arrangements in HUD Washington for mod rehab units. The funds would be coming out of the secretary's discretionary fund. If we would apply for the units, they would be approved." End quote. Is this accurate? I don't want to be quibbling, but there was the expectation that the program would be funded there, yes. I was not a party to that conversation, so I can't say that the quotes are exactly accurate. But one of the points I think needs to be stressed here is we were hopeful in, that the pro program would be funded, and you might even say we had expectations that it would be funded. How high were your uh, expectations? They were, they were not as so high that I wasn't concerned. That, uh, that From the whom did you obtain indications that the, that the uh, application would be approved. The, the conversations that Mr. Gay had with Ms. Dean led us to believe that whatever process HUD would take, that the program, uh, you know, I'll go so far as to say would be funded, but there was no guarantee that it was going to be funded, I guess is the, the, the quibbling. Expectation, yes. Guarantee, no. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Other, other than that, without having been a party to that conversation. If you did not have what you felt was a verbal guarantee, why did you sign a contract with your development partner which allowed them to back out of the project if, in fact, the units wouldn't be forthcoming? You well, had such an agreement. Well, that's the point. It was conditional because there wasn't a guarantee. That was exactly the point. 
you gave them an option to back out. Well, they required that. They wanted that option, and, and we provided it, but the program... But if you provide that option, that indicates to me a fairly high degree of confidence that the funding will be forthcoming. Except we hadn't exercised our option with the owner either, sir. And, and there would have, it would have happened seriatim. In other words, we had an option on the property. We had not purchased the property at that time. And if the program hadn't been funded, frankly, we wouldn't have purchased the property because it didn't make economic sense as a market rate program. So we had comfort level in providing that to the joint venture partner because if the program didn't get funded, they wouldn't have participated and we wouldn't have purchased the property. Okay? Go ahead, Mr. Thank Minister. you, sir. Um, from that point forward, Mr. Cruz and Mr. Cartwright of my firm worked very closely together on the project with Mr. Cartwright acting as administrative officer. And it's important to stress, in my judgment, from Black Manafort Stone and Kelly's standpoint, that we have logged, as we, uh, as we estimate it, over 200, maybe 300 hours on this project, uh, and, and possibly even more, because our role in this project, and this is the point that I, I want to stress at this time, was to coordinate between the CDC elements and the, uh, and the CFM elements of the joint venture, and to de participate publicly and openly in meetings with the Bureau of Housing, in meetings with the local township, in meetings with HUD as were appropriate, so we were actively and openly involved attending meetings, and Mr. Cartwright made numerous trips up there, and, and as I say, we've spent over two, easily could be over 300 hours on the project, and we're still involved in the project, uh, and will continue to be involved in the project until it is, the, the construction is completed and the public relations campaign uh, is, is terminated. I, I, I guess I should go to one other point, and that's regarding the fee, because the committee has shown some interest in that. Uh, let me say that there was a recognition on my part as the developer that we are going to need consultants, not just to do the, the as you would call it, uh, program uh, allocation, but also to do some of the considerable administrative work. Obviously, I have confidence in my own firm, and we agreed among the joint venture partners that Black Man of Fort Stone and Kelly could and should be actively involved. How did we price that? I think, as you've already heard testimony, uh, the general knowledge on the, is the market prices range from $1,000 to $2,000 per unit. Now, I don't know what other people did for $1,000 or $2,000 per unit. We did peg our work on a per unit basis, but we, our scope of work, and this is an important distinction, was not to provide the units and then walk away. Our scope of work was to provide ongoing service. As I said, we've logged two to 300 hours already and we'd be, cons we'd be cons active until the end of the project. The project is not completed. We are still active. Your testimony is that the firm logged 300 hours on this project. We, we, we can estimate, sir, based on just the number of trips that Mr. Yes. Cartwright took, a uh, considerable amount of time, and then lo local meetings as well and things like that. We were active and are active and will continue to be active openly a accepting, in the process. Accepting that figure. And, and the other point, sir, is that expenses, because this is a gross fee, expenses incurred, the travel back and forth and things like that, are allocated against the fee as well. Uh, so that, you know, I've never estimated what the, the, the net sum is, but... Uh, Was Mr. Cartwright the principal person? No, he is... Mr. He is, Cruz and Mr. Cartwright? Mr. C Cruz is a, is a principal in the joint venture. Mr. Cartwright is a professional in Black Manafort, Stone and Kelly. And he did most of the work on... He did the... He has been doing most of the administrative and technical work on the project and has been attending all of the meetings, yes. Who else was involved from your company? Mr. Gay, as I indicated, uh, yes. was involved. Uh, and myself, and basically that was it. There's been some conversation that Mr. Black, a partner of mine, was actively involved in this project, and that's not true. Very good. We are very happy to have uh, the record. And, and, and I guess before... Could I, could I just pursue that a minute? Absolutely. So the three principal individuals involved were you, Mr. Gay, and... Uh, Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright. Uh, and the three of you combined put in about 300 hours. We feel, I feel comfortable saying that it could easily be more. And what were the expenses involved? The uh, I have not added those up. I can, you know, we can go back and look at that. It's the travel back the ballpark. And I, I don't know what it, uh, maybe what a tra the, you know, travel from Washington to uh, to Trenton to Seabrook and back, whatever that would be on a you know round trip basis on a on a re regular basis, is what the basic expenses are. I mean, well, so a couple hundred dollars, maybe twenty trips. I mean, it's, That'd be four thousand dollars, and that's and then the then the obviously the time. I'm not, what I'm trying to say is that the fee 
was for ongoing service, was a gross fee of, against which all expenses might be applied, uh, in, in, and was not simply, because there's been some discussion about this, to produce units to a program. Th that's the only point I'm trying to make. I'm not well, trying but, to be... But accepting your figures at face value, which I'm perfectly happy to do, you are still talking about a, an hourly consulting fee of over $1,000? That would be an eight-hour day at eight thousand dollars or nine thousand dollars. Uh, you know, whatever the market uh, uh, brings. If I might put it into perspective, Congressman, if you yeah. allocate it over three years, which is what we've been involved in this project, it's about one hundred eight thousand dollars on a gross basis. Well, you the don't allocate it over a period of years. You allocate no. it over the number of hours that you devoted well, to it. Well, but I was about to make a point, and if you look at our annual client base. Our client base, we, get, we work on an annual retainer basis with our clients, and frankly, sir, our fees, which are annualized, are double that, if not more so, for our clients on an average basis. So this falls not just on the lower end of our fees, if you allocated it. Do I, do I understand that you are billing your clients at over $2,000 an hour? We are billing on a retainer basis a quarter of a million dollars a year, sir. Well, I'm yeah. not asking We're, you, I am not asking you on a per annum basis. We are both intelligent. But that's how we charge, sir. Well, let me explain to you why that is an inappropriate way to charge, if you'll allow me. If one client takes 10 hours of your time a year, and another client takes 10,000 hours of your time a year, you don't bill them the same amount. No one in his right mind would suggest that you do. You, you may be allocating, you may be billing on an annual basis, but your billing is predicated on an estimate of the number of hours you devote. No, it isn't. It is not, sir. I mean, I, I'm not, again, trying to be argumentative, but that is not... Nor our, am I. I'm just that fascinated is not by your billing procedures. No, our, our billing procedures... Uh, uh, well, wait. let's just deal with this simple project. But, but uh, Allow me to fine. pursue that, because I think we are dealing with matter of public interest, public responsibility, public trust. Secretary Jack Kemp blew the whistle on this whole project, stopped all allocations, uh, the Attorney General is investigating all hot field offices. We have lots of problems here, so let's not slip over I was that. only trying to put it into perspective, sir. We don't work on a billable hour basis. We only work on an annual retainer basis, and when you allocate what would have been, since this is a three-year program, it over the three years, and we're only a several, about two months behind schedule based on some things we'll get into in a little while, so we anticipated a two-and-a-half to three-year program of involvement on Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. Uh, when you allocate it out, all I'm suggesting is that pursuant to our billing program, this fee, while it might sound very high, comes out to about $100,000 a year, and according to Washington standards, that is not very high. Chairman. And certainly according yes, to our billing standards, it is below average for our fees. Well, let, that's the only point I'm making. Let me just establish Only when the they facts. do low-income housing let that me, they charge so little, Mr. Chairman. Let me just, let me just uh, establish the facts so we all understand it. I stipulate that your billings are on a per annum basis, and you're perfectly free to bill any way you choose, as long as the clients are prepared to pay, and they obviously are prepared to pay, so obviously rendering services. In this particular instance, it is your testimony, Mr. Manafort, that you and your two associates spent about 300 hours on working this project through. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. It is your testimony, sir, that you had about $4,000 in transportation expenses, plus presumably additional thousands of dollars of telephone and other expenses. I, I, I have never added up the expenses, so I, I don't want to be, I mean, I can provide, try and put that information yeah. together, but I don't know the number. The, 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 there were additional expenses. It is still fair to say that on an hourly basis, you charged a project involving low-cost housing for low-income people at a rate of $1,000 an hour. Is that a logical inference from your testimony? Th that is a logical inference from our tes my testimony. Thank you very much. Please proceed. The, the only other points I'd like to clarify, on, based on some testimony that was this, this morning, I think some questions you had, and Congressman Franks had one question, how many tenants were displaced? Uh, three were, sir. Permanently? Uh, no. No, but my question was permanently. So there there were three clients, three clients, three tenants who were determined to be ineligible for subsidy. 
they, and since are still living in the units, they have moved into new units and are paying the market rate. Your All others. If the general would that you address me, happy the mayor said it was his understanding that some people would be unable to pay the market rate and ineligible for subsidy. You're saying that he was wrong? No, what I said was there were well, three. What, what, uh, following there were three, that but testimony, you said they were paying the market rate. The, the, if you, no, no, no. You what I was, with the mayor. What, no, let me back up. I'm sorry if I didn't say it correctly. I heard that testimony, so I made a phone call to try and get that number. And I was told that there were three tenants that were tenants when we purchased the property who would not qualify based on the income test for the subsidy, so would have had to move out of the project and been displaced from an income standpoint. I was also told that those three tenants have chosen to stay in the rehabbed units and are prepared to pay whatever the rate so is. You're contradicting the, the mayor. The mayor said that there were people, to his understanding, who were neither able to afford the market rate nor eligible for subsidy. So you're saying that the mayor was wrong. I am also surprised that you didn't, while you were there, ask them who talked to the mayor. I mean, you seem to have gotten some of the information on your phone. Well, I think it was others, people from the Bureau of Housing. Well, I didn't ask that yeah. question, but I'm going to I understand you. why you didn't, Mr. Matter, because I don't think you wanted to hear the answer. <laughs> I mean, I think you, but so you're saying the mayor was wrong and no one's going to be permanently displaced. I mean, the mayor said that, that's, that's yeah, I guess that, that what I'm saying is that he ultimately was wrong. He was correct in that there were some tenants who didn't qualify no, the for the mayor subsidy. Didn't say, he said there were some people who would be permanently displaced if he was wrong. He was Th wrong that is wrong, on, as I'm led to believe. Well, so. we'll, we'll check that. And, uh, him, and the number is three. Me. Additionally, a point that the mayor made was that we had to relocate re uh, uh, some of the elderly tenants. Originally, in our scope of work, that was not our intention, but as we got into the project, we discovered asbestos. And in order to remove, pursuant to the appropriate codes, the asbestos, we had to temporarily relocate those elderly tenants into some rehabbed units. Then we moved them back into, or in the process still in some cases, of moving them back into their old units so that they are going to be where they were living, by and large, uh, in rehabbed uh, facility. Um, and one other point of clarification that was raised in the mayor's testimony, uh, just so, so that you'll understand, and I'm not sure who's, who asked the question, regarding the, uh, the letter to, that's attached on the, the substandard, on the question of whether the, the project met the, uh, the housing standards uh, and what we were trying to do with that. Let me explain. We were in a catch-22 situation. We acknowledged that the units certainly, in our judgment, were below standard of the existing code, never mind the one that was going to ultimately be adopted. And we were looking forward to purchasing the projects. There was a penalty clause in that code which said that there would be a thousand dollar a day penalty per unit for substandard housing which meant that when we bought the project that we acknowledged was substandard we'd be getting penalized approximately three hundred twenty six thousand dollars a day for units which we already agreed were out of uh, out of uh, certainly out of out of uh, sync with the proposed code and what we, we were looking for was relief while we were rehabbing the units that we wouldn't be hit with that penalty that was the basis for that uh, that communication and correspondence we weren't trying to get around anything. We acknowledged right up front that the units needed to be rehabbed. Uh, and so that's what that whole correspondence was, was directed towards. It was a catch-22 situation where we were going to be blamed for somebody else's sins when we were coming in trying to clean up the project. Um, I guess that's the end of my opening statement. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ms. Manafort. I think we clarified a few things in, in these exchanges. I just have a few questions, then I'll turn to Mr. Shays. Was a blind copy of the application sent to Deborah Dean? Of the public housing application? I believe it was, yes. Whose idea was that? It, I, I, um, it probably was Ms. Dean's idea. I'm sorry? It probably was Ms. Dean's idea. I was not privy to the conversation, so I can't answer that directly. Um, but that probably was to notify people in HUD Central that the PHA had made the formal request. Why do you assume it was Ms. Deborah Dean who suggested that a blind copy be sent to her? Well, the only reason I can assume it, and I, I know I shouldn't be doing that, is because that's who we were dealing with. Well, if you deal with a public official 
it's rather unusual for the public official to request that blind copies of yeah. correspondence. I don't know why it was blind as opposed to simply a carbon copy. It I mean, was a blind okay. carbon copy. That, that I don't know. And why it was blind as opposed to carbon, I don't know. I, I thought we were, I, I misunderstood. I should listen more carefully. I thought we were talking about a carbon copy. If it, I believe you that it was blind, but I don't know why it was blind is what I'm saying. I would assume the basis of my answer why she was what, carboned was as I've testified, but... As did you know Secretary Pierce? No, I did not, sir. You have never met him? I may I mean, have. not up to that time, but you had no relation. I have no recollection of having met Secretary Pierce, although not to say that he wasn't at various functions I was at. Yeah, of course. And what, uh, what uh, uh, was your relationship with Ms. Dean? How well did you know her? Had uh, you done any? At that time, it, I would call it a political relationship. I had not done any business with her. Uh, I had not uh, had any kind of special relationship with her. You may want to consult your documents on, uh, in answering this, uh, Ms. Manafort. How do you explain the fact that on April 9, 1987, your group entered into an agreement to purchase Seabrook Apartments. This was at a time after HUD had approved the application, but yet two weeks before the HUD field office notified the public housing agency that it had been awarded 326 units. Did you receive advance notice of this award? Of the award to the program? Uh, I think we felt that the program was going to be funded, yes, sir. There was, yes, I'm sure there was an understanding that the program was going to be funded. There was no assurance that the project was going to be funded. There's a distinction, sir, between the PHA program being funded where there was a, at that stage, I believe, a high degree of expectation. There was not an a, a, a expect, guarantee is the right word, that the project, the, this particular project, would be funded. In fact, as you know, it was advertised. And there was a possibility that, uh, that it would not be funded, that pr this particular project would not be funded. So when we closed on the deal on, if it was April 9th, I don't have the closing date on you know, in my information here. Um, if we closed on it on April 9th, it would have been with one expectation and a hope on the other, but not a guarantee. What is your view, general view, of uh, dealing with a governmental agency which has a program that should be available to qualified applicants on the basis of objective criteria in a priority order, yet it seems that fees are necessary to coax approval out of this public agency for specific projects which may be much less meritorious than other public projects that do not hire influential consultants who charge fees. Congressman, I guess my opinion is as long as the project is merit worthy and the pr procedure is followed, then it is Well, the procedure was clearly not followed. The procedure was followed totally in reverse. But let's assume that the project has some merit. Let's assume that on a scale of 10, the agency has large numbers of applications that are enormously meritorious. Objective analysts would rate them as number 10 projects. But there is another project that may have a rating of two. And the project, which has a very low rating, gets funded, but a much more meritorious project doesn't get funded. What is your view of that? If they're both meritorious, then uh, my view is that it was appropriate. You don't differentiate in well, allocation see, of you're, scarce you're, resources. You're, Allow me to finish. I'm sorry, sir. Let me give you an analogy. Let me take it entirely out of the housing field. Let me take it into a field where congressmen function so you can have a degree of detachment and objectivity in evaluating how we perform. Let me take as an example our appointments to the service academies. Each of us has the privilege of submitting to the service academies young men and women 
who then, if they are accepted, go to Annapolis and West Point and the Air Force Academy and so on. And let's assume that there are two congressmen. One congressman establishes a committee of retired military officers representing all the services and says, you take all the applications on the basis of your knowledge and background and experience, rate these people in rank order and I will accept your recommendation and those will be my appointments to the service academies. And let me take another congressman and I think this is a hypothetical congressman, there is no such congressman, who says to all of these applicants, uh, you go and see my finance chairman, friend, what not, and pay him $10,000 and then you will get a slot at West Point, which is a scarce slot. What would be your reaction to the second method of allocating service academy appointments? I guess the first question I would ask is, is the second person who's chosen merit worthy on his own? Is that the first question you would ask? I, I think that the, ultimately the question is, is the applicant or the project in this instance merit worthy? Well, let me tell you what question I would And ask. was the procedure followed in the absence of a specific procedure, was it followed in a way that was, was, was legal? Those I would be two considerations that yeah. I think have to be looked at. Yeah. Well, I you, you, would not be, you would not be outraged that scarce slots at West Point are sold to the highest Well, bidder. not sold. I mean, that's, I, would, I would be outraged if they were sold, yes. So well, this kind of influence sold. peddling would mean selling them, wouldn't it? Would it not? I mean, weren't these units sold? James Watt testified that the going rate was one or two thousand dollars. Well, the going rate means a price, and the price means a sale. Well, I used to be a professor of economics, but this is not higher economics. No, if there is a going rate and somebody pays money and somebody accepts money, there is a sale consummated. I, I cannot discuss what Mr. Watt's arrangements were, sir, so I don't try to well, do I'm that. Well, I'm talking about the arrangement Our arrangement in general. was not that, and that's the point that I'm, I mean, if you're going from a speculative to a specific, and I, and I guess I understand what you're, what you're trying to do, and I don't, disagree with the, the analogies that you're trying to make, but as far as the project specific is concerned, the key judgment in my fact, two key judgments are one is the program merit worthy and two is the procedure, whether it's a, a good procedure or a bad procedure, but if it's the procedure, is it being followed? Th those are the criteria. And as far as our project is concerned, the, the Seabrook project is concerned, uh, I believe, and I believe the Public Housing Authority believes up there, that there was clearly a need that the units were substandard, that this would be a leading project in any objective, under any objective criteria. Uh, and based on that, what our request uh, for fun funding our project was made, they had no problem in justifying it. What, what is your reaction to the closing comments of the mayor and the housing officer, both of whom expressed outrage at what is a project in their community? I disagree with it, sir. You disagree with that. And do I he hear you testifying, Mr. Manafort, that if you have to make a judgment about allocating scarce resources, then it makes no difference to, to you whether one project is much more meritorious than another project? I, I believe there's a threshold, sir. And if it passes the threshold and the procedures don't call for any gradation beyond that, then I believe they're both, you know, they both merit consideration. And, and, I'm, and I, should, I should back up a second and say, and I'm not saying that my project is a two. I happen to believe it's much higher than a two. Uh, and, and I mean, it can be a 10 based on the, the objective criteria. Well, Mr. Chairman, could I ask just a question because this is, please. How many other projects are you familiar with? Uh, How do you rate your project compared to well, others? Uh, uh, it's, just, it's a speculative, I guess, is, is the... Uh, no, but you're saying yours is one of the best projects, uh, not am, just meets the criteria. Uh, what I'm saying, Congressman, is that I believe that our project fills a definite need in the community if, in fact, these units were demolished. And that would be the only alternative, because new construction is not feasible. Do you have any idea feasible. of other projects that were turned down where someone didn't have a consultant they could pay $300,000 for? Do you know if those projects were any more or less meritorious than yours? No, and that's why I can't answer okay. the specific question, And I don't sir. think you can defend why your, wh 
you can say that your project was more meritorious than any others. You knew it satisfied basic criteria. When we look at it and we see the large amounts of money, $1,000 an hour paid to somebody, we tend to think that that person's judgment is not totally objective on the issue. If I may reclaim my Congressman, I, I understand the point. I guess my only point, and, and I'm not trying to be difficult here, is that we viewed this project as one which filled the local need. And, and we looked at the regulations and, in fact, felt that this would get a priority treatment because it was decentralizing, because it was moving it out of the urban area, because there was such a long waiting list, and because the units were so in such substandard condition that, absent the mod rehab, the units would have to be closed down, and then a 200-person waiting list would grow to whatever the, the units were there because there was no other housing. So we felt without trying to b compare it to all the other projects in the world, which we no have no ability to do, we felt that this project did merit consideration. And when we met with the Public Housing Authority, this is the key point. They felt so too, otherwise we wouldn't have gone forward. That's my only point. I don't try and judge it as a two or a 10. I was just trying to clarify because the, the, the chairman had not talking about my project compared a two and a 10, and I didn't want my remarks to be viewed is that I was looking at us at the lower end of the scale. I was not trying to say that it merited X versus all the others in the universe. Mr. Manafort, final question. What other HUD projects have you been involved with? Uh, me personally, sir? You and your company. Uh, Black, you mean Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly? Uh, there was one other housing project that we were involved in about the same time in West Palm Beach. We received a retainer. Uh, the project, as I understand it, never went forward. Those are the only two hot projects uh, the, in which the, either you personally or the company were involved with. To, to the best of my knowledge, those are the only two, sir. I, I, I guess I should clarify, but, but I believe I'm being correct. I mean, I have not been personally involved in many of the in, in any of the kind of HUD representations beyond even the moderate rehab. Moderate rehab, but when I asked that question, anticipating uh, you know being asked it here today, I was told there was one other project in the West Palm Beach area, uh, and and we we dealt with HUD in a similar way. Uh, to try and get the units uh, pr to the program funded. I understand that the program was funded, but the project was never funded. Mr. Chairman, just one other. I, I will have to turn to members of the subcommittee first, if I may. Congressman Shays. I would be happy to defer to you. I appreciate the chairman giving me the floor, but I'm happy to defer. I just wanted to clarify that factual point. In the Wall Street Journal of, if I could have the paperback, uh, June 19th, uh, Charles Black is quoted that the firm represented probably three or four clients at HUD. Well, HUD. The, I, I'm sorry, I thought You're the talking was about just moderate section. rehab. No, I, I, I mean HUD in general. Oh, I apologize, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to yeah, clarify it. Sir. I'm glad we are. Um, we have we, the clients that came to us purely for HUD were the two that I mentioned, my client and, and this other development. We have what we call, as I indicated earlier, general representation. The city of Camden, for example, we represent on a variety of issues, not just HUD, and we have dealt with HUD on some issues that relate to ha uh, Camden, oh, some HODAGs, some UDAGs. We represent the, the National Handicapped Association, and we have represented them before HUD on some handicapped housing uh, programs. We represent uh, a university that had a, had a housing component that we represent them on, and we represented uh, on a pro bono basis uh, uh, Coach Gibbs on this, this uh, housing program that you may have heard about last night, uh, and we were involved in helping assist him in that program as well. So there, there is some involvement on a program by program basis, as I'm led to believe the two instances I told you on the moderate rehab are those the only involvements. But no, none of those representations, and Gibbs is pro bono, but none of the other representations is for HUD representation only, it's general representation. Congressman Shays. As you uh, started to testify and I saw everybody taking pictures of you, I thought I was happy I wasn't in your shoes and thought that someday any one of us could be as well. And I, it's not very easy to, to find yourself where you are right now, but I do know you came uh, voluntarily uh, and asked to, uh, to testify. Uh, I have a number of questions I want to ask you. Um, and I have to say that, that you are being billed as a consultant, but you're also actually an owner as well, which is uh, the difference between, well, actually, Ms. Siegel was a consultant owner. Uh, James Watt appears to have been just a consultant. 
all of them describe this system as, as very flawed. Uh, Ms. Siegel made her point that she did the best with a flawed system, and she said to us up here, uh, you, you know, this was the system that, that we had to operate within, and we made the best of it. Uh, Mr. Watt seemed almost proud of his um, conduct, and uh, while he said it was a flawed system, thought that uh, America was great, and he was happy to, uh, to, um, to, to make the money he did make. I'm having a hard time characterizing your, your, um, your position on this whole process. And it strikes me that, that in some ways you're on very dangerous ground. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm right in thinking uh, that you're headed in the direction I think you're thinking. Uh, Deborah Gordine, in this, this quote that many of the members have, dis have read, but, but I would like to read it again to you, said at least one former, this is from a Wall Street Journal article, at least one former HUD official, Deborah Gordine, makes no bones about how this program was run. It was set up and designed to be a political program. I would have to say we ran it in a political manner, said Ms. Dean, who wielded immense power at HUD, as we obviously know. Now, we, we, previous to your testimony, we had a mayor come and testify that he really had never had any say in the project, that uh, he questioned whether the town really wanted the project, and he said he had a hard time getting the, the project up to standard. Uh, it's very clear, at least to me, and, and if you want to dissuade me uh, or this committee, that the project ended up being very expensive. And uh, that, at least according to the mayor, he felt that the rents were the highest in the community. Uh, the implication is that, that, um, that HUD was willing to agree to pay higher rate, a rent, agree to a higher rent, and the significance of that is that obviously the tenants would pay a certain portion up to the 30% of income, and HUD makes up the difference. Now, when we first started out, I was of the, of the impression that what we were talking about was, was the payment, uh, as Mr. Watts said, common knowledge on the street, it was $1,000 to $2,000 per unit. Uh, that was common knowledge to him and I guess everyone else who was, who was relatively connected. And I thought that was the expense and I thought that was coming out of the profits. And uh, though I didn't like that, that's where I was led up to. But really what I think the mayor is saying to us is that you better look at this project because some people not only were able to get meritorious product, the projects, but some were able to get projects accepted that really cost HUD too much money. And I think he is making it very clear to this committee that your project was, was, was that kind of project. Project that was very expensive, the rents were higher than the market rate, uh, maybe not even wanted in the community, but rents higher, and HUD had to make up the difference. Well, if that's the case, then, then we know that consultants are doing more than just uh, making a significant amount per unit. They're costing HUD and ultimately the government and depriving those in need of some very uh, important housing. So I guess what I need to do is, is just um, uh, pursue the, the process that you went by to get this. Okay, Congressman, if, yes. I, if I might just uh, make a point. I, I, I believe the mayor it does not understand the program totally. I mean, I, I'm not saying his motives are wrong. I'm not saying that, uh, that uh, he's, he's opposed to the program, but you've also heard the mayor say that he thought a market rate program was feasible in that area. It's not. The, the rents that we're talking about, we didn't determine those rents. Uh, those, those, those rents were done by a survey certified by, by, the, by HUD that was submitted by the Public Housing Authority. No, but I need to interrupt you here. I have no comfort level with anything that HUD does. No, no, uh, all they did was certify it, though. I mean, the point is we don't determine no, no, the rents. But, but, but I know you don't. But, but we already know that some people make decisions in HUD and other people don't. I have no comfort level with the certification that HUD agreed to because uh, everywhere I look at HUD, I see problems. And uh, obviously, if they certify higher than they should, uh, that makes the project feasible, but it also costs the taxpayer a heck of a lot of money. I guess my point is that, that the market rates for that area, were, that the PHA you know, conducted the survey on, did 
meet, uh, did meet whatever the, what the rates were. We didn't set the rates is what I'm saying. Okay, let, me, let me just clarify one thing. As I view your circumstance, I don't, as I view it, I don't think you were guilty of any uh, wrongdoing uh, in terms of breaking a law. Uh, I think you honestly, you obviously knew how the system worked and you worked within that system. Um, I have my own feelings about the propriety of that system and how one works within it. But I'm not saying in any way you broke the law. No, and, and, I, and I appreciate that, sir, because that's my feeling as well. My only point is that the mayor said we, we were dealing with the rates, and, and I, all I'm suggesting is, and, and it's not a negative comment towards him, I just don't believe he understands the program. Well, I know, but, but you know, I, a lot of us didn't understand the program, and the more we understand about the program, the less we like the program. That's, that's um, a different issue, and I uh, appreciate that. Mr. Watt may not have also done anything illegal, nor Ms. Siegel, but it, as I said to Mr. Watt, it was a very uh, smelly, sleazy business, very honestly, and he was a part of it, and, and you're here because your company and you were a part of it as well. And, and uh, I need to know, uh, and I am more interested, not that I'm not in, uninterested with the consultant side of it, and clearly I'm more interested now hearing how uh, the projects can cost maybe more than they should, and I'd like to come back to that. But I'm more interested in knowing how the system worked within HUD. Uh, that's where I want to begin this reform, and then have people work with a different system. And um, from the same article, there was a reference to a meeting which the chairman, and, and by the way, he asked some uh, very helpful questions t to me and I, and I hope to the committee. Uh, and he read this meeting that took place. Uh, and I'm going to read it again slowly, part of it, and then I need to ask you one question about it. Whatever the genesis of the project, it followed an unusual course. In November 1986, that's November of 86, a representative of Black Manafort arranged a meeting with an official of the Division of Housing Development in New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. At the meeting, a representative of the project said that they had made an arrangement in HUD, Washington for moderate um, moderate, uh, moderate rehab units, recalls William Connolly. Now, I want you to tell me again, because uh, I didn't catch it, who your representative was at that meeting. I, bel uh, I believe that was, uh, the meeting was set up by Mr. Stevens. Mr. Uh, who, I'm sorry? Greg Stevens. Um, uh, if you're in your office? Uh, he actually he was he was associated with another company of ours. Don't tell me he's a consultant. That's all. <laughs> he was. No, he was part of. Oh, he would be part of the orbit of our companies. Yes. Okay. And and he knew the the individual in New Jersey. He set up the meeting, which was basically just the introduction, and then he dropped out of the process. Okay. So, but so what you're saying is, and and really it's just so consistent with what we heard. Everybody has someone that needs to set up the meeting. So in this case. Um, you had to uh, ask someone named Greg Stevens to set up the meeting, and he was your representative at this meeting I, for I, the purpose of initiating uh, contact with um, Mr. Conley. Yeah, and I believe Mr. Cruz was at that meeting as okay. well, sir. And so Mr. Cruz has been uh, it was a more active participant in your company, but no, Mr. Cruz was with, is the developer, yeah, and he was the point person. I mean, that, but there was an intermingling there. I understand that he is uh, when I say more active part of your company, he was. Uh, in this firm that was set up, uh, he was the active player that you've described to us. He was the project coordinator, right. yes. So, but it's very important, it's interesting to me that you decided to have um, uh, him at that meeting. Now let me then go to something that, that the chairman asked you about. So we had this meeting uh, in November of 86. and. Then we had an application uh, that shortly followed. Uh, the, the application is on a letter. Now, I understand, which I didn't before, you have no local public housing authority in this small community, so the state becomes the, the, the PHA. And the PHA writes a letter to the regional administrator. And the chairman asked a, a, a very significant question, asked a number of significant questions, but but it was noted in this application letter, uh, it, it was a blind carbon copy to Samuel Pierce, and then it said, attention, Miss Deborah Dean. Now, I first want to know, 
you, you've answered that you didn't understand that it was a blind, so you have no reason why it was a blind. I, I don't know Let me just deal with the other issue. Why was she carboned at all? And who told someone to carbon her? I, I'm sure, well, we, we would have told the PHA to carbon her, and the reason she would have been carboned was because she was the person that we met with and it asked, suggested to us that we have the PHA submit the application. Now, when you, and who met with uh, Deborah Gordeen? Mr. Gay. Mr. Gay, that's Lawrence G Gay? That's correct. Gay, yes. Okay. Now, um, Lawrence Gay met with Deborah Gordeen before the meeting with Connolly or after? Before, I believe it was. I think the, the meeting date, sir, was uh, November 14th because it's best we're able to reconstruct that was the day he was meeting on some matters regarding the city of Camden uh, with Ms. Dean, and this was brought up after that meeting. So there was a meeting on November 4th with Deborah 14th. Gordine. 14th, I'm sorry. November 14th with Deborah Gordine and, and Lawrence Gay was at that meeting. Uh, then there's a meeting with uh, Mr. Stevens. Uh, I, I believe the Stevens communication occurred between the 14th and the 20th. Right, and then there was the, the letter. Now, obviously, um, your firm had to have told Mr. Conley to uh, CC Deborah Dean, correct? Uh, I'm, sh I'm certain that we well, did. I, 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 I was not there, but I would, yes, I would think that is true. Now, we've had... It would have to be true because they would had, not know I'm about sorry. Deborah Dean otherwise. I mean, okay. I guess you don't... I, I need to know what your, te your answer is. Yeah, I said it would have to have been true, Congressman, because they would not have known of Deborah Dean otherwise. That, I'm sorry, maybe I mumbled it. When Tom Demery met with us, he described a number of uh, projects that he met uh, on, on uh, January 9th now of 87 with Deborah Gordine. And when he met with Deborah Gordine, there were a number of projects that he wanted and there were some projects that she wanted. And one of those projects that she wanted was your project. It wasn't one of the projects, according to Ms. Demery in his disclosure to this committee, that he wanted. Uh, in fact, they had an argument over a few, and they ended up having a meeting on January 13th to uh, meet with Mr. Pierce to settle the dispute between Deborah Gordine and Tom Demery. And Tom Demery basically was the person in charge of these programs. It's interesting, and you've confirmed to this committee what we've really established already, that even though Tom Demery was the FHA, Deborah Gordine was the key player here. Now, what I want to follow up is on... Congressman? Yes. If, if I might just state, I mean, I don't know that she was the key person. She was the person we dealt with. Uh, but right. I don't want my comments to be misconstrued that uh, she was the key player. I mean, it... That's who we dealt with, and, uh, but I can't say that we knew that she had Will my colleague order. yield? Oh, sure. Why did you choose to deal with her if she was not the key person? Well, two reasons. One, we understood that she was involved. And two, as I indicated, Mr. Gay was already there, and because we understood that, I mean, we, we felt she was involved. The only comment I'm making is I don't want my testimony to be viewed as saying that she was the definitive player. We didn't know if she was the definitive player or not. We certainly felt that if she supported the program, that uh, that would be very good for us. But when she gave you a strong indication, if not a guarantee, that your project will be funded, you felt very comfortable about that. Uh, there was never a guarantee. That's, that was the point I was making earlier. Well, there, was, there was hopeful expectation. A strong promise? She didn't pro I mean, she, she, as I said, she asked two questions. Did the Public Housing Authority support the project? And had they submitted an application? The answer to both was no. At that time. At that time, the answer to both was no. no yes. on the basis of well, no, no. The answer to the second question was no. So, because we had already, as I told you, before the meeting with Connolly, as I understand it from my partner, he had been up there talking with the local housing authority, and they agreed that the program, the project, was meritorious. So, so that part we felt comfortable with, because that's why we proceeded. But what they hadn't done is submit the, uh, the application. I thank my colleague. I'm sorry. You don't Why? have to be sorry, um, mm. at least um, for the interruptions. <laughs> um, the, in this meeting that happened 
uh, on January 9th with Mr. Demery, he did concur and agree to fund uh, your project. And <clears throat> we have uh, the 185 dated on January 9th, the, the time that Deborah Gordine and um, Tom Demery met. We have um, subsequently, and, and, the, and the 185 basically uh, separates funds uh, and provides funds to the region for uh, the 326 units. So on that, with the 185 form, now the region has 326 units. And then on February 25th, the region gave to the field uh, the form 185.1, which, which transfers from the region to the local community. Now, what we have is the purchase of a property on April 87. And then on May 18th, we have the advertisement of this property by the, lo by the Public Housing Authority. In other words, Public Housing Authority advertised 326 units. And I just want to be very clear, because I think this was a key point, one of the key points that the chairman asked, and, and I'm not sure of your answer. Did you know that the 185 had been sent to the region, the 185.1 had been earmarked to the local community, uh, and that it specifically said there would be 326 units? that it had been allocated to the Public Housing Authority. We knew that when they advertised on the 18th, they had to have had the program funded in order to advertise. Our concern was that on the 18th, when they advertised, the program was opened up, appropriately so, to the public okay. for projects in the way the advertisement read of 100 units or more. So there could have been applications in which case our program would have been judged compared to what any other applications that were submitted. See, this, this is where I get uncomfortable with your testimony, because if, if you had said to me, we knew, um, and uh, this is the way the system worked, Congressman, and this is what we no. did. C Congressman, uh, all I'm saying is that, because th th what the chairman asked me earlier, we didn't feel that we had a, a guarantee on the program. And when they advertised, we were at risk. And uh, did we know that the Public Housing Authority had received the units? Yes. Did we know that we had the right to those units? We had no right to those well, units. Well, let me just... That's the point I guess I'm making. But was this an advertisement for the entire state, or was it just for this small little community of 7,000, of which you already owned a project of 326 but units? I believe it was for the area, not just for the community. Well, and, it was in, and it was in components of 100 or more, so that there could have been other applications. I mean, it was not a, you know advertisement for 326-unit project. That's my point. Yes. Gentlemen, we deal. Our understanding of we're trying to read the advertisement that it was not for the whole area, but just for the township of Seabrook, uh, the, the city, not well, Seabrook. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right, well, we thought the advertisement was fairly specific. We get, uh, maybe we misread that. And yielding one other, uh, one other question. Do you know any other place this advertisement appeared aside from the Millville Daily? I, I don't know any place that it appeared, Congressman. I, I mean, I know that all the big developers in New York get the Millville Daily every morning to see uh, the projects that were advertised. I, I don't know where it was advertised. I mean, the bottom line, Mr. Manafort, is even if the project was meritorious, the selection of your firm leaves a stench in one's nose because it wasn't openly advertised. They didn't give much time. It was advertised May 18th, June 1st, you were approved. No one in God's name would think that's an open bidding process. Uh, you know, actually, I, I should make the point that there was not, as I understand it, even a need to advertise. Our, our program had, was in the pipeline because we had submitted our application already, and the housing authority as I understand it, could award pipeline projects or it could advertise and then award. And, and as, I may be wrong in that misunderstanding. Just one more question. If, sure. Do you agree the advertising was sort of a sham? Uh, the advertisement put us at risk, and I know we were concerned. How, who in Millville was going to uh, come in and Again, I don't know where it was advertised. I, I really don't know where it was advertised, so I can't answer. But we felt, I'm just giving, the Congressman asked what our feelings were. We felt we were at risk at that period in time. Will my colleague yield for a moment? Yes, sir. Happy I want to read to you the advertisement, Ms. Manafort. 
the Department of Community Affairs, Division of Housing and Development Bureau of Housing Services invites developers to submit proposals for the moderate rehabilitation of existing structures to be considered for Federal Section 8 moderate rehabilitation subsidies for which the agency will receive funding. Now listen closely. All projects must contain at least 100 units and must be located in the city of Seabrook. The person who put in the ad didn't even know what town the project was going to be located in. The name of the project was Seabrook. This was an advertisement which was tailor-made for you. No one on God's green earth could have qualified except you. This was about as phony an advertisement as you have ever seen. I guess the point I would make, Congressman, uh, there are three points I guess I would make. One, Please. as I understand it, the advertisement wasn't even necessary. But two, we felt certainly at yes, risk. Yes, it was you can necessary. Say that again. Yes, it, why, why do you believe it was not necessary? I, it's my understanding that the PHA had the authority to fund programs that had already been supplied in the, what's called in the pipeline. But or at they some could point in the process, the it has to be competitive. I mean, it certainly wasn't competitive at the beginning because you initiated it. And it certainly wasn't competitive at the end because the advertisement was not, not only sloppily but so narrowly prepared that only your project could qualify for it. This was a sham and an illusion that it was publicly advertised. It was not publicly advertised. There was a hocus-pocus a pretense of a public advertisement, but everybody knew that the award will go to you. And you knew that, and we know it, and HUD knew it, and Deborah Dean knew it. And it would be nice sort of to clear the air and state it, because, well, because everybody knows it. Well, I, I'm, I'm just being very honest with you. We felt at risk during that period of time. We did well, not feel I, we had I, I accept that statement. Now, let me ask you this. Explain to me how the person who drew up this advertisement did not advertise the city, which is an existing community in New Jersey, but advertised the city of Seabrook. I, I, Was this a Freudian I slip? I don't know who, who drew up that advertisement. I never even read that advertisement. Well, the PHA did. Somebody at the PHA did. They placed the ad. And they said, Seabrook. I mean, it's like a public agency advertising for automobiles, and instead of using automobiles, they use the word Chevrolet. I mean, then you wouldn't think it's innocent. You no, would I, think that I, there I, is a pre-existing deal that Chevrolet is going to get the job. Well, I, I understand the point you make. Of course you do. And, and, all, my, and I'm not disagreeing that we were, we were, you know, our objective was to secure the project funding. I don't disagree with that. What I, all I'm saying is that we didn't have a guarantee that this program, as I understand it, would have been funded, and we were at risk at that point of time, but we certainly felt. State that risk for me. Describe that risk. If other applications had been submitted. But there was no other conceivable developer who had 100 units in the city of Seabrook. <laughs> well, I, I, I just, now you're going beyond, beyond my knowledge of what was in that area. I know that the conversations that I had with my developer partners, this was a period of risk uh, for us. I thank my friend for yielding. You guys all set? Well, <laughs> once you get it started again. Charlie, I'd be happy to yield once and then I'll take over again. I just, uh, I, this is so utterly amazing, uh, Mr. So. Manafort. <laughs> You read this ad, and you know the facts, and it says to you one thing. They may as well cut out all this language and just written a sentence. The fix is in. <laughs> That's all I want to say. I mean, uh, this is... <laughs> really, the, the point that the chairman made, and I think the other members of the committee made, was that, that in response to his question, did you have advance notice, the answer is just an unequivocal yes. I mean, Advance notice of the program being funded. That the, that the 185 had been sent to the region, that the 185.1 had gone from the region to the local public housing authority, had gone into the field, 
and that it had been advertised and the only one who could have gotten that advertisement was was this project it was designed for 326 and it would seem to me just the honest answer is that's that's really what it was and and while we may decide that that's not the way the system's supposed to work uh, that's the way the system has been working, not just with your project, but with a whole host of other projects. Um, so let me ask you, did, did, did you have notice before the advertisement that 326 units had been basically earmarked for the Seabrook area? That the program had been funded. That was the knowledge that we, I mean, it's, it's not a distinction without a difference, Congressman. I mean, it, well, I'm not trying to be argumentative here. In fact, I'm trying to be cooperative. We felt, we knew that HUD was going to fund the program. I mean, at some point in time we knew that and we, okay. and we I, followed I, I, it. I, I just want to, when we say we knew HUD was going to fund the program, we knew HUD, you knew HUD had signed the 185s to the region for 326 units. Isn't that correct? We had that and, answer. And you also had the information that uh, before the advertisement that the region had decided there'd be 326 units uh, earmarked in the field for Seabrook. Uh, isn't that correct as well? Well, what we knew is that they couldn't earmark per se. I mean, when I said they couldn't earmark. I would have gone on to the next question, but it, but it just strikes me that it, 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 I'm not, I just, I'm not following what you're trying to get at. All I'm saying is that we, we were involved with the PHA and yes, we knew when the PHA received the notification of program funding. If that's what you're getting at, the answer is yes. Wait, say it again. If I'm trying to get at what again? We, we were dealing with the PHA, and we, we were made aware when the funding arrived at the PHA. Yes, we knew that. We, we were dealing with them. I mean, part of my testimony is we've been dealing with them all along. So when the, when the funding did hit the PHA level, we were aware of it. Well, the, the testimony that we have from you is that you went to the PHA, initiated that meeting, and that you actually chose to have someone, a Mr. Stevens, uh, initiate that meeting with Mr. Conley, who happened, I think, what, to have worked in Governor McCain's office as his chief of staff? As Mr. Stevens. Yes. Not at that time, though. What? Pre he had previously been the chief of staff to Governor McCain. Yeah, yeah. So he had previously. Which is why he knew Mr. Conley. Right. And that, see, one of the things that's very clear is that the way the system worked is you need people who had contact to make contacts and open other doors. So Mr. Stevens, who had worked for the governor, opened up the door for you to meet with the Public Housing Authority. You initiated that meeting, uh, and you were really basically, this was developer-driven, and, um, you know, I haven't really, um, uh, that's a whole other issue about whether that's right or wrong, but I just want to establish the reality of, of this program, and I want to know if you fit into all the other programs that have come before us or not, and it seems to me you do. Administrative, uh, a chief of staff from the former governor setting up a meeting with the Public Housing Authority. Public Housing Authority writing a letter to, to HUD, HUD uh, and, and blind copying Deborah Gordeen. Uh, and um, you, you made a point that Deborah Gordeen had already been contacted by Lawrence uh, Gay. Did Lawrence Gay ever work at HUD? I think in early 85 he was a consultant to HUD in the Enterprise Zone program. Uh, isn't it true that he, he worked with Deborah Gordeen? I don't think he worked with Deborah Gordine, no. Did he have contact with Deborah Gordine? I don't know that. Okay. I don't know that. But at any rate, you, De uh, Lawrence uh, Gay uh, met with Deborah Gordine. Uh, then uh, Tom Demery uh, tells this committee he agreed to what she wanted. Uh, uh, that day that they agreed, they signed the 185. A few weeks later, they signed the 185.1. You all knew before the advertisement that it was going through and you bought the property. And uh, the only one who answered the advertisement, because uh, it just defies logic to say anything else, the only one who um, responded to it was you because you're the ones in a small community that had those units. Who else could have done it? And that's the way it seems to me the system worked. Now, let me just get to the last part of the system. I had basically accepted the premise because the chairman had used an analogy that I thought was very interesting. He said, well, if, if 10,000 people, was it 10,000? <laughs> if it was 10,000 who applied to Yale, 1,000 got accepted, and hopefully the whole system works that the best of the 10,000 get it. But his point was that they're all qualified. I mean, almost everyone who is applying to Yale, even has the guts to do it, is probably going to be pretty qualified, some more than others. But you don't, you don't go and pick number 8,000, 8, you, you pick the top 1,000, however many go into the school. 
Now, so we were beginning to draw the analogy that this was like your project was another worthy project. Uh, but you had special contacts and knew how the system worked. Uh, we did not criticize uh, Ms. Siegel very harshly for saying the system worked this way and, I, and I, I worked within that system. But she was so candid with it. She just said, I did it. You know, that's the system, and if you don't like the system, change the system. But that's not the, the approach that you've taken. No, no, Congressman, I'm not disagreeing with that. I mean, I've tried to give you the specific facts. And all I've said is that our project, we felt, and the Public Housing Authority felt, was merit-worthy. So it would fit into the group, uh, grouping of 10,000 or whatever, to use your analogy. I've indicated, I, th I think, rather forthrightly, the process in which we dealt, which we feel, or, or which we felt, was the appropriate process. Now, whether, in fact, the ch process should be changed is up to this committee, and I assume, is, and I know, is the purpose for which you're having these considerable deliberations. Uh, and I'm not competent to tell you what the best system should be. What I think I, what I've tried to testify to is the fact that we reviewed the system that was in place and we worked within that system. But the first key step in our judgment was, was the project merit worthy? And what, did it fit within normal guidelines of what HUD was, kind of programs HUD was funding? Our determination was yes for all the reasons I've mentioned. See, the, the difference though is that, um, like Congressman Schumer, his point is that it probably met the minimum threshold to get you into to the consideration. But the real question is, among the vast majority, you know, See, how did it fit in? And, and you can't really testify that, to that. Uh, because there was no process of competition. But, but and Congre that's the whole reason why we're getting into this. Well, I understand that. But, Congressman, I guess I, I feel comfortable saying that, you know, I don't know what the threshold was, as I told Congressman, but this project was in an area where there was a, a waiting list that has gone since our project started to, a couple of years ago from 200 people waiting list to 518 as of last let September. Me, let me just tell you why I think that's irrelevant. Because anywhere you go in this country, you're going to find some kind of waiting list for housing. Yeah. And so it's just a question of, of how many there and how many somewhere else. So. And, and, I, and I accept that point. I guess the only point I'm making is we felt comfortable that the project fit within HUD's criteria as far as meritorious programs. And then we played in the, get in, got involved in the process that, uh, that you've, uh, you've talked about. See, I come down to the end um, with a real concern that the project probably wasn't a meritorious project. Uh, and admittedly, it's based on limited information, but I'm, I'm headed in that direction. Um, and, and I've learned something today that I didn't, didn't suspect that I would learn, and that is that, that it's very likely that, um, that people who knew how the system worked and worked within that system were able to get their projects accepted even if they weren't meritorious. Um, it was an extraordinarily expensive project. The rents were, were clearly high. Uh, it cost HUD a lot of money over the life of the 15 years. Uh, and so, you know, I've got a tremendous concern about that. And I'll, I'll have to tell you that, that the system, um, I have no doubt of Deborah Gordine's involvement in this whole project, and uh, hopefully she'll testify sometime. But the system of where you have to get an administrative aid to a governor to set up one meeting, to to meet uh, right under the, 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 the cabinet secretary's office to get him to accept it. A lot of people didn't have that system. And when you introduced your firm, you described yourself as a law firm, a consulting firm, a lobbyist, and public relations. And I, I know this committee talks about influence peddling. The reason why I get concerned about I think it exists everywhere in this, in this, in this city. I don't think it just exists in HUD. I don't think it just exists with Republicans or Democrats. It seems the way the system works in this city is who can influence who. And whether it's a Democrat influencing another Democrat in Congress or a Republican influencing a Republican in the administration, that's how people make an extraordinary sum. And, and even when you, you mentioned the, the amount that you charge on a per hourly basis, it just is an extraordinary sum of money. Well, um, Congress, that is not, Congressman, that and, one... And typical of what other firms do. I, I don't... And, and I guess the point I'm making is I feel very comfortable talking about lobbying process in this town because I do believe the lobbying process with law firms, firms like ours, is able to help focus debate, is able to help decision-making get made. We, do, we, it's not, you know, what, as I said earlier, there's a, influence peddling can be used 
in some term, uh, to some degree, but also lobbying involves providing information, making a, developing a case just as you would in a court of law, and, and meeting with, with members of Congress, members of the administration, and advancing the case. It is not unusual to, to have a real, an, an entree be made so that your case can be heard, but ultimately, in the process, the merits of the case in my judgment, usually are the basis upon which decisions are made, and I feel comfortable saying here today, to break it project specific, that the merits of this project, in our judgment, and in the judgment of the Public Housing Authority, clearly uh, qualified this program or project to be funded. I guess um, we really disagree um, on, the, on the way this process works. and. Um, I believe that uh, it's got to be totally changed. I, I don't know that we disagree on the way the process works, Congressman, and I understand that your responsibility here is to try and redesign the system in a way that is viewed to, you know, to meet certain objectives. And I don't disagree with this process going forward in that regard. Uh, sure. You, you gave us an exposition on what lobbying is in this town. You're not suggesting that your role that is your company's role in this instance, was that of lobbying vis-a-vis -vis, uh, influence peddling, are you? What I, well, I guess what I'm trying to say as far as Black Manafort Stone and No, 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 I'm asking about in this instance, yes. was your role that of a lobbyist? I, I would, I would call, say that this fit in with that general definition, yes, sir. Well, you had said earlier on, again, I thank my friend Yuli, that, in fact, you could characterize what you did in this situation as influence peddling. In, in a narrower sense, that's right. Yeah, pardon? In a narrower sense, I said, you could, you, for purposes of the discussion here today, you could say that, yes. Lobbying involves legislative bodies, isn't that so? No, it's involved in the administrative process, too. As well. I, mean, lob I mean, I don't really define lobbying as just dealing with the Congress of the United States, and I don't think that in this town that term would be viewed in only that context. Sir. So, so that this is both lobbying and influence peddling. Is that the idea? Well, I, again, I don't want to get into that whole debate that you've had many times now, and so I will stipulate for purposes of today that you, know, you could characterize this as influence peddling. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I just conclude by saying we know the system's not supposed to work this way, and we know we have to correct it. I just want to also make the point, however, that I just don't think, I, I would feel like a hypocrite if we said the only influence peddling that took place was at HUD. It takes place in every aspect of our government, and uh, I think uh, we as a Congress have to recognize that fact and obviously need to change it. But if, if we all of a sudden say, well, we've discovered some horrible influence peddling in HUD, uh, as if that's the only place that ever occurred, I, I have a problem with that. The gentleman would yield. I mean, I, I'm I would all done. Uh, Con go Congressman Frank. Thank you, Chairman. I, I would say to my colleague from Connecticut first, of course, there are problems elsewhere which we try and control. That's why we're going to, I hope, repass a post-employment lobbying bill and other things. But it's also relevant to say that it can be sometimes worse in some places than others. I don't think we want to have the view, if everybody's guilty, no one's guilty. And I think in this case, some are guilty than others. And I also want to apologize to my colleague from New Jersey. As a former resident, I do stipulate that God's green earth includes New Jersey. I'm yes. sorry for uh, I Thank raised you. that question. Thank and you. And not the part I grew up in, but the other part I agree. <laughs> uh, Mr. Matterford, you said that you were supplying information. You couldn't even give them the information to get the town right. And that's my problem. I, uh, the suggestion that you were really at risk and those things just are very unpersuasive. I've got to ask, first of all, though, we should also add that it was not just Washington. It was Trenton, apparently, where you had influence peddling. You, you hired a Mr. Stevens who used to be the chief of staff to the governor, I heard? When did you hire him? Uh, he, he, Mr. Stevens joined us. Uh, Is that the Mr. Stevens, yeah? Uh, let's see, 19, about 1985. I see. And um, is he still working for you? No, he's not. When did he leave your employment? About a year ago. And uh, one of the things he did was to set up an appointment with the head of the State Department of Community Affairs in this matter? That is correct. That was, that, that, was, that was the thing. Did he get paid by the particular task or was he on a regular salary? He was on a, he was he was on a salary. Now, you said that the Public Housing Authority, because I thought Ms. Shea's made some very important points about the merits. And frankly, I don't think you had any idea what the merits were. I don't think you were in any position to know what the merits were. And as I've said before, this reminds me of Viscount Melbourne's announcement of why he liked the Order of the Garter, because there was no damn nonsense about merit connected with the award of it. And it seems to me patently clear here. You went to see, well, you said Mr. Cruz was first apprised of this opportunity. Is that correct? Yes, that is true. 
And Mr. Cruz, uh, had you a prior relationship with Mr. Cruz, your firm? We were in the process of putting our business together. Yes, we had several projects we were looking okay, at. Okay, so then Mr. Cruz went to your firm and said, we think we can help together no, no, on this? I was in, Mr. Cruz and I were involved. You were already partners. That's right. And All right, now, what housing work had your firm done previously? This was the only housing authority work we had done, but as no, I... No, I didn't say, Mr. Mr. Manifest, you have an unfortunate habit of answering the questions you want to answer. You can do that later. I didn't just say housing authority work. I'm sorry. What other the housing only, work had you done? This was the only program. Okay. We were doing so with. you had prior to that done nothing involving housing. Now, Mr. Cruz was the deputy commissioner for the Department of Housing right. for the state of Connecticut. But you had yourself in your operation, you personally had done nothing involving housing. I personally. Right. That's correct. Okay. And then, uh, so then. But Mr. that was Cruz, not my role, sir. No. I, I, I was that. involved. No, your role was, was facilitating. No, no, no. In, in the company that was involved with Mr. Cruz, I was involved with an office building project. They were right, no, but in this, I'm talking about in this project here. Um, you had no role in this project? He was the action officer on this. He did you have a, no, I didn't ask you whether he was. See, when I say, did you have a role and you say he was, that's called not answering the question. No. The question is, were you involved with this particular housing project? To the degree that I've testified, yes. Uh, but so you, the answer is yes. You were, okay. And it's the first housing project you personally were involved with? That is correct. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Cruz came to you, and uh, at what point did Mr. Cruz mention to you approximately that this was a good opportunity? Now, it was sometime in the fall of 1986. 86. That's right. And the next thing that happened apparently was that people went to see Ms. Dean? No, I believe the first thing that happened, as I've testified, is that he went down and looked at the site and analyzed okay. the site to determine if it, you know, what Who did? did? Mr. Cruz Mr. did? Mr. Cruz did. Okay. And then... Based on that, you people went to see Ms. Dean, or who, who went to see Mr. Gay saw Ms. No, Dean? I, I, well, you, the next was around the 14th of November. We, the, right. Mr. Gay raised it to Ms. Dean. All right. Now, you said the Public Housing Authority applied for this on the basis of its merit. Um, the Public Housing Authority, your meeting with Ms. Dean, Mr. Gay's meeting with Ms. Dean was on the 14th of November. That's correct. When was the application submitted by the Public Housing Authority to HUD? The 20th of November. So in those six days, the Public no, Housing no, Authority no, discover the no, merit of this project? No, I believe, Congressman, as I said, when Mr. Cruz went down there and looked at the site, yeah. I, is, I believe that, uh, that he visited with PHA as well. You believe or you know? I mean, I, 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 I really, I, I, well, Mr. Manifold, I want I to be very clear. No, I want to be very clear and I want you to listen. Your memory is too conveniently selective for my tastes because sometimes you know very specific things and sometimes you only believe things. Now, I, do you know that Mr. Cruz spoke to the Public Housing Authority? Or I, I, I you guessed? Did he you. have to? Was it an inference? What I'm going to get you that exact date, Congressman. I, I don't have it, and I apologize. You did, no, not did. Did Mr. Cruz talk to the Public Housing Authority? It's my understanding that he did, yes. About what time? I September, believe, October? I believe when, yes, that's right. No, I said that was in the alternative. That was not a yes or no. That was September Whenever, or October. I, it is my understanding, and this is what I'm going to get you the specific date on, when he went and visited the site. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I was preparing myself for, for testimony. Mr. Manfred, I didn't ask you that. Please just answer the questions. Okay. Well, we'll I will get you that date, sir. I don't have the date. But you, did he go to the public? He, you say he went to the Public Housing Authority. It's is my understanding that he went to the You're public understanding public. that he did. Um, but you, you don't recall when or how much extensively they talked about it. And then on November 14th, you talked to Ms. Dean, and she said get the PHA to uh, apply. Who told the PHA to apply? Who asked them to apply? Who specifically? I, yes. I, okay. I think but they got the application in in about a week after, six days after the meeting, counting weekends, they had the application there. That's, that's pretty good and quick. And then Mr. Lantos asked you later, and I was unclear with the exact answer. It said, on April 9th, you, you bought the apartments. Is that correct? Your group? I, I, I'm assuming it's April 9th, but at some point in April, before the PHA was notified by the field office, correct? You bought? That, that is correct, yes. All right. Um, how much did you pay for it, approximately? For the project? Yeah. Approximately $4.4 million. For the, you, for, for, uh, it's not often you get to buy a city, uh, the city of Seabrook. Um, you paid $4.4 million. Had you hedged that in any way? I mean, at that point, you say you didn't even know if the project was going to be approved. Is that your testimony when you bought it? We, we felt that we did not have a guarantee that the project was going to be funded. We felt comfortable that... Uh, right. Yeah. But what you, so you didn't get any advance notice of the award. Did you find out that the award has been approved from HUD, or did you find it out from the PHA? Uh, we probably found it out from HUD. Before the PHA did? Uh, maybe contemporaneous with it. I don't know when the PHA specifically Two got weeks it. after you bought the property, the PHA got the formal notification. Th then we probably knew about it before then. So, okay, the suggestion, the inference is that you bought the property, you knew from HUD before the, well, let's go back to buying the property. 
HUD told you before it told the Public Housing Authority. Now, if you were at risk and you didn't have any right to this, and, and it was a PHA's application, doesn't that it seem to you improper that a public agency would notify a potential applicant before it would notify the other public agency from whom you would be the applicant? Doesn't that seem to you improper? Uh, we did not think that that was improper. We understand. Do you now? You think that's, I mean, here's, sorry. Yeah. See, the, the point, the I public No, I want you to answer the questions. The Public Housing Authority, you say, you've described this as a process in which you brought this meritorious project to the attention of the Public Housing Authority, they then applied to HUD, and you were at risk in applying for it. I think that's at variance with what happened, in fact. And it is just, one of the reasons I think so is that after the Public Housing Authority has applied and has been approved by its, the state agency is approved by the federal agency, and a potential applicant is notified by the federal agency, before the state agency is notified. Uh, that seems to me improper. But, but I guess the point that is getting lost in the process here is that, that there was, the fact that the program had been funded didn't mean that our project No, was it is not getting lost, Mr. Manifest, but we are very clear about it. No, it didn't mean that your project had been funded because although you did have enough confidence in that to go out and spend four and a half million dollars on a piece of property, let me ask you. We felt that the, risk. Right? Had you, you. Yeah, great risk. Had you, had you, not gotten these units, what would the uh, financial outcome have been with the property? What would the property have been worth to you, do you think, if you hadn't gotten the units? The, the, the property has value. I, I, don't, I can't answer that question specifically because I, I don't know that the analysis would you, was If done. there was no, if, if it weren't for this project, though, you wouldn't have bought the property? If it weren't for the moderate rehab subsidy? Right. It, this project would not have worked without the, this particular No, I didn't project. ask what the project would have worked. I, 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 we, we would I, not I, have rehabbed the property. Would you have bought, no, see, I say bought, you say rehab. Ms. Manifold, please, I'm sorry if it's my diction. I can't help it. But if I didn't say it clear, you ask me, I'll say it again. Did, would you have bought the property if you did not think there was a very good chance of getting the money? If we did not think there was a good chance, we would not have bought the property. Okay. So you put up four and a half million bucks, no hedging, no outs. Did you have any escape clauses in that contract? When you bought it, you bought it? Uh, I do not believe so. Okay. So I, I will take So that you just put down the 4.5 on the reasonable expectation. Uh, and it sounds to me like you probably, do you remember whether you were notified before you bought it that it had been approved? Not you as the applicant, but the, but the project funding. Do you remember whether you were notified or not? The project funding itself? Yeah. You mean, you mean whether this project... Right. Not whether you were going to have to compete with the dozens of other people looking for the city of Seabrook, <laughs> which they wouldn't have been... They probably thought they were supposed to build housing for the nuclear workers up in New Hampshire, which is probably the closest municipality named Seabrook. But you, were you notified by HUD that the PHA's application had been approved before you bought the building? Probably, yes, sir. So you got prior yeah. notice and went out and bought the buildings. All right, that's why, Mr. Manafort, nobody, but, nobody in this world believes that you had any doubt whatsoever. You get a notification from HUD. Here's how it works. Your partner gets the notion, and here's about this. You go to Ms. Dean through one of your people. You then urge the Public Housing Authority to apply, which it does in less than a week, setting a record. They are then win that, but you're notified before they are and you then go and buy a project which is eligible, and then when the Public Housing Authority advertises, somehow they don't even mention the name of the municipality in which this happens, Upper Deerfield Township. They call it the city of Seabrook, of which I suspect there is none in New Jersey. And this is why no one believes that you were really well, at risk, because the, you got notified in advance and then the Public Housing Authority advertised it for the project miscalling the municipality by the name of the, of, of the project you have bought. Congressman, I think I've made it clear. We've, we were working at that point in time with the Public Housing Authority, openly. I mean, there was nothing quietly or secretly going on. Right. We felt we had a project that, that merited funding. And we were dealing with them. And, and that's well, Mr. Manifold, unusual. you're the one who said you thought you were at risk. Now you're telling me why you didn't think you were at risk. No, 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 I think no, you're no, answering no, this one I, on the alternative. No, it's not an alternative answer, Congressman. We were working with the Public Housing Authority. We felt comfortable that they felt comfortable that our project was merit worthy, as we did. But we had no commitment that, that you, you had no you, legal you may binding consider it a no, distinction without a difference. But yeah, from I a do. technical standpoint, sir. No, it, I'll tell you why I consider is. it. I consider it proof 
that this was a project in which political influence rather than the merit was a deciding factor. And now I want to throw in what you say your firm was hired here. You, you were partly a principal, but you were partly hired as a firm, correct? Now, what were your firm hired to do as opposed to you as a principal? Black what? Manafort, Stone and Kelly. Yeah. We ended up doing several things, like I said earlier. One was we did deal with HUD on the program. When you were originally were hired, what was the intention of what you would do? To stay with the project the whole way. Well, I mean, and do what? You want the night watchman. Well, I mean, I can give you an example of the things we did, which was what our expectation was. No, I want to know was. not what things you did, but what at the outset when you hired yourself, what you had persuaded yourself you could so ably do. When, when, when the firm was hired, we were understood that our responsibility would be to deal with the local housing authority, to deal with, uh, okay. to deal with the Department of HUD, to deal at an administrative level with, uh, in attending the meetings, you know. Right, I appreciate it. So basically to do some of the necessary political and, and, and but, but much broader than that, okay. Congressman. Okay. Why, and when were you, when did you hire yourselves? We probably, start, well, when, when, probably right around the beginning of November when we decided November to November 86. You are a very sophisticated firm with a lot of expertise, and no one in your firm at all that time talked to the local officials? That seems to me shocking. I'm sorry. Frankly, I, I, how come when you hired yourselves, None of you talk to the local officials. You can't tell me. I mean, well, we are being asked. Uh, one of the problems is we had this, the current mayor, and he's speaking on his own behalf, on behalf of his predecessor, with the housing officer. You're hired to provide this sophisticated, knowledgeable service and talk to this one and talk to that one. And among the people you don't talk to are the local officials. That well, seems to me to be just, a, a, uh, if I were hiring and, a consultant and, to deal with the local uh, people. And so you keep saying the local housing authority. Well, we ought to be very clear. There was no the local housing, housing authority. It was the state housing authority right. in Trenton for whom you had to hire the former chief of staff of the governor, or not hire, but to whom you assigned the former chief of staff of the governor to go and talk about this particular project. Uh, to, to that does not suggest merit was the basis. No, to introduce us to the people there, Congressman. Why did you have to be introduced to talk about the merits of a project? You, you technically don't have to be, but it is not an uncommon practice to be introduced but because that you, way. Th that helps shift it away from the merits. And who did you meet with? You met with the head of the department. Uh, yes, I believe. Yeah, as you met with the executive assistant to the secretary. You don't go talk to, by the way, well, we'll go back to that briefly, but I just want to get back to this. Why didn't your firm, providing its broader gauged expertise, talk to the local officials? Because, as I think I've testified, I believe that Mr. Cruz had already dealt, I mean, no, I ultimately, please. ultimately we did as we got into the project, Mr. Manifest, ultimately, ultimately, that's not what I asked you. You're really trying to evade the question. No, You'll have, uh, this I'm chairman has been very good with you in giving you a chance to talk about other things, and I'll complete that, but you're not going to get away from answering the question. No, I, you I, say you believe he talked to the local officials. Let me ask you, and see, you, you've gotten some more information. During the break, you heard Mayor Peterson say that they weren't consulted. You went and checked on a few things. You could find out that three people weren't really going to be kicked out, but you couldn't find out if anybody to talk to the mayor. You say you believe Mr. Cruz did. During what time period do you believe Mr. Cruz did? It's my understanding, Congressman, and I can't give you the From whom? Did you get this from Mr. Cruz? Yes. yes. Now, when you say it's your understanding, does that mean Mr. Cruz told you? That's correct. And he told you what now about that, local that officials? They had met with, uh, I believe it was the previous mayor, not this mayor. Mr. Facemeyer. Can we see Mr. Uh, Facemeyer's letter? And, and I'm going to get you that. I, I understand the note, which was confusing to me and why I asked the question. But you didn't ask about it during your phone well, call. So you, you, yeah, during, when you had a chance to go make phone calls, you got the answers he, you thought would be useful, but you didn't get an answer about this one. Well, I'm going to provide you that information, Congressman, because I, I got information in areas that I thought you were getting into, and, and I'm just not totally prepared well, I, to get We got into this, this one pretty clearly. Which Mr. Facemeyer's letter, we got into that one. Yeah. And, right, but and your, gonna, your understanding is that Mr. Cruz spoke to Mr. Facemeyer, but you don't know what, when. And I'm going to get you those dates. Right. Um, at what point did he do it? Do you have any approximate idea? No, I don't. Uh, do you think the firm, retrospectively, did a good job of talking to the mayor and the other people? I mean, I, I, I initially, puzzled, but initially, our responsibility was not to talk to the local mayor. In hindsight, would I do that differently now? Yes. You, why wasn't it initially your responsibility? I mean, your responsibility just to get the approvals and not to worry about and what local response the, was? And to figure out the administrative process and to work within the administrative and process. And not to worry about what the local people. How about meeting with the tenants? At well, what point I, were that meeting with the tenants? When was the first yeah. meeting with your group with the tenants of this there, there were some tenant meetings in, uh, in the summer, I think, of 87. After the project was approved? To explain, so, to explain them what we were going to be doing, yes. Were there any meetings with the tenants prior to the project approvals? No, no I do not believe okay. there were. So all the meetings with the tenants were to tell but, the tenants what was going to happen to them 
there wasn't any kind of – did your firm – you Co said there Congressman, was a – Congressman, you know, one of the problems that, is, that I can't articulate is you can't understand the disrepair of the units. If you had walked through these units no, – Mr. Manifold, I will be glad – this is an example of – one, I don't know why you can't articulate it. I, I, I mean, I think you – Well, you mean you're saying did we talk to the tenants about whether the project needed to be rehabbed? Not just whether it needed to be it rehabbed, but what – what kind of rehab, what kind of amenities would they, well, uh, I think there are a, a lot of reasons you might want to talk to the tenants, and as far as you, you not being able to articulate it. I, 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 I can provide the, the, the committee, sir, you know, some pictures, for example, of before and afters, right, which will show you, give you a sense of, if you just walk There you go again, the, Mr. Manifit, with questions I haven't asked. I was not talking about the quality of the construction. No, no when I ask you, project. I, no, I ask you whether or not you talk to the tenants. Some of us believe that local people, even local people living in uh, a building that's not too terrific, ought to get some input into these things beforehand. And the notion, I, I object to the notion that these people were simply, you were going to assume that this was the best thing for them. And it also goes to the question of merit. When you, if you were really doing a merit assessment of this project versus others, it seems to me one of the things you would do would be uh, to talk to the tenants. Let me just ask my Next question, next to last set. Um, were there other projects in the area surveyed? You said you thought there was a project of merit because it had, there was a housing shortage there. Did you look at other potential uh, units in the area that might have been suitable? The other units to purchase, you mean, or that existed in the that area? That could have been done. Or did the Public Housing Authority do a survey, to your they, knowledge? They, yes, my knowledge, they did, and, and that's... Uh, of the whole area? Of the area, yes. Sir. Do you know that they did that? Can we get a copy of that, do you know? Or uh, if we ask them, they'd get sure, a copy? I'll, I'll okay. Try and get your Let me just ask you again about Deborah Dean, because this is my last set of questions. You went, your, your first connection with HUD was to go to, through Ms., was for Mr. Gay to go to Ms. Dean? Yes, sir. Does it strike you as a reasonable way to proceed that the executive assistant to the secretary should be the initial contact point on applications? Does that, I mean, do you think Ms. Dean had in her head uh, enough knowledge of everything so that she could give you a general sense of it? She said, she asked you one, two questions. Did the Public Housing Authority approve it and will they apply? I mean, is that a good way to run an agency? The executive assistant to the secretary uh, deals with these things at this level. There was no regional input, et cetera, at that point? It's, it's my feeling, Congressman, in town here, it's not unusual for the chief of staff. I didn't ask you if it was unusual, see? No, well, Again, well we, I, I don't okay, know. Then we let me, we let seem me to have this specific. language problem. I did not ask you if it was unusual. I mean, is this the, the right way to run a department? Usually, the chief of staff knows what's going on. And, most and gets the initial time. applications on a uh, project by project basis? Well, we, as I indicated, Mr. Gay, after the meeting, asked her about the prospects. And to, at that point in time, I don't know that we felt that she could singularly make the decision, but we felt that she would know okay. the process. So she said, she said these things based on that. Now let's go. You had a meeting with Ms. Dean. You then had the former chief of staff to the governor set up a meeting with the commissioner. Had this commissioner been in charge when this man was the chief of staff? I don't know that. Well, we, I'd like to see if we can find that out. So the former chief of staff of the governor, who's then still the governor, goes and sees the governor's appointee, the head of community affairs, and he says, can they see you? And a week later, they send in an application. And uh, a couple of months later, you buy the property before the public housing authority has even been told that it's got the money, much less that you're going to get it. That's why. Nobody really believes that merit had much to do with that. That seems to well, be such a wildly improbable set of circumstances on any other hypothesis than that the political influence that you were able to bring to bear resulted in. Do you really think that that's not true, that your uh, political I, influence was not a factor? I didn't say that, but what I said... Was it the major factor in your judgment? No, I believe that the project, and I will leave with the committee some pictures of it uh, before and after so you can see the quality of the work as well as the, the, the condition of the units when we purchased them. The, the clearly was a need. It fit within HUD's regulations as far as the decentralizing and... Uh, what comparative basis did you have for that? See, you, you HUD just had, had many... walk through the... Congressman, if you just... Oh, but Mr. Matter, but you can't just do that by walking through the one project. You would have to walk through others. You would have to look at a lot of other things. Your but, notion you, that by looking at one dilapidated no, no. building, you can decide that this is the most meritorious when there are very few things to give out, it's just nonsense. No, but uh, the, I guess where, where I haven't clearly articulated is Mr. Cruz had a considerable knowledge in the public housing area. He had been the deputy commissioner of housing. He understood, not just by virtue of, of, of visually, but also by the history of his experience, the mechanics of what made a project merit-worthy. He, he analyzed this project. That's what I tried to say in the But he was not the, the public housing authority at that point. And I, the, the amount of time and well, others, the, the point I'm making is this. It does not seem on the timetable you have agreed took place that either HUD or the public housing authority really had a chance to do 
the kind of comparative basis that uh, people think. So let me ask you, how much, how much of a factor do you think your political influence, you and your colleagues, was in getting this approved? I think that we were an important role in the process. Me too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I now rush to a question I just have to know the answer to. Um, do you think you will involve yourself in any more housing projects in the near future? To be honest with you, yes. Why? Because if we find merit-worthy projects, we will work, as we did in this one, within the system, and we will develop them. Uh, Mr. Manafort, let me ask you a couple of things. And, uh, I hope the committee has already gone over this, Mr. Chairman. But I want to know a little bit more about the structure in the first place. You're one-third owner of, of, a 50, of a partner in the, in the joint venture. And that partner's name is? CFM Development Corporation. Any other third, two-thirds owners? CDC is Mr. one? No, no. It, within the CFM Development Corporation, of which Mr. Cruz, Mr. Fox, and Mr. Manafort are one-third partners, uh, and, our, and our partner in this joint venture for this project is CDC Financial Corporation. All right. And you were the lead for CFM in conjunction with this project? No, Mr. Cruz was the lead, uh, was the project coordinator on it. He was the one with the experience in the housing field, and he was the one who uh, had the project brought to him, who analyzed the project and determined its meritworthiness. And then he's been the person dealing with the local community leaders uh, in the course of the project. Simply put, your job was to pre procure or acquire the, um, the rent subsidy allegation. No, not I mean, Black Manafort Stone and Kelly, Black Manafort Stone and Kelly's role included dealing with the Department of HUD, included do dealing with the administrative process, and has been an administrative arm of the whole project. That, uh, that's the considerable time we've put in in this project. So you're pay you, were you paid for more than one source for this project? Then? No. <sighs> You've already testified about basically you had no housing experience, but your partners did. So you're relying on Cruz for his analysis and CDC Financial Corporation. And CDC Financial Corporation, which had done a lot of housing a financing. Lot of business. Okay. Obviously, you knew you were working in the system, and you're working the system. I think we've all come to that conclusion that everybody here understands there's a system out there and that people take advantage of it. For better or for worse, it's, it's what we've done to the housing uh, program. Did you believe that anything you did at the time or have done now, listening to the tone of the question, the route we're going, uh, was improper or illegal? Or questionable. No, I believe we worked within the system that existed, sir. I don't think we did anything improper, illegal, or if, whatever. The last if you were to tighten the system so that there would be a fair share reimposed, and I'm, I know you're familiar with fair share now, or a comparative system reimposed, how at what juncture in this process would you do that? Where would you cut off uh, the so-called influence peddling? that uh, this body seems to find so repugnant and really uh, leaves a lot of questions. Uh, I, I don't know that I can answer that question. I mean, as I understand it, the whole discretionary program was put into place as a discretionary program because there was an inability to make some of those judgments. Whether that inability was perceived or real, I don't know, and, and I'll be very interested in following deliberations of this committee as to what you conclude. If your group or groups knew they had to go before a review board at the highest level in HUD, to get permission rather than to one person like uh, uh, Deborah Gordine, uh, would you still uh, follow this program through? We would have followed whatever the procedure was that was in place at the time because we would not want to work outside of pro appropriate procedure. Uh, we felt comfortable doing that, again, because we thought that the project was merit worthy. Uh, in all candor, once HUD made the allocation of funds to the PHA, Weren't you relatively sure that you were in line to pick up that contract for PHA in this specific project? We felt comfortable, but we didn't have any assurance. I mean, in guarantee. I, I'm troubled by one area, and I, have to, I want to go back to it. A couple of people already mentioned it. The $4.4 4 million, you did invest it before you had assurance that you were going to pick up the project. And that was the period of time we were at risk, Congressman. That's a lot of risk. I mean, I, most of us don't deal with millions, and I understand that when people, CDC is very comfortable with that kind of money. That's not the biggest project they've ever had, I'm sure. But I don't know how large uh, uh, funding you have encountered before in these projects, but, but, but 4.4 thing stuns most people because it's just a lot of money to it. But that's where there was confidence in the meritworthiness of the project that 
the, that we, the project would ultimately be funded, we felt very comfortable that this project on its own could qualify. How many hours have you put in, or has BMSK put in, who else would put it in besides yourself representing BMSK? In the totality of this project? Yes, like you know, upwards of 300 hours. Do you keep track of those hours somewhat like No, I mean, we've been able to try and do, build that in in hindsight, you know, looking at the number of trips and things like that that people were involved in, in, in the meetings. But, I mean, it's ongoing, including, as I indicated earlier, Congressman, it will continue until the project is completed. That was our understanding at the time, and it has been our performance. Percentage-wise, how far along is that project now? We expect that it will be concluded in the fall of this year. Do you anticipate a difficulty? About October. It will be right? about a three-year program. We will have been involved at, as Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly about three years. Has the scope or purpose of the project changed any in the time since you initially bid for it and now completed it? There have been some complications. One of them I alluded to earlier, we found asbestos, which, which required a tenant relocation plan that was not anticipated, which is one of the reasons why the project uh, has gone a bit beyond what we expected. And we had to deal with the asbestos problem, therefore a tenant relocation problem. Uh, there have been uh, a number of, uh, well, that's, that's been the principal one. There have been other, some other construction problems that we've encountered that we've dealt with. But I wouldn't call the others out of the, uh, out of the normal. I'd like to go over again, too. The, the troubling question of, of the apparent lack of concern for the local officials, both from HUD's standpoint, but more specifically now from you know, your standpoint as a project and a developer, I can understand moving into a small community or smaller community, if you like, and not immediately establishing good contact uh, and developing a, a real rapport with the local officials, knowing that in the final analysis they utilized the weapons they had, zoning, electrical, uh, like, what, 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 the local weaponry of a, of a small community to say this is the kind of unit we want. It bothers me a little bit that a unit of this size uh, was put into a community so small because the impact is so, I think, disproportional. So could you just comment on that aspect of it? Yeah, I, we have worked, at, and there have been considerable meetings, I think. I, I've not seen the minutes and all that were distributed you know, as part of the mayor's statement, but they probably are considerable because there have been a lot of meetings and there has been a lot of contact and a lot of cooperation working with the, uh, the local township. I mean, I, I don't know that the mayor said that it's been an adversarial relationship. In fact, it's been relatively positive. I don't uh, think he said that from what I got, uh, Mr. Manafort. What I got out of it was that until they applied a little pressure and slowed down the project, nobody really did pay attention to it. I mean, that's my understanding. Well, now. And, and I guess I might quibble a bit with that. Uh, th there was a change in the code, which happened as our project was coming on stream. Lo pardon me, local, local housing code? code? That, that was coming on, that's right. And uh, there was a change in the code. And we worked, we have worked with the local township, the change orders. There have been about 33 change orders. Uh, and we've worked with them. Uh, we, have, we have absorbed costs for the local community that we didn't have to absorb. Uh, for example, on this grant that they were talking about, we're paying partially the, uh, the technical consultant fee out of our own proceeds. We don't have to do that. We, uh, we've worked with them, with the local engineers, uh, on some of the changes. They have made some very meritorious uh, suggestions, and we've tried to accommodate them. Uh, and in the process, the project is better, I agree, but we, it's not been an adversarial relationship. Did you have difficulty acquiring certificates of occupying, and what are they specifically for edification of the committee, a uh, certificate of occupying? No, it, 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 a certificate of occupancy is the local township acknowledging that we have met all the code specifications and that they can, the units can be turned over for occupancy. So in other words, we can't move a new tenant into a rehabbed unit until we have what's called a CO. Uh, and we've. We've gotten, uh, you know, I don't know how many buildings now have been CO'd, but considerable number, and will be on stream to be finished, I think, in October or November. Have you personally ever visited uh, the site? I personally haven't, but as I said, my partner, who's been the action officer, has been there many times, uh, and my, my, the people at Black Man of Fort Stone who have been involved on a daily basis have been there on a number of occasions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Weiss. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Manafort, I think what I'd like to do in, in some instances at least is to try to clarify the record because uh, you've been under questioning for some period of time and I think that uh, quite naturally 
because of that uh, many questions you were asked, some of the responses you've given to some of the questions uh, seem to be on both sides of an issue, and I'm going to see if we can try to uh, clarify some of that. Uh, and, and Congressman, if there are any others that we miss, I'd be more than willing to clarify the transcript. Okay. Uh, For starters, I thought that you had said in your opening statement that the black Manafort uh, fee of $326,000 was in fact based on what had been referred to as the going price. Did you say that in, in the course yes. of your opening statement? I, it was on what we were viewed as the, the market determination. We picked the lower end of the range. Okay, but please, and, and try to keep the microphone closer so we can hear you. So that, in fact, that was the basis on which you, you arrived at the $326,000 figure. At the fee, but not at the work scope of work. Excuse me? The, the, that was the basis upon which we determined the fee, but not the scope of work. Fine. But again, at the time that you started, you had no idea as to the amount of time that it would take, isn't that correct? That is correct. And the basis for it was $1,000 per unit, isn't that correct? N no, that's, that's the point, I, you know, Congressman, we, well, then, the scope we, of we go, work was going to go further, before we go further now, again, because you're, you're beginning to contradict what you just said to me no, a minute no, ago. No, no, I'm expanding. No, wait, wait, let, me, let, me, let me pose the question to you. Do you find a correlation between the fact that there were 326 units and that the black man for charge was three hundred twenty-six thousand dollars. Is exactly. there a correlation between those yeah, two? That was the peg that we determined the fee, but not the scope of work. There's right. a difference. Okay, the peg, the peg for the dollars that you would get was at the rate of a thousand dollars per unit. Isn't that correct? Technically, yes. But thank you. Okay, so that all of this stuff about the scope of work whether it was 1,000 hours or 30 hours, in a sense was really irrelevant because you had made the determination up front or your company did that in fact what you're going to be charging, what the fee was going to be $1,000 a unit. No, sir, that is not correct. That, that's the point well, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make to you. At what, it, point, at what point would you have reduced the fee if in fact it turned out that you did, it didn't require see, the 300 hours? And this, this may be, uh, you know, Part of the difference between uh, your understanding of, of the marketplace in, in the whole area, Congressman. Well, all I'm it's, saying it's even, is it's even more complicated than that. Mr. Well, it is, but you're here. You're here under oath, and the reason that you're under oath is so that we can have a sense of the validity of your testimony. And again, I think that you ought to be very, very careful about responses that you give, which tend to be on all sides of an issue. Oh. Now, again. There, there is no correlation between the $326,000 that was the fee and the 326 units that were in this project. Is that what you're telling no, us? No, what, what I'm saying... Is that what you're no, telling Congress, us? No, Congressman, if, if you look... I'm asking, it, Mr. Manafort, I'm I, asking I've you a said question. It was the is there a correlation between the 326 units and the $326,000 fee? There is, it is pegged to that, but it is not the scope of work. That is all I'm saying, sir. But the reason that you charged 326000 was because there were 326 units. Isn't that correct? I, we could have charged double that according to the market rate. That's right, but the fact is that you pegged it at $1,000 per unit. Isn't that correct? We, we pegged it to that, but that was not defining the work responsibility. Th that's the point I think you're driving towards, and I can't agree with you, and, I, and I'm sorry that you're not liking well, you, the you answer. Well, you took a great, great pains to try to separate yourself out from Mr. Watts' approach to the deal. And Mr. Watts' approach was that he charged $300,000 or $169,000, depending on how you were counting the fee that he received. And he said that the going rate was somewhere between $1,000, $1,500, dollars per unit. And you said, oh, we didn't do that, when in fact that's exactly what you did. No, no, no. Isn't that correct? We pegged the fee to that. Yes, thank but you. But we did not define our work responsibility to simply provide in the units. That's all I'm saying. But Mr. Watt didn't say that all he was going to do well, was I, make three telephone calls either. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about Mr. Watt's testimony, sir, because uh, I didn't see it. Okay, all, so let, let's, go to, let's go to another clarification, if you will. Uh, I don't know if you heard the mayor's testimony and the housing officer's testimony from Upper Deerfield in regard to the request for additional funding because the, the asbestos work necessitated moving people out and, and, and delay of work and so on. Did you hear that testimony? 
I, I don't recall hearing that part of it. No. Did, did you, in fact, in the course of your testimony, suggest that you, uh, you assumed additional costs because of the asbestos insulation? We have absorbed extra costs. That is correct. Now, when did you become first aware of the fact that there was, in fact, an asbestos insulation problem? After we started on the project, the rehab of the project. Now, again, you're probably not old enough to remember the days when asbestos was considered, considered to be the magic element. And the asbestos manufacturing companies were selling it, and people were buying it on the basis this was the best thing going. And the, the pipe insulation that, that asbestos was used as, the manner in which it was there, you couldn't miss it. Nobody could miss it. It is a wraparound on the pipes. And you said it was on the heating pipes. Isn't that correct? I, I didn't say that. I don't know that for a fact. You don't know where, where it was? No, I do not. Did you hear the mayor say it was in the heating no, unit? As I said, I didn't hear that part of the testimony, sir. I mean, I don't recall hearing well, that part of the testimony. Do you, would, it, would it surprise you if, in fact, the mayor and the housing officer testified no, that, said the, that the asbestos of the existence was, was, was something that was known to the developer as of the fall of 1987? When we started the yeah. rehabilitation is when we discovered the asbestos. And when did you start the rehabilitation? I guess it would have been in approximately December of 1987, December, January. So that when you have a letter from your company that's dated December of 1988, December 17 of 1988, which says that you need additional, the need for additional credit allocation is mainly the result of two conditions. First, as we previously reported, asbestos-containing material in the form of pipe insulation was discovered on the project site. That was not a recent discovery as of December 17th of 1988. Isn't that correct? I think that is correct, yes. Right. You had to have known about that, or the developer or your partner had to have known about that very early on, isn't that? Well, in 1987. I mean, that's, I'm talking about a year earlier, Congressman. Well, the project, the project was only approved in 1987. And when we started the rehab is when we discovered the asbestos. But, but it's certainly not something that, wait, wait, let, me, let me take it back a step. Before you started, before you made a purchase, did somebody from your company go through the site and look at all the problems and all the things that you would have to deal with? Yes, sir. And was there not a listing at that time of asbestos as one of the problems? No, the, as I'm aware of, there was not. And I remember when- Would when you I, check that for us? Absolutely. Now, another point of clarification, and this is in the advertisement. And I want to get past the, the question as to what, you, what was intended by the project had to be located in the city of Seabrook. I assume for the purpose of this question that, in fact, you meant Upper Deerfield uh, Township. I, I, that's what you, that was meant, was meant, wouldn't you think? I assume so. Will the gentleman yield on that point? Yes. Because I, I really want to clarify something, um, and I know there was no, uh, there, there's a misunderstanding, and, and the misunderstanding here with respect to the town of Upper Deerfield Township slash Seabrook, New Jersey, let me explain something which the mayor will confirm. We shouldn't make too much of that because in townships in New Jersey, there are sections, subsections of such townships that are known locally by a local name. In this case, Seabrook is a subdivision known locally as Seabrook, but it is incorporated as part of Upper Deerfield Township. Well, I, I, so I, I appreciate the gentlelady's clarification. clarification. But it's a clarification for accuracy's sake, and I don't no, think... No, 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 I, I think that it's not. I think that it, I appreciate the explanation, but in fact what it says must be located in the city of Seabrook. So I well, think that city is a misnomer, you but, bet you. Uh, That's but right. people in uh, in that area of Cumberland County knew exactly what was meant. Will the gentleman yield Precisely. for a I'd second? Be very pleased to yield to the chairman. We are all very grateful for the clarification of uh, of uh, our colleague from New Jersey, but that makes the advertisement even more phony. Oh, it, it's true. Because that delineates the arena where the project must have a hundred units to a subsection of a small town, exactly. which makes the competitive bidding notion 
wholly absurd. Mr. Chairman, so I, do not, I, 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 I don't take exception to that, but I think some, some alluded to uh, or, or interpreted that as a discrepancy that the people didn't even know which town they were advertising in. I mean, and, and that's the only reason I, I pointed out, but you were absolutely correct. It clearly defines a very precise subdivision and a very narrow location. Well, since, since the mayor testifies that the 326 units is 16% of the housing stock of the whole community, if you take a small section of it and you advertise a project that must have 100 units in that section, I'm willing to bet dollars for donuts that this is the only project that could have qualified. And we will ascertain from the mayor whether, in fact, that is so. But we are most grateful for uh, uh, Congresswoman Rukema's clarification. Well, when uh, my turn comes, I will have something to add to the whole question of advertising as, as part of the regulation. We thank our colleague for yielding. It's, it's a pleasure. I think that, that your comment really and question underscores the whole point. Uh, but let me, let me for the moment, as I started to say, disregard the confusion regarding Seabrook and go on to the rest of, of the advertisement. It starts off saying all projects must contain at least 100 units and must be located in the city of Seabrook. Okay. All funding decisions were made by the agency. That's the Department of Community Affairs, the Division of Housing and Development, uh, Bureau of Housing Services. That's, that's referred to as the agency. Based on the financial feasibility of each proposal and the following criteria so that it not only has to be uh, at least 100, 100 units uh, in the city of wherever, but it, it also has to meet the following criteria. One, projects with applications previously submitted but not funded by previous awards. Now, do you know of any other projects with applications previously submitted but not funded by previous effort, awards within either uh, Upper Deerfield Township or its Seabrook subdivision? No, I do not. Two feasible projects providing the greatest dollar amount of rehabilitation per unit. What does that mean to your understanding? I would, well, I'm giving you my present knowledge. I mean, yes, what I would show off of what you just said is that. The, the total amount of rehab per unit would be an important criteria. Providing the greatest do amount of rehabilitation, per, per the unit, most expensive. No, per, no, no, no. In other words, the most, you know, if you were going to put in $1,000 per unit or $2,000 per unit, you will be given preference by putting in more rehab money. Right, okay. Three, projects involving abandoned or foreclosed buildings. Now, do you know of any other uh, project in Upper Deerfield or the Seabrook division, subdivision, which had uh, abandoned or foreclosed buildings besides the one that you purchased? I do not know of any, Congressman. But okay. And then projects whose, you, for projects whose unit size distribution must closely match, most closely matches the agency's funding authorization. Now, that, that authorization is for what? I don't understand that part. Well, the, the, as I read it, the, the funding authorization is for 326 units. You got it. You are the only one who can meet, who can meet that criteria. Unless by some magic or, or miraculous coincidence, there, there's some other project out there meeting all the other criteria and also has exactly 326 units. And five projects with the shortest time period for rehabilitation and six date of receipt on propos proposal by the agency. Now, it seems to me that when you put all of that together, the suggestion that, in fact, there was any kind of risk involved seems pretty far-fetched. I mean, there is nobody, as, as the chairman had said earlier on, there is no other project except the one that you had which could possibly meet that those, all those various criteria. Isn't that correct? That could be construed, yes. Thank you. I, I'm sorry we didn't hear that. That, that could be construed. I, the point, I'm, you know, maybe yeah, we... Thank you. That, that's, that's the answer that I wanted. Right. Um, Stop there. 
Now, w another area of, of confusion, because I think it requires some clarification. You had said that Mr. Cruz had, gone, had, had heard about this project, the, the, that is the building, the site, from another developer. That, that, that I think was the, court, the response to that is correct. one of the questions. Isn't that right? Now, can you tell us for the record the name of the developer from whom Mr. Cruz got this information? Uh, I, I don't remember that now, but I'll get that for you. And can you tell us when Mr. Cruz received that information? It was, it was in September, October, but I will try and get you the specific September, date. October of? Probably 1986. Of 1986. Okay. And having gotten that information, he then went out to look at the site. Is that the first thing that he did? That is my understanding, yes, sir. I mean, when I say the first thing he did, I don't know what the first thing he did, but he did before he, we proceeded review, go down there, look at the site, analyze the project, and make a determination that it was merit-worthy. And when would that have taken place? That's the date I told you I, I'm going to have to supply to the committee. Okay. And having gone on his visit to the site, uh, you also said in the course of your testimony that you think or you believe or you understand that he spoke to somebody or some people with some agency or, or another in the state of New Jersey. Which agency and with whom? I believe, and this is what I'm going to have to get for you, I believe it was with the Public Housing Authority to determine if they viewed this project as a, as a project that could qualify and what experience they had with it. Now, do you know whether, in fact, that conversation took place with Mr. Connolly, who was the... No, no, it would not have taken place with Mr. Connolly. Okay. All right, so you know whom it did not, not take yeah, place. That would, this would have been did it at take a, place I'm going to have to get you the name. This would have been at the technical level in whatever the local, you know, the office is in Trenton. I, I don't know the answer, but I've made, made a note to provide it to you, sir. Okay. Uh, and then, well, the, in response to Mr. Frank's questions, uh, and this is where the confusion comes in, you had said that Mr. Gay had been at a meeting uh, with Ms. Gordine on some other matter, and in the course of it, it occurred to him to ask her about the situation of the property in Upper Deerfield. Is that, is that roughly your testimony? The meeting was not set up for this purpose, but it was not coincidence that it was raised afterwards. Okay. He went there with the purpose of asking, among other things, of asking about this specific... Yeah. The, the meeting was set up for a different purpose, but he had intended on inquiring at that point. Okay. Now, the question, and then, and then after he got what in essence was a positive response as to what he ought to be doing, he was asked a couple of questions. One, one of the questions that, that was asked was, was the was an application filed by the, by the public housing agency, and the second was whether the public housing agency was supportive of it. That, right, isn't that what you said, that That's those correct. were the two questions? Now, you said that the answer was that the application had not been filed, that's what Mr. Gay said, but that he said that, in fact, the public housing agency looked with favor upon this project. But it was after that conversation that you testified that Mr. Stevens arranged for a meeting which took place with Mr. Connolly. That was a different meeting, sir. Well, that, that's what I'm trying to no, clarify. Yeah, now, the, the point. Again, the record stands in a very confused okay. well, state. Then, then let, me, let me try to clarify that. The, when Mr. Cruz analyzed the project and had that contact with the Public Housing Authority, at the technical level, that's where the comment about meritworthiness comes from. The meeting well, with Mr. The, the, the comment about meritworthiness comes from the meeting with Mr. Connolly occurred after the meeting with Ms. Dean. In other words, after the 14th, but prior to the 20th of November. And that the purpose of that discussion was to submit a, a an application. And also as to whether well, again, we know who Mr. Connolly was, and, and we know that that Mr. Connolly says in the quotation that was referred to in the Wall Street Journal, that he was told to make the application and that, in fact, it would be, he would get an approval and he says, 
And lo and behold, they were approved, Mr. Conley says. Obviously, and quote, goes on with the quote, obviously we raised our eyebrows, close quote. Now, that does not sound to the interested or casual reader as a situation where the director of the Division of Housing had given any indication or anybody in his agency about the merit worthiness of this project. He says that he's told by a representative of your firm, make the application and it's going to be approved. And they do it and lo and behold, it happens. That's, that's the scenario that's uh, set forth in here. Now, do you, are you now disputing no. No, I'm that, not. That, 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 set, that conversation? No, because Mr. Connolly is not the only person at the Public Housing Authority. And I'm not trying to imply that at all. The, that, I'm not trying to say that at all. Okay. Did, did you, you know whether, in fact, in the course of that first meeting with Mr. Connolly that was arranged by Mr. Stevens, there was a discussion of the earlier discussions that Mr. Cruz had had with other people within the Public Housing Agency? I don't know that, sir, because I wasn't at that meeting. <laughs> well, would you get that information for us? And then, let me ask you about the, the, the cost of this, this project. That is, the, the purchase price of the property. I would assume that someone as involved in, in real estate as Mr. Cruz was would have gotten some idea what the assessed valuation of this property was before you began negotiations with the that is, your company began negotiations with, with the owner of the property. Do you know whether, in fact, that he checked or asked for the assessed valuation of the property? We felt that the appraisal value, the assessed value, which I believe was an old assessment, was not, was, was not accurate. And, and we felt also that in a moderate rehab program that the value of the property would far exceed the purchase price. Uh-huh. And in fact, those are, those are two separate answers, and, and let, me, let me try to explore both of those. I don't know if you heard the mayor testify, and it was in his prepared testimony, that uh, the, 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 the assessed value was something like $2.9 million. I, I dollars, and he said, again, my recollection is that the, assessed, the, ra the ratio to real value was something like 93.7%. Yeah, I, I read that. Right? Story. And he said that that on that basis, and he didn't say that was an out-of-date assessment, and given the condition of that property, I'm not sure that, in fact, you, you could draw the conclusion that that was undervalued, uh, the, was that, that that property was worth maybe $3.2 million, but you, you all paid $4.4 million for it. Isn't that correct? Now, we, we made a business judgment, sir, and, and we certainly tried to negotiate the price down. Uh, but that was the best price we could get. But we made a business judgment that uh, that, that price would still make the project work. And when we, we uh, analyzed what a moderate rehab would give to value of the project, we determined that the, the purchase price uh, could sustain the ultimate value of the project, certainly for permanent financing purposes. What was the original price that they asked for? Uh, I, I don't remember. I you, well, your records would indicate that, I assume. I'm, a million I'm, here, a million there, but I, I assume that that... that that if they were asking five million or six million and you brought them down to 4.4, 4, if, if, if they start out at 4.4 and they wouldn't budge, that your records would reflect that, isn't that I, I will. I will check that price up, uh, the negotiations. But the, and then the, the second part of the, of the answer that you gave is that, in fact, it really didn't make any difference to you at that point because you would more than recoup it with the moder moderate rehab program. Isn't that correct? No, well, recoup is the wrong word. What you, we use your own word. What we determined was that permanent financing yeah. in a mod rehab program could carry that, that purchase price cost. And so it was irrelevant to you whether, in fact, you were taken for an extra million dollars no, or not. No, of course, it was, of course it was relevant to us. Uh, I mean, the, the, the purchase price, the lower we could get the purchase price, the more rehab we could put into the project. Okay, so that's why I ask you, what was, the, what was the initial offering price? I, I'll have to get that information. I mean, we, we were looking to put the maximum amount of rehab into the project to improve the quality of the project. 
And then I guess the final area, Mr. Chairman, you've been more than lenient with, with my time. Uh, Mr. Lukens asked you about whether you were receiving funding from various sources, and you said no. Now, let me, let me see if we can get some clarification of that. Um, CFM was, of which you were a partner, right? You were one of the three principals in CFM was entitled over a period of some seven years to something approximating $920,000. Is that, give me, give me the exact dollar number. Uh, I believe 921,500 would be the syndicated proceeds over the seven year period. Right, and you would be receiving a one third portion of that. Is that correct? Me personally? Yes. No, we, they, I would get one third of CFM's portion of that. One third of CFM's portion, okay. And CFM's portion was what, 50%? receive any money at Black Manafort, Stone and Calorie in salary or compensation based on the Seabrook project. That went into the funding of the general company. So you, you can't, I mean, wait, wait, wait. the point is it's part of, the, it's part of the, the revenues of the firm. And you get paid out of the general revenues, right? Yes, you can, yes, but, the, but what I'm saying is that if you, if you didn't have fees, you wouldn't get any, any, any salary, isn't that correct? Yes, but we are profit making so, company. Pardon? We are a profit making you, company. You, you bet you are. And, and, and $326,000, more or less, whether it's over one year or two years or three years, whether it's 300 hours or 320 hours, in fact, goes into the general gross income pool out of which your net profits come and out of which your salary gets paid. Isn't that correct? That, that is true. So that, in fact, you're receiving monies in this situation from at least two sources. One is from your, partners, your partnership in CFM. And Secondly, in your partnership in Black Manafort, isn't that correct? Me personally. Yes, you personally. Uh, yes, you could make that case. And I guess the one other loose end that I had that I, you you mentioned in the early part of your. But, but I think what I, at least my understanding of what Congressman Lukens was getting at was, did Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly get any other fees other than the three hundred twenty-six thousand dollars? At least that's how I understood his question, and my answer to that was no. Well, the question was you, and I assume that he was talking to you. Well, I Manafort. guess I interpreted that as Black okay. Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. In any, in any event, I'm, sh I'm glad we clarified it. Finally, you mentioned in your, in your opening testimony that this particular piece of property had previously been granted a hundred unit certificate. Is there, that, there is are that 100 you said? Section 8 certificates that had already attached to that project. That's correct. To that, pro to that particular pro piece of property? Project. I mean, the previous owner somehow, I mean, I don't know what the process was, and I don't understand uh, really the, the Section 8 certificate program, but that was a factor in determining that HUD had already sanctioned this project as one that uh, was merit worthy. To the prior owner? To the prior owner, yes. So, so if that's so, isn't it likely that it was that prior owner? who in some way found his way to Mr. Cruz to say, hey, we've got a, a live project here? No, no, that's, no. There, w there was another developer, and I will get you his name, Congressman. It, it, the initial contact did not go from the then present owner to Mr. Cruz. And, then, and the final question, was it in fact someone from within HUD who gave you the information or gave you a firm or any of the firms the information that in fact there was this piece of property which had had a had 100 unit uh, section 8 allotted to it. It's, it's my understanding that it was a developer, sir, and I will get you his name. I mean, a developer could not be a part of HUD. I mean, well, that, that's what I'm asking you. Yeah. I, I don't know the individual's name. That's why I'm going to get it to you, but it was, to, it was a but developer. But you're, you're certain that it was not someone in HUD who gave you that information? Yeah, I feel very comfortable saying that. Or someone who had previously been associated with HUD? I don't know who the developer is, so I can't so say that. So it could have been somebody who was previously I, associated with HUD. I, I don't know that answer, sir, uh, but I will get it to you. I mean, it's my understanding it was a private part developer, and, uh, and he was no, not interested in purchasing the project, and Mr. Cruz then looked at it. How long, had, how long ago had he stopped being interested, do you know? I don't know that. No. I, mean, I don't, long, I don't know long, any of the facts. How long prior was the, pro was the prior owner granted the 100-unit certificate? I don't know that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Congressman Mads. Congresswoman Rukuna. Um, Mr. Chairman, with respect to the uh, requirement for public notice, the only thing that I wanted to add is that having looked up the 
HUD requirements. It is, and, and in conjunction with what we now know about the lack of lead time or the ver what, short lead time of a few days, a few short days, um, it's for that public notice, it seems very apparent that um, our statutory language and the regulations that are attendant to it are very deficient in terms of uh, specifying what kind of notification is, is given. There are obvious loopholes, to name just one, it's the lead time, but there are other apparent loopholes that might invite abuse if one is so inclined. So I think this, is, this testimony today mm -hmm. has been very instructive in that regard, and um, I shall be happy to look into this further along with the committee staff, if, if you will, to see what improvements we can make there. I, don't, I have two specific questions, and I'll try to keep this very brief because I think we're belaboring perhaps some of the points here, but uh, I was out of the room, Mr. Manafort, when um, you made your, your presentation regarding what you learned about the tenants over the phone, and uh, I'm not sure whether there were three tenants or whatever. Um, involved in uh, whatever your statement was. But this is contradictory completely to what the mayor stated previously, and I don't know if you've had a chance to address this. Um, the mayor said that, um, they're, they're, that you were having difficulty in renting the rehabilitated units. And you are disputing his statement that you do not have to advertise outside the community in order to get tenants? Is that my understanding that the, you were disputing the, the mayor's testimony there? Uh, I guess I am. It's my understanding, Congresswoman, that, uh, that the, first of all, the Public Housing Authority, not the developer, does the advertising. In other words, we don't have the authority at this stage, as I understand it, to Well, where go did out. you get your information from when you made your phone call? Uh, from Mr. Cruz. No, my comment, uh, there are two parts well, then here. Then you, you really, are you parts. really are, uh, well then let me ask it to you this way, all right? And then you tell me what the two questions are. You are really not in a position to dispute the mayor's testimony um, that they have, that you have to advertise, the PHA has to advertise outside the catchment area, so to speak in order to get tenants. Your testimony, as I understand it, has been that, that you have a waiting list. It's my understanding that in Cumberland County, there's a, as, of as of September of 1988, there was a waiting list of about 516. That's, so that's my quite, understanding. That's quite different than saying, than the statement that you made earlier, as I understand no, that's a, it. So you're a, speaking about Cumberland County has a waiting list. Of 516. And as far as the, the dislocation, that's a different issue. All right, and what I said was that of the tenants of the project, when we purchased it and have rehabbed it, three people didn't qualify pursuant to the, uh, the, the income test to stay in the project with a subsidy. All right, we'll, yeah. have, we'll have to go back over that. Uh, I'm happy for that clarification. Uh, one other question. I don't know whether Mr. Demery has stated this under oath, but he has been widely quoted as state, referring to your firm and the relationship between your firm and Deborah Gordeen as, um, um, in, in, as an indication that, that um, the project was clearly a political one. Have you had an, an, uh, an opportunity during your testimony here to either affirm or dispute that statement that has been widely attributed to Mr. Demery? that the project was a political project? That Mr. Demery was informed by Ms. Ms. Oh, okay. Gore. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Gordeen, I'm sorry, Gordeen. Uh, that uh, clearly this project and other projects, but clearly this project had to be approved because it was clearly a political decision. I have no knowledge why that statement was made. I mean, I don't even do know that the statement was made, it? actually. I, I, can't, I do not have any knowledge that the statement was ever made or as to the basis for it. Well, I know. I can guarantee you that Mr. Demery has made that assertion, both uh, in testimony as well as in, uh, in the public press. And um, I'm asking you now if you dispute that statement of Mr. Demery's. That it was a political project? Correct. 
that we were involved in as a, as a public relations firm in supporting that project, I don't dispute that at all. That the project was funded purely because we supported it, I guess I would say that I think the project had merit worthiness to it. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to belabor the point any further. We could go into the rentals and uh, the, the, the discrepancies here between what the rentals are in this project and what the mayor knows to be the case and what their own documentation indicates as the fair market value. I won't go into that, but I will simply say that I guess the only thing I come away with uh, here today is the fact underscored the essential, uh, the necessity for Ms. Dean to come before this committee and testify as to what she knows, because I think she seems to be the linchpin here, uh, both on the basis of Mr. Manafort's testimony and on the basis of other previous testimony that we have had. I think the May rest just... is self-evident and apparent as to what has gone on here, whether in the Seabrook uh, approval or in those others that, uh, uh, when Mr. Watt and the others have testified on the other projects. I think the, uh, the pattern is per perfectly apparent. Well, I want to thank my <coughs> colleague for so patiently attending these hearings, making so many constructive contributions. Uh, let me just reassure her that the chair will do his utmost uh, to encourage uh, Ms. Dean and her uh, counsel to have her come before this committee and, and testify. Before I call on uh, uh, Congressman Shays, have you visited this project before you bought it, uh, Ms. Manafort? As I indicated earlier, Congressman, I personally haven't, but my partners have spent many, many trips there, yes. Yeah, but you have never. I have not. Have you visited it since? No, I've never been to the You site. have never been to Project. Congress Mr. Manafort, you've been here a very long time, and, and uh, I, I don't intend to keep you here much longer, and I appreciate your being here. Um, I just need to clarify the significance of whether you paid yourself $1,000 or 2000 a unit, because my, my basic understanding is you owned a third of this project, um, or a, a portion of this project. How much did you own of this project? I own one third of CFM, which owns 60% of the project. The bottom line is, though, that you also uh, have this consulting firm, Black Manafort and Stone and Kelly, and that is the firm that got the thousand dollars per unit, the three twenty-six. The three hundred twenty-six thousand okay. dollars. So, in a sense, though, you, you you could take the money as an owner, or you could take it as as in partly your partnership. Obviously, uh, in your partnership, that that gets spread across all your partners. Is that correct? It gets spread across the cost of operations, Congressman, which would include our salaries. Um, one of the other things that, that tended to confuse me a little, you seem to make a big deal out of the fact that the, the, the condition of the apartments was in deplorable state. Why is that significant from your perspective? It, well, it's significant when coupled with the fact that there was a waiting list in the area, when coupled with the fact that people were living in there, in those units, uh, and uh, and the purpose of the, of the moderate rehab program was, in our judgment, specifically to improve these kinds of situations. But from the standpoint of the purchaser, the worse the building is, the, the, the better the buy you can get uh, on the purchase. And it's my understanding, the mod rehab, all the costs of rehabilitating the building are borne by the government uh, in the rents that they allow you to, to, uh, to charge the tenants. Isn't that correct? Uh, my understanding, Congressman, is that the subsidy provides a, a, a stream of income that is the basis upon which a lender will provide you know, funding to do the rehabilitation and then ultimately to get a permanent mortgage. Okay, I, I, let me ask the question again, though. Isn't it true that the whole basis for determination of rent is, uh, at least according to the IG and others, that, um, that uh, and let, just, let me just read from page 19 of the definition of moderate rehabilitation. It said the MRP regulations or written guidance do not contain a dollar or scope limitation on rehabilitation costs allowed in the rental calculations. The whole rehabilitation costs are what's put in the calculation for rental. And it just, um, I mean, you obviously, you want to comment on that? I, I don't know that I'm technically well, knowledgeable. Well, okay, basically, the program works this way. We, you can't 
you may have paid $4 million for the project, and I don't think you could pass that on in the rents. That's, that is correct. Yeah. But all the rehabilitation you can. And so obviously there's more rehabilitation. Uh, there's more cost involved. And ultimately that can, if the market, they can justify the market uh, rental, then that gets borne in the rental cost. And, and I would uh, hazard a pretty strong guess, considering the rental charges, that uh, this rehabilitation cost was allowed and, and you, you received it. So the fact that you had, um, I understand your point about upgrading the building uh, and making it better and, and uh, having not seen it before after I can't comment, but I just want to make the point for the record that the rehabilitation cost uh, you should have gotten back in the rental agreements. Um, and so I just make that point. Uh, and I guess I would just conclude, I, I, in the course of my asking you some questions, I, uh, I yielded a number of times, and, and uh, I, I hope it, it becomes evidently clear to you that I, I don't think there was any risk on the part of, of your purchase. I mean, I, it just, it, it, you're such an intelligent man, and you're so successful and, and well-respected in Connecticut and other parts of this country for your, your, your capabilities. It just defies logic for me to have someone of your caliber come here and basically say you took a risk. Because um, as I look at this, uh, you, you, it was very clear you went to the, to the state housing authority, you got them to want the project, you told them who to contact in Washington, you contacted the right people there, the right people there uh, signed the 185 and they signed, uh, they, they sent it to the region and then they sent it down locally. Uh, it, it, it was a small community, there weren't other projects there. Yours is the only show in town. Um, you know, I'm tempted to say I would have liked to have bought into the project, but thank God I didn't. Uh, but it was a sure thing. And um, I, you know, I think that system stinks, uh, and I think you use the system, uh, and I know hundreds of other people have done it as well. Uh, but um, I have to accept on the face of it that you knew that you were dealing with a sure thing. You bought the building. And just like James Watt and all the others, uh, you successfully concluded this project. Uh, knowing who to use and what people to contact, which is uh, regrettably the way this system works, and uh, uh, I'm not justifying that. I'm just making the point that uh, a lot of people have made a lot of money with influencing pe influence peddling in this, in this city, and, and it's probably worse in HUD than elsewhere. Uh, we'll start with HUD and we'll work down the line. Congressman, if I might just make one other point. Yes, we did understand the system. Yes, we worked within the system. Yes, the program, project was funded. Uh, we are doing rehabilitation. We believe that but for this rehabilitation, there'd be no, this housing project would have had to close down. We've done a survey re as recently as Friday in preparation for here to make sure that the tenants were happier if there are problems. We were going to do this at the end of the project when we didn't anticipate uh, this kind of testimony, but we we did a survey. Uh, there are approximately 129 units that have got been mod rehabbed and have occupants. Uh, and we were able to reach 73 people on Friday. They are extremely pleased with the project. They are extremely pleased with their, uh, the rehab. Uh, they are extremely pleased with the service that the management company has provided. Uh, and, and I feel comfortable in saying to the committee me members here, that when the project is done, I, I would wish that you'd come visit the site and talk to the tenants and see that we have done our utmost to make sure that the purpose of providing good low-income housing has been met and will be managed in such a way that, uh, that the committee members will be proud of the work that we've done. Mr. Gentleman, yield. Mm -hmm. I've I, I finished my time. Congressman this Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Ferg, uh, there was a story, I guess, two days ago which indicated that uh, the number of units uh, that were able to be funded has gone down in the space of two years, I guess, from 15,000 to 3,000. Uh, are you telling this committee that you, in fact, favor the increase in funding of low-income housing units and subsidized housing across the country? I see real value to the program, yes, sir. And have you, did you during the course of these past eight years, during the Reagan administration, express yourself publicly in opposition to the administration's uh, severe slashing of subsidized housing and low-income housing programs? No, sir. You're aware of the fact that uh, HUD's funding went down from something like $31 million 
in 1981 to about 9 billion, I'm talking about 30, 31 billion, to about 9 billion today. You're aware of those? I'm aware of that. Will today, the gentleman yes. yield a second, please? I believe. Thank you. Um, it's my understanding that in order for it to go down 31 million, the president obviously recommended and probably wanted even less, but Congress had to concur. Yeah, no, no, I... I, I it, it, is it not true, though, that, sir, that, that Congress had to agree with that $9 billion appropriation? In other words, we're all in this together, is my point, sir. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, I am a Republican who uh, am, am happy to be a Republican. I'm happy to blame this administration, but I have a, a very difficult time being silent uh, when the fact is that to appropriate a package, it takes the president and it also takes Congress to agree to it. And Congress agreed to $9 billion, regrettably. And I know that you were not on that side of Congress's decision. Uh, and I know if you had your way, it would be more than $31 billion, And I salute you for that. But I just can't have it all be on the administration. I'm, I'm always pleased to yield to my friend, because he's always very courteous in yielding uh, to other people as well. And I know that he wouldn't have been on that side either. He would have been on my side of, of that issue. But the question that I have is to, uh, is to Mr. Manafort who was a supporter of the Reagan administration, and the Reagan administration was hell-bent on wiping out many of these programs, most especially the housing programs. And I'm asking him, now that he's, he's here before us telling us what good things are able to be done through subsidized housing programs, uh, whether in fact, when it mattered, when in fact the administration was at us year after year after year successfully uh, cutting back on these programs and persuading a majority of Congress to go along with him, whether in fact he expressed his concern for keeping those programs alive and funded and of concern for the people who, who needed that housing. And I, the answer I guess, get from Mr. Manafort is that, no, you never spoke out in favor of subsidized long gun housing during the Reagan administration years. Is that correct? I, I never had a basis to be involved in, in the debate, Congressman. I mean, I, I was you, ne you never did. But I assume that you supported, uh, basically, the Reagan administration's effort at cutting back on many domestic programs, including housing. Isn't that correct? By and large, I supported the, the, the operations and the, the programs of the Reagan administration. Okay. But I should say, yeah. and, and part of it is tempered by the experience I've had over the last three years in this project, I see a real value for it. My partner, who I already indicated, lived for 14 years in a low-income housing project is very conscious of it and, and has been very persuasive with me on the value. And I can see the difference we're making on just this one project, yes. Mr. Manafort, it, it's always nice to have people suddenly acquire religion. I didn't say it was uh, suddenly. But in the meantime, what, what's come out here in the course of the testimony today and the testimony that, that has been uh, gathered in the, under the chairmanship of Mr. Lantos is that there were people such as yourself who philosophically and ideologically opposed the programs, when you got your chance, you were grabbing with both hands, and you literally were grabbing with both hands in this program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Ms. Manafort, uh, we appreciate your appearance. Is it reasonable to ask you to submit in writing the answers yes. to the questions uh, that have been raised by a week from today? Yes, sir. And what I'd like to do is co communicate with your staff to make sure that my list and their list are... Uh, that we'll be most happy to cooperate. Is there any final statement you would care to make? Nothing more than to say, sir, that, uh, that we feel that the project is merit worthy, that we feel we work within the system. And I understand what your deliberations are geared towards, and I don't disagree with them. Uh, and uh, if I can be of any service, I would be anxious to do so. We appreciate this. The next, state, the next uh, hearing of the subcommittee will be on Thursday, when the subcommittee will hear from a former Under Secretary of HUD, an assistant sec former Assistant Secretary of HUD, and the former Special Assistant to Secretary Pierce. The hearing is adjourned. Thanks very much, please. Join us Thursday morning at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time for a live viewer call-in program. Our guest will be Time Magazine's Richard Hornick, he was the bureau chief for the magazine in Beijing, China from 1985 to 1987. He's just returned from a trip to that country and will take viewer calls on the situation there. Coming up next, we bring you a portion of yesterday's Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing and testimony by Secretary of State James Baker III.
Good morning from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN. A reminder to join us.